preface of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan preface the definite object proposed in this work is an examination of the general history of europe and america with particular reference to the effect of sea power upon the course of that history historians generally have been unfamiliar with the conditions of the sea having as to it neither special interest nor special knowledge and the profound determining influence of maritime strength upon great issues has consequently been overlooked this is even more true of particular occasions than of the general tendency of sea power it is easy to say in a general way that the use and control of the sea is and has been a great factor in the history of the world it is more troublesome to seek out and show its exact bearing at a particular juncture yet unless this be done the acknowledgment of general importance remains vague and unsubstantial not resting as it should upon a collection of special instances in which the precise effect has been made clear by an analysis of the conditions at the given moments a curious exemplification of this tendency to slight the bearing of maritime power upon events may be drawn from two writers of that english nation which more than any other has owed its greatness to the sea twice says arnold in his history of rome has there been witnessed the struggle of the highest individual genius against the resources and institutions of a great nation and in both cases the nation was victorious for seventeen years hannibal strove against rome for sixteen years napoleon strove against england the efforts of the first ended in zama those of the second in waterloo sir edward creasy quoting this adds one point however of the similitude between the two wars has scarcely been adequately dwelt on that is the remarkable parallel between the roman general who finally defeated the great carthaginian and the english general who gave the last deadly overthrow to the french emperor scipio and wellington both held for many years commands of high importance but distant from the main theatres of warfare the same country was the scene of the principal military career of each it was in spain that scipio like wellington successively encountered and overthrew nearly all the subordinate generals of the enemy before being opposed to the chief champion and conqueror himself both scipio and wellington restored their countrymen's confidence in arms when shaken by a series of reverses and each of them closed a long and perilous war by a complete and overwhelming defeat of the chosen leader and the chosen veterans of the foe neither of these englishmen mentions the yet more striking coincidence that in both cases the mastery of the sea rested with the victor the roman control of the water forced hannibal to that long perilous march through gaul in which more than half his veteran troops wasted away it enabled the elder scipio while sending his army from the rhone on to spain to intercept hannibal's communications to return in person and face the invader at the trebia throughout the war the legions passed by water unmolested and unwearied between spain which was hannibal's base and italy while the issue of the decisive battle of the metaurus hinging as it did upon the interior position of the roman armies with reference to the forces of hasdrubal and hannibal was ultimately due to the fact that the younger brother could not bring his succoring reinforcements by sea but only by the land route through gaul 
hence at the critical moment the two carthaginian armies were separated by the length of italy and one was destroyed by the combined action of the roman generals on the other hand naval historians have troubled themselves little about the connection between general history and their own particular topic limiting themselves generally to the duty of simple chroniclers of naval occurrences this is less true of the french than of the english the genius and training of the former people leading them to more careful inquiry into the causes of particular results and the mutual relation of events there is not however within the knowledge of the author any work that professes the particular object here sought namely an estimate of the effect of sea power upon the course of history and the prosperity of nations as other histories deal with the wars politics social and economical conditions of countries touching upon maritime matters only incidentally and generally unsympathetically so the present work aims at putting maritime interests in the foreground without divorcing them however from their surroundings of cause and effect in general history but seeking to show how they modified the latter and were modified by them the period embraced is from sixteen sixty when the sailing ship era with its distinctive features had fairly begun to seventeen eighty three the end of the american revolution while the thread of general history upon which the success of maritime events is strung is intentionally slight the effort has been to present a clear as well as accurate outline writing as a naval officer in full sympathy with his profession the author has not hesitated to digress freely on questions of naval policy strategy and tactics but as technical language has been avoided it is hoped that these matters simply presented will be found of interest to the unprofessional reader a t mahan december eighteen eighty nine end of preface introductory of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain introductory the history of sea power is largely though by no means solely a narrative of contests between nations of mutual rivalries of violence frequently culminating in war the profound influence of sea commerce upon the wealth and strength of countries was clearly seen long before the true principles which governed its growth and prosperity were detected to secure to one's own people a disproportionate share of such benefits every effort was made to exclude others either by the peaceful legislative methods of monopoly or prohibitory regulations or when these failed by direct violence the clash of interests the angry feelings roused by conflicting attempts thus to appropriate the larger share if not the whole of the advantages of commerce and of distant unsettled commercial regions led to wars on the other hand wars arising from other causes have been greatly modified in their conduct and issue by the control of the sea therefore the history of sea-power while embracing in its broad sweep all that tends to make a people great upon the sea or by the sea is largely a military history and it is in this aspect that it will be mainly though not exclusively regarded in the following pages a study of the military history of the past such as this is enjoined by great military leaders as essential to correct ideas and to the skilful conduct of war in the future napoleon names among the campaigns to be studied by the aspiring soldier those of alexander 
hannibal and caesar to whom gunpowder was unknown and there is a substantial agreement among professional writers that while many of the conditions of war vary from age to age with the progress of weapons there are certain teachings in the school of history which remain constant and being therefore of universal application can be elevated to the rank of general principles for the same reason the study of the sea history of the past will be found instructive by its illustration of the general principles of maritime war notwithstanding the great changes that have been brought about in naval weapons by the scientific advances of the past half century and by the introduction of steam as the motive power it is doubly necessary thus to study critically the history and experience of naval warfare in the days of sailing ships because while these will be found to afford lessons of present application and value steam navies have as yet made no history which can be quoted as decisive in its teaching of the one we have much experimental knowledge of the other practically none hence theories about the naval warfare of the future are almost wholly presumptive and although the attempt has been made to give them a more solid basis by dwelling upon the resemblance between fleets of steamships and fleets of galleys moved by oars which have a long and well-known history it will be well not to be carried away by this analogy until it has been thoroughly tested the resemblance is indeed far from superficial the feature which the steamer and the galley have in common is the ability to move in any direction independent of the wind such a power makes a radical distinction between those classes of vessels and the sailing ship for the latter can follow only a limited number of courses when the wind blows and must remain motionless when it fails but while it is wise to observe things that are alike it is also wise to look for things that differ for when the imagination is carried away by the detection of points of resemblance one of the most pleasing of mental pursuits it is apt to be impatient of any divergence in its new-found parallels and so may overlook or refuse to recognize such thus the galley and the steamship have in common though unequally developed the important characteristic mentioned but in at least two points they differ and in an appeal to the history of the galley for lessons as to fighting steamships the differences as well as the likeness must be kept steadily in view or false deductions may be made the motive power of the galley when in use necessarily and rapidly declined because human strength could not long maintain such exhausting efforts and consequently tactical movements could continue but for a limited time and again during the galley period offensive weapons were not only of short range but were almost wholly confined to hand-to-hand -to -hand encounter these two conditions led almost necessarily to a rush upon each other not however without some dexterous attempts to turn or double on the enemy followed by a hand-to-hand -hand melee in such a rush and such a melee a great consensus of respectable even eminent naval opinion of the present day finds the necessary outcome of modern naval weapons a kind of donnybrook fair in which as the history of melees shows it will be hard to know friend from foe whatever may prove to be the worth of this opinion it cannot claim an historical basis in the sole fact that galley and steamship can move at any moment directly upon the enemy and carry a beak upon their prow regardless of the points in which galley and steamship differ as yet this opinion is only a presumption upon which final judgment may well be deferred until the trial of battle has given further light until that time there is room for the opposite view that a melee between numerically equal fleets in which skill is reduced to a minimum is not the best that can be done with the elaborate and mighty weapons of this age 
the surer of himself an admiral is the finer the tactical development of his fleet the better his captains the more reluctant must he necessarily be to enter into a melee with equal forces in which all these advantages will be thrown away chance reign supreme and his fleet be placed on terms of equality with an assemblage of ships which have never before acted together history has lessons as to when melees are or are not in order the galley then has one striking resemblance to the steamer but differs in other important features which are not so immediately apparent and are therefore less accounted of in the sailing ship on the contrary the striking feature is the difference between it and the more modern vessel the points of resemblance though existing and easy to find are not so obvious and therefore are less heeded this impression is enhanced by the sense of utter weakness in the sailing ship as compared with the steamer owing to its dependence upon the wind forgetting that as the former fought with its equals the tactical lessons are valid the galley was never reduced to impotence by a calm and hence receives more respect in our day than the sailing ship yet the latter displaced it and remained supreme until the utilization of steam the powers to, to injure an enemy from a great distance to manoeuvre for an unlimited length of time without wearing out the men to devote the greater part of the crew to the offensive weapons instead of to the oar are common to the sailing vessel and the steamer and are at least as important tactically considered as the power of the galley to move in a calm or against the wind in tracing resemblances there is a tendency not only to overlook points of difference but to exaggerate points of likeness to be fanciful it may be so considered to point out that as the sailing ship had guns of long range with comparatively great penetrative power and carronades which were of shorter range but great smashing effect so the modern steamer has its batteries of long range guns and of torpedoes the latter being effective only within a limited distance and then injuring by smashing while the gun as of old aims at penetration yet these are distinctly tactical considerations which must affect the plans of admirals and captains and the analogy is real not forced so also both the sailing ship and the steamer contemplate direct contact with an enemy's vessel the former to carry her by boarding the latter to sink her by ramming and to both this is the most difficult of their tasks for to effect it the ship must be carried to a single point of the field of action whereas projectile weapons may be used from many points of a wide area the relative positions of two sailing ships or fleets with reference to the direction of the wind involved most important tactical questions and were perhaps the chief care of the seamen of that age to a superficial glance it may appear that since this has become a matter of such indifference to the steamer no analogies to it are to be found in present conditions and the lessons of history in this respect are valueless a more careful consideration of the distinguishing characteristics of the lee and the weather gauge directed to their essential features and disregarding secondary details will show that this is a mistake the distinguishing feature of the weather gauge was that it conferred the power of giving or refusing battle at will which in turn carries the usual advantage of an offensive attitude in the choice of the method of attack this advantage was accompanied by certain drawbacks such as irregularity introduced into the order exposure to raking or enfilading cannonade and the sacrifice of part or all of the artillery fire of the assailant all which were incurred in approaching the enemy the ship or fleet with the lee gauge could not attack if it did not wish to retreat its action was confined to the defensive and to receiving battle on the enemy's terms this disadvantage was compensated by the comparative ease of maintaining the order of battle 
undisturbed and by a sustained artillery fire to which the enemy for a time was unable to reply historically these favorable and unfavorable characteristics have their counterpart and analogy in the offensive and defensive operations of all ages the offense undertakes certain risks and disadvantages in order to reach and destroy the enemy the defense so long as it remains such refuses the risks of advance holds on to a careful well-ordered position and avails itself of the exposure to which the assailant submits himself these radical differences between the weather and the lee gauge were so clearly recognized through the cloud of lesser details accompanying them that the former was ordinarily chosen by the english because their steady policy was to assail and destroy their enemy whereas the french sought the lee gauge because by so doing they were usually able to cripple the enemy as he approached and thus evade decisive encounters and preserve their ships the french with rare exceptions subordinated the action of the navy to other military considerations grudged the money spent upon it and therefore sought to economize their fleet by assuming a defensive position and limiting its efforts to the repelling of assaults for this course the lee gauge skilfully used was admirably adapted so long as an enemy displayed more courage than conduct but when rodney showed an intention to use the advantage of the wind not merely to attack but to make a formidable concentration on a part of the enemy's line his wary opponent de guchin changed his tactics in the first of their three actions the frenchman took the lee gauge but after recognizing rodney's purpose he manoeuvred for the advantage of the wind not to attack but to refuse action except on his own terms the power to assume the offensive or to refuse battle rests no longer with the wind but with the party which has the greater speed which in a fleet will depend not only upon the speed of the individual ships but also upon their tactical uniformity of action henceforth the ships which have the greatest speed will have the weather gauge it is not therefore a vain expectation as many think to look for useful lessons in the history of sailing ships as well as in that of galleys both have their points of resemblance to the modern ship both have also points of essential difference which make it impossible to cite their experiences or modes of action as tactical precedents to be followed but a precedent is different from and less valuable than a principle the former may be originally faulty or may cease to apply through change of circumstances the latter has its root in the essential nature of things and however various its application as conditions change remains a standard to which action must conform to attain success war has such principles their existence is detected by the study of the past which reveals them in successes and in failures the same from age to age conditions and weapons change but to cope with the one or successfully wield the others respect must be had to these constant teachings of history in the tactics of the battlefield or in those wider operations of war which are comprised under the name of strategy it is however in these wider operations which embrace a whole theatre of war and in a maritime contest may cover a large portion of the globe that the teachings of history have a more evident and permanent value because the conditions remain more permanent the theatre of war may be larger or smaller its difficulties more or less pronounced the contending armies more or less great the necessary movements more or less easy but these are simply differences of scale of degree not of kind as a wilderness gives place to civilization as means of communication multiply as roads are opened rivers bridged food resources increased the operations of war become easier more rapid more extensive 
but the principles to which they must be conformed remain the same when the march on foot was replaced by carrying troops in coaches when the latter in turn gave place to railroads the scale of distances was increased or if you will the scale of time diminished but the principles which dictated the point at which the army should be concentrated the direction in which it should move the part of the enemy's position which it should assail the protection of communications were not altered so on the sea the advance from the galley timidly creeping from port to port to the sailing ship launching out boldly to the ends of the earth and from the latter to the steamship of our own time has increased the scope and the rapidity of naval operations without necessarily changing the principles which should direct them and the speech of hermocrates twenty three hundred years ago before quoted contained a correct strategic plan which is as applicable in its principles now as it was then before hostile armies or fleets are brought into contact a word which perhaps better than any other indicates the dividing line between tactics and strategy there are a number of questions to be decided covering the whole plan of operations throughout the theatre of war among these are the proper function of the navy in the war its true objective the point or points upon which it should be concentrated the establishment of depots of coal and supplies the maintenance of communications between these depots and the home base the military value of commerce destroying as a decisive or a secondary operation of war the system upon which commerce destroying can be most efficiently conducted whether by scattered cruisers or by holding in force some vital centre through which commercial shipping must pass all these are strategic questions and upon all these history has a great deal to say there has been of late a valuable discussion in english naval circles as to the comparative merits of the policies of two great english admirals lord howe and lord st vincent in the disposition of the english navy when at war with france the question is purely strategic and is not of mere historical interest it is of vital importance now and the principles upon which its decision rests are the same now as then st vincent's policy saved england from invasion and in the hands of nelson and his brother admirals led straight up to trafalgar it is then particularly in the field of naval strategy that the teachings of the past have a value which is in no degree lessened they are there useful not only as illustrative of principles but also as precedents owing to the comparative permanence of the conditions this is less obviously true as to tactics when the fleets come into collision at the point to which strategic considerations have brought them the unresting progress of mankind causes continual change in the weapons and with that must come a continual change in the manner of fighting in the handling and disposition of troops or ships on the battlefield hence arises a tendency on the part of many connected with maritime matters to think that no advantage is to be gained from the study of former experiences that time so used is wasted this view though natural not only leaves wholly out of sight those broad strategic considerations which lead nations to put fleets afloat which direct the sphere of their action and so have modified and will continue to modify the history of the world but is one-sided and narrow even as to tactics the battles of the past succeeded or failed according as they were fought in conformity with the principles of war and the seaman who carefully studies the causes of success or failure will not only detect and gradually assimilate these principles but will also acquire increased aptitude in applying them to the tactical use of the ships and weapons of his own day he will observe also that changes of tactics have not only taken place after changes in weapons which necessarily is the case but that the interval between such changes has been unduly long 
this doubtless arises from the fact that an improvement of weapons is due to the energy of one or two men while changes in tactics have to overcome the inertia of a conservative class but it is a great evil it can be remedied only by a candid recognition of each change by careful study of the powers and limitations of the new ship or weapon and by a consequent adaptation of the method of using it to the qualities it possesses which will constitute its tactics history shows that it is vain to hope that military men generally will be at the pains to do this but that the one who does will go into battle with a great advantage a lesson in itself of no mean value we may therefore accept now the words of a french tactician morogue who wrote a century and a quarter ago naval tactics are based upon conditions the chief causes of which namely the arms may change which in turn causes necessarily a change in the construction of ships in the manner of handling them and so finally in the disposition and handling of fleets his further statement that it is not a science founded upon principles absolutely invariable is more open to criticism it would be more correct to say that the application of its principles varies as the weapons change the application of the principles doubtless varies also in strategy from time to time but the variation is far less and hence the recognition of the underlying principle is easier this statement is of sufficient importance to our subject to receive some illustrations from historical events the battle of the nile in seventeen ninety eight was not only an overwhelming victory for the english over the french fleet but had also the decisive effect of destroying the communications between france and napoleon's army in egypt in the battle itself the english admiral nelson gave a most brilliant example of grand tactics if that be as has been defined the art of making good combinations preliminary to battles as well as during their progress the particular tactical combination depended upon a condition now passed away which was the inability of the lee ships of a fleet at anchor to come to the help of the weather ones before the latter were destroyed but the principles which underlay the combination namely to choose that part of the enemy's order which can least easily be helped and to attack it with superior forces has not passed away the action of admiral jervis at cape st vincent when with fifteen ships he won a victory over twenty-seven was dictated by the same principle though in this case the enemy was not at anchor but under way yet men's minds are so constituted that they seem more impressed by the transiency of the conditions than by the undying principle which coped with them in the strategic effect of nelson's victory upon the course of the war on the contrary the principle involved is not only more easily recognized but it is at once seen to be applicable to our own day the issue of the enterprise in egypt depended upon keeping open the communications with france the victory of the nile destroyed the naval force by which alone the communications could be assured and determined the final failure and it is at once seen not only that the blow was struck in accordance with the principle of striking at the enemy's line of communication but also that the same principle is valid now and would be equally so in the days of the galley as of the sailing ship or steamer nevertheless a vague feeling of contempt for the past supposed to be obsolete combines with natural indolence to blind men even to those permanent strategic lessons which lie close to the surface of naval history for instance how many look upon the battle of trafalgar the crown of nelson's glory and the seal of his genius as other than an isolated event of exceptional grandeur how many ask themselves the strategic question how did the ships come to be just there how many realize it to be the final act in a great strategic drama extending over a year or more in which two of the greatest leaders that ever lived napoleon and nelson were pitted against each other 
at trafalgar it was not villeneuve that failed but napoleon that was vanquished not nelson that won but england that was saved and why because napoleon's combinations failed and nelson's intuitions and activity kept the english fleet ever on the track of the enemy and brought it up in time at the decisive moment the tactics at trafalgar while open to criticism in detail were in their main features conformable to the principles of war and their audacity was justified as well by the urgency of the case as by the results but the great lessons of efficiency in preparation of activity and energy in execution and of thought and insight on the part of the english leader during the previous months are strategic lessons and as such they still remain good in these two cases events were worked out to their natural and decisive end a third may be cited in which as no such definite end was reached an opinion as to what should have been done may be open to dispute in the war of the american revolution france and spain became allies against england in seventeen seventy nine the united fleets thrice appeared in the english channel once to the number of sixty-six sail of the line driving the english fleet to seek refuge in its ports because far inferior in numbers now the great aim of spain was to recover gibraltar and jamaica and to the former end immense efforts both by land and sea were put forth by the allies against that nearly impregnable fortress they were fruitless the question suggested and it is purely one of naval strategy is this would not gibraltar have been more surely recovered by controlling the english channel attacking the british fleet even in its harbours and threatening england with annihilation of commerce and invasion at home than by far greater efforts directed against a distant and very strong outpost of her empire the english people from long immunity were particularly sensitive to fears of invasion and their great confidence in their fleets if rudely shaken would have left them proportionately disheartened however decided the question as a point of strategy is fair and it is proposed in another form by a french officer of the period who favoured directing the great effort on a west india island which might be exchanged against gibraltar it is not however likely that england would have given up the key of the mediterranean for any other foreign possession though she might have yielded it to save her firesides and her capital napoleon once said that he would reconquer pondicherry on the banks of the vistula could he have controlled the english channel as the allied fleet did for a moment in seventeen seventy nine can it be doubted that he would have conquered gibraltar on the shores of england to impress more strongly the truth that history both suggests strategic study and illustrates the principles of war by the facts which it transmits two more instances will be taken which are more remote in time than the period specially considered in this work how did it happen that in two great contests between the powers of the east and of the west in the mediterranean in one of which the empire of the known world was at stake the opposing fleets met on spots so near each other as actium and lepanto was this a mere coincidence or was it due to conditions that recurred and may recur again if the latter it is worth while to study out the reason for if there should again arise a great eastern power of the sea like that of antony or of turkey the strategic questions would be similar at present indeed it seems that the centre of sea power resting mainly with england and france is overwhelmingly in the west but should any chance add to the control of the black sea basin which russia now has the possession of the entrance to the mediterranean the existing strategic conditions affecting sea power would all be modified now were the west arrayed against the east england and france would go at once unopposed to the levant as they did in eighteen fifty four and as england all alone went in eighteen seventy eight in case of the change suggested the east as twice before would meet the west half way 
at a very conspicuous and momentous period of the world's history sea power had a strategic bearing and weight which has received scant recognition there cannot now be had the full knowledge necessary for tracing in detail its influence upon the issue of the second punic war but the indications which remain are sufficient to warrant the assertion that it was a determining factor an accurate judgment upon this point cannot be formed by mastering only such facts of the particular contest as have been clearly transmitted for as usual the naval transactions have been slightingly passed over there is needed also familiarity with the details of general naval history in order to draw from slight indications correct inferences based upon a knowledge of what has been possible at periods whose history is well known the control of the sea however real does not imply that an enemy's single ships or small squadrons cannot steal out of port cannot cross more or less frequented tracts of ocean make harassing descents upon unprotected points of a long coastline enter blockaded harbors on the contrary history has shown that such evasions are always possible to some extent to the weaker party however great the inequality of naval strength it is not therefore inconsistent with the general control of the sea or of a decisive part of it by the roman fleets that the carthaginian admiral bomilcar in the fourth year of the war after the stunning defeat of cannae landed four thousand men and a body of elephants in south italy nor that in the seventh year flying from the roman fleet off syracuse he again appeared at tarentum then in hannibal's hands nor that hannibal sent dispatch vessels to carthage nor even that at last he withdrew in safety to africa with his wasted army none of these things prove that the government in carthage could if it wished have sent hannibal the constant support which as a matter of fact he did not receive but they do tend to create a natural impression that such help could have been given therefore the statement that the roman preponderance at sea had a decisive effect upon the course of the war needs to be made good by an examination of ascertained facts thus the kind and degree of its influence may be fairly estimated at the beginning of the war momsen says rome controlled the seas to whatever cause or combination of causes it be attributed this essentially non-maritime state had in the first punic war established over its seafaring rival a naval supremacy which still lasted in the second war there was no naval battle of importance a circumstance which in itself and still more in connection with other well ascertained facts indicates a superiority analogous to that which at other epochs has been marked by the same feature as hannibal left no memoirs the motives are unknown which determined him to the perilous and almost ruinous march through gaul and across the alps it is certain however that his fleet on the coast of spain was not strong enough to contend with that of rome had it been he might still have followed the road he actually did for reasons that weighed with him but had he gone by the sea he would not have lost thirty three thousand out of the sixty thousand veteran soldiers with whom he started while hannibal was making this dangerous march the romans were sending to spain under the two elder scipios one part of their fleet carrying a consular army this made the voyage without serious loss and the army established itself successfully north of the ebro on hannibal's line of communications at the same time another squadron with an army commanded by the other consul was sent to sicily the two together numbered two hundred and twenty ships on its station each met and defeated a carthaginian squadron with an ease which may be inferred from the slight mention made of the actions and which indicates the actual superiority of the roman fleet after the second year the war assumed the following shape hannibal having entered italy by the north after a series of successes had passed southward around rome and fixed himself in southern italy living off the country a condition which tended to alienate the people and was especially precarious 
when in contact with the mighty political and military system of control which rome had there established it was therefore from the first urgently necessary that he should establish between himself and some reliable base that stream of supplies and reinforcements which in terms of modern war is called communications there were three friendly regions which might each or all serve as such a base carthage itself macedonia and spain with the first two communication could be had only by sea from spain where his firmest support was found he could be reached by both land and sea unless an enemy barred the passage but the sea route was the shorter and easier in the first years of the war rome by her sea power controlled absolutely the basin between italy sicily and spain known as the tyrrhenian and sardinian seas the sea coast from the ebro to the tiber was mostly friendly to her in the fourth year after the battle of cannae syracuse forsook the roman alliance the revolt spread through sicily and macedonia also entered into an offensive league with hannibal these changes extended the necessary operations of the roman fleet and taxed its strength what disposition was made of it and how did it thereafter influence the struggle the indications are clear that rome at no time ceased to control the tyrrhenian sea for her squadrons passed unmolested from italy to spain on the spanish coast also she had full sway till the younger scipio saw fit to lay up the fleet in the adriatic a squadron and naval station were established at brindisi to check macedonia which performed their task so well that not a soldier of the phalanx has ever set foot in italy the want of a war fleet says momsen paralyzed philip in all his movements here the effect of sea power is not even a matter of inference in sicily the struggle centred about syracuse the fleets of carthage and rome met there but the superiority evidently lay with the latter for though the carthaginians at times succeeded in throwing supplies into the city they avoided meeting the roman fleet in battle with lilibium palermo and messina in its hands the latter was well based in the north coast of the island access by the south was left open to the carthaginians and they were thus able to maintain the insurrection putting these facts together it is a reasonable inference and supported by the whole tenor of the history that the roman sea power controlled the sea north of the line drawn from tarragona in spain to lilibium the modern marsala at the west end of sicily thence round by the north side of the island through the straits of messina down to syracuse and from there to brindisi in the adriatic this control lasted unshaken throughout the war it did not exclude maritime raids large or small such as have been spoken of but it did forbid the sustained and secure communications of which hannibal was in deadly need on the other hand it seems equally plain that for the first ten years of the war the roman fleet was not strong enough for sustained operations in the sea between sicily and carthage nor indeed much to the south of the line indicated when hannibal started he assigned such ships as he had to maintaining the communications between spain and africa which the romans did not then attempt to disturb the roman sea power therefore through macedonia wholly out of the war it did not keep carthage from maintaining a useful and most harassing diversion in sicily but it did prevent her sending troops when they would have been most useful to her great general in italy how was it as to spain spain was the region upon which the father of hannibal and hannibal himself had based their intended invasion of italy for eighteen years before this began they had occupied the country extending and consolidating their power both political and military with rare sagacity they had raised and trained in local wars a large and now veteran army upon his own departure hannibal entrusted the government to his younger brother hasdrubal who preserved toward him to the end a loyalty and devotion which he had no reason to hope from the faction cursed mother city in africa at the time of his starting the carthaginian power in spain was secured from cadiz to the river ebro 
the region between this river and the pyrenees was inhabited by tribes friendly to the romans but unable in the absence of the latter to oppose a successful resistance to hannibal he put them down leaving eleven thousand soldiers under hanno to keep military possession of the country lest the romans should establish themselves there and thus disturb his communications with his base Canaeus Scipio, however, arrived on the spot by sea the same year with twenty thousand men, defeated Hanno, and occupied both the coast and interior north of the Ebro. The Romans thus held ground by which they entirely closed the road between Hannibal and reinforcements from Hasdrubal, and whence they could attack the Carthaginian power in Spain, while their own communications with Italy, being by water, were secured by their naval supremacy. They made a naval base at Tarragona, confronting that of Hasdrubal at Cartagena, and then invaded the Carthaginian dominions. The war in Spain went on under the elder Scipio's seemingly a side issue with varying fortune for seven years, at the end of which time Hasdrubal inflicted upon them a crushing defeat. The two brothers were killed, and the Carthaginians nearly succeeded in breaking through to the Pyrenees with reinforcements for Hannibal. The attempt, however, was checked for the moment and before it could be renewed the fall of capua released twelve thousand veteran romans who were sent to spain under claudius nero a man of exceptional ability to whom was due later the most decisive military movement made by any roman general during the second punic war this seasonable reinforcement which again assured the shaken grip on hasdrubal's line of march came by sea a way which though most rapid and easy was closed to the carthaginians by the roman navy two years later the younger publius scipio celebrated afterward as africanus received the command in spain and captured cartagena by a combined military and naval attack after which he took the most extraordinary step of breaking up his fleet and transferring the seamen to the army not contented to act merely as the containing force against hasdrubal by closing the passes of the pyrenees scipio pushed forward into southern spain and fought a severe but indecisive battle on the quadraquivir after which hasdrubal slipped away from him hurried north crossed the pyrenees at their extreme west and pressed on to italy where hannibal's position was daily growing weaker the natural waste of his army not being replaced the war had lasted ten years when hasdrubal having met little loss on the way entered italy at the north the troops he brought could they be safely united with those under the command of the unrivalled hannibal might give a decisive turn to the war for rome herself was nearly exhausted the iron links which bound her own colonies and the allied states to her were strained to the utmost and some had already snapped but the military position of the two brothers was also perilous in the extreme one being at the river metaurus the other in apulia two hundred miles apart each was confronted by a superior enemy and both these roman armies were between their separated opponents this false situation as well as the long delay of hasdrubal's coming was due to the roman control of the sea which throughout the war limited the mutual support of the carthaginian brothers to the route through gaul at the very time that hasdrubal was making his long and dangerous circuit by land scipio had sent eleven thousand men from spain by sea to reinforce the army opposed to him the upshot was that messengers from hasdrubal to hannibal having to pass over so wide a belt of hostile country fell into the hands of claudius nero commanding the southern roman army who thus learned the route which hasdrubal intended to take nero correctly appreciated the situation and escaping the vigilance of hannibal made a rapid march with eight thousand of his best troops to join the forces in the north the junction being effected the two consuls fell upon hasdrubal in overwhelming numbers and destroyed his army the carthaginian leader himself falling in the battle hannibal's first news of the disaster was by the head of his brother being thrown into his camp he is said to have exclaimed that rome would now be mistress of the world and the battle of metaurus is generally accepted as decisive of the struggle between the two states 
the military situation which finally resulted in the battle of the metaurus and the triumph of rome may be summed up as follows to overthrow rome it was necessary to attack her in italy at the heart of her power and shatter the strongly linked confederacy of which she was the head this was the objective to reach it the carthaginians needed a solid base of operations and a secure line of communications the former was established in spain by the genius of the great barca family the latter was never achieved there were two lines possible the one direct by sea the other circuitous through gaul the first was blocked by the roman sea power the second imperiled and finally intercepted through the occupation of northern spain by the roman army this occupation was made possible through the control of the sea which the carthaginians never endangered with respect to hannibal and his base therefore rome occupied two central positions rome itself and northern spain joined by an easy interior line of communications the sea by which mutual support was continually given had the mediterranean been a level desert of land in which the romans held strong mountain ranges in corsica and sardinia fortified posts at tarragona lilibium and messina the italian coastline nearly to genoa and allied fortresses in marseilles and other points had they also possessed an armed force capable by its character of traversing that desert at will but in which their opponents were very inferior and therefore compelled to a great circuit in order to concentrate their troops the military situation would have been at once recognized and no words would have been too strong to express the value and effect of that peculiar force it would have been perceived also that the enemy's force of the same kind might however inferior in strength make an inroad or raid upon the territory thus held might burn a village or waste a few miles of borderland might even cut off a convoy at times without in a military sense endangering the communications such predatory operations have been carried on in all ages by the weaker maritime belligerent but they by no means warrant the inference irreconcilable with the known facts that neither rome nor carthage could be said to have undisputed mastery of the sea because roman fleets sometimes visited the coasts of africa and carthaginian fleets in the same way appeared off the coast of italy in the case under consideration the navy played the part of such a force upon the supposed desert but as it acts on an element strange to most writers as its members have been from time immemorial a strange race apart without profits of their own neither themselves nor their calling understood its immense determining influence upon the history of that era and consequently upon the history of the world has been overlooked if the preceding argument is sound it is as defective to omit sea-power from the list of principal factors in the result as it would be absurd to claim for it an exclusive influence instances such as have been cited drawn from widely separated periods of time both before and after that specially treated in this work serve to illustrate the intrinsic interest of the subject and the character of the lessons which history has to teach as before observed these come more often under the head of strategy than of tactics they bear rather upon the conduct of campaigns than of battles and hence are fraught with more lasting value to quote a great authority in this connection jomini says happening to be in paris near the end of eighteen fifty one a distinguished person did me the honour to ask my opinion as to whether recent improvements in firearms would cause any great modifications in the way of making war i replied that they would probably have an influence upon the details of tactics but that in great strategic operations and the grand combinations of battles victory would now as ever result from the application of the principles which had led to the success of great generals in all ages of alexander and caesar as well as of frederick and napoleon this study has become more than ever important now to navies because of the great and steady power of movement possessed by the modern steamer the best planned schemes might fail through stress of weather in the days of the galley and the sailing ship but this difficulty has almost disappeared the principles which should direct great naval combinations have been applicable to all ages and are deducible from history but the power to carry them out with little regard to the weather is a recent gain 
the definitions usually given of the word strategy confine it to military combinations embracing one or more fields of operations either wholly distinct or mutually dependent but always regarded as actual or immediate scenes of war however this may be on shore a recent french author is quite right in pointing out that such a definition is too narrow for naval strategy this he says differs from military strategy in that it is as necessary in peace as in war indeed in peace it may gain its most decisive victories by occupying in a country either by purchase or treaty excellent positions which would perhaps hardly be got by war it learns to profit by all opportunities of settling on some chosen point of a coast and to render definitive an occupation which at first was only transient a generation that has seen england within ten years occupy successively cyprus and egypt under terms and conditions on their face transient but which have not yet led to the abandonment of the positions taken can readily agree with this remark which indeed receives constant illustration from the quiet persistency with which all the great sea powers are seeking position after position less noted and less noteworthy than cyprus and egypt in the different seas to which their people and their ships penetrate naval strategy has indeed for its end to found support and increase as well in peace as in war the sea power of a country and therefore its study has an interest and value for all citizens of a free country but especially for those who are charged with its foreign and military relations the general conditions that either are essential to or powerfully affect the greatness of a nation upon the sea will now be examined after which a more particular consideration of the various maritime nations of europe at the middle of the seventeenth century where the historical survey begins will serve at once to illustrate and give precision to the conclusions upon the general subject note the brilliancy of nelson's fame dimming as it does that of all his contemporaries and the implicit trust felt by england in him as the one man able to save her from the schemes of napoleon should not of course obscure the fact that only one portion of the field was or could be occupied by him napoleon's aim in the campaign which ended at trafalgar was to unite in the west indies the french fleets of brest toulon and rochefort together with a strong body of spanish ships thus forming an overwhelming force which he intended should return together to the english channel and cover the crossing of the french army he naturally expected that with england's interests scattered all over the world confusion and distraction would arise from ignorance of the destination of the french squadrons and the english navy be drawn away from his objective point the portion of the field committed to nelson was the mediterranean where he watched the great arsenal of toulon and the highways alike to the east and to the atlantic this was inferior in consequence to no other and assumed additional importance in the eyes of nelson from his conviction that the former attempts on egypt would be renewed owing to this persuasion he took at first a false step which delayed his pursuit of the toulon fleet when it sailed under the command of villeneuve and the latter was further favoured by a long continuance of fair winds while the english had head winds but while all this is true while the failure of napoleon's combinations must be attributed to the tenacious grip of the english blockade off brest as well as to nelson's energetic pursuit of the toulon fleet when it escaped to the west indies and again on its hasty return to europe the latter is fairly entitled to the eminent distinction which history has accorded it and which is asserted in the text nelson did not indeed fathom the intentions of napoleon this may have been owing as some have said to lack of insight but it may be more simply laid to the usual disadvantage under which the defence lies before the blow has fallen of ignorance as to the point threatened by the offence it is insight enough to fasten on the key of a situation and this nelson rightly saw was the fleet not the station consequently his action has afforded a striking instance of how tenacity of purpose and untiring energy in execution can repair 
a first mistake and baffle deeply laid plans his mediterranean command embraced many duties and cares but amid and dominating them all he saw clearly the toulon fleet as the controlling factor there and an important factor in any naval combination of the emperor hence his attention was unwaveringly fixed upon it so much so that he called it his fleet a phrase which has somewhat vexed the sensibilities of french critics this simple and accurate view of the military situation strengthened him in taking the fearless resolution and bearing the immense responsibility of abandoning his station in order to follow his fleet determined thus on a pursuit the undeniable wisdom of which should not obscure the greatness of mind that undertook it he followed so vigorously as to reach cadiz on his return a week before villeneuve entered ferrol despite unavoidable delays arising from false information and uncertainty as to the enemy's movements the same untiring ardor enabled him to bring up his own ships from cadiz to brest in time to make the fleet there superior to villeneuve's had the latter persisted in his attempt to reach the neighborhood the english very inferior in aggregate number of vessels to the allied fleets were by this seasonable reinforcement of eight veteran ships put into the best possible position strategically as will be pointed out in dealing with similar conditions in the war of the american revolution their forces were united in one great fleet in the bay of biscay interposed between the two divisions of the enemy in brest and ferrol superior in number to either singly and with a strong probability of being able to deal with one before the other could come up this was due to able action all round on the part of the english authorities but above all other factors in the result stands nelson's single-minded pursuit of his fleet this interesting series of strategic movements ended on the fourteenth of august when villeneuve in despair of reaching brest headed for cadiz where he anchored on the twentieth as soon as napoleon heard of this after an outburst of rage against the admiral he at once dictated the series of movements which resulted in alm and austerlitz abandoning his purposes against england the battle of trafalgar fought october twenty one was therefore separated by a space of two months from the extensive movements of which it was nevertheless the outcome isolated from them in point of time it was none the less the seal of nelson's genius affixed later to the record he had made in the near past with equal truth it is said that england was saved at trafalgar though the emperor had then given up his intended invasion the destruction there emphasized and sealed the strategic triumph which had noiselessly foiled napoleon's plans end of introductory chapter one part one of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one discussion of the elements of sea power the first and most obvious light in which the sea presents itself from the political and social point of view is that of a great highway or better perhaps of a wide common over which men may pass in all directions but on which some well-worn paths show that controlling reasons have led them to choose certain lines of travel rather than others these lines of travel are called trade routes and the reasons which have determined them are to be sought in the history of the world notwithstanding all the familiar and unfamiliar dangers of the sea both travel and traffic by water have always been easier and cheaper than by land the commercial greatness of holland was due not only to her shipping at sea but also to the numerous tranquil waterways which gave such cheap and easy access to her own interior and to that of germany this advantage of carriage by water over that by land was yet more marked in a period when roads were few and very bad wars frequent and society unsettled as was the case two hundred years ago sea traffic then went in peril of robbers but was nevertheless safer and quicker than that by land a dutch writer of that time estimating the chances of his country in a war with england 
notices among other things that the waterways of england failed to penetrate the country sufficiently therefore the roads being bad goods from one part of the kingdom to the other must go by sea and be exposed to capture by the way as regards purely internal trade this danger has generally disappeared at the present day in most civilized countries now the destruction or disappearance of the coasting trade would only be an inconvenience although water transit is still the cheaper nevertheless as late as the wars of the french republic and the first empire those who are familiar with the history of the period and the light naval literature that has grown up around it know how constant is the mention of convoys stealing from point to point along the french coast although the sea swarmed with english cruisers and there were good inland roads under modern conditions however home trade is but a part of the business of a country bordering on the sea foreign necessaries or luxuries must be brought to its ports either in its own or in foreign ships which will return bearing in exchange the products of the country whether they be the fruits of the earth or the works of men's hands and it is the wish of every nation that this shipping business should be done by its own vessels the ships that thus sail to and fro must have secure ports to which to return and must as far as possible be followed by the protection of their country throughout the voyage this protection in time of war must be extended by armed shipping the necessity of a navy in the restricted sense of the word springs therefore from the existence of a peaceful shipping and disappears with it except in the case of a nation which has aggressive tendencies and keeps up a navy merely as a branch of the military establishment as the united states has at present no aggressive purposes and as its merchant service has disappeared the dwindling of the armed fleet and general lack of interest in it are strictly logical consequences when for any reason sea trade is again found to pay a large enough shipping interest will reappear to compel the revival of the war fleet it is possible that when a canal route through the central american isthmus is seen to be a near certainty the aggressive impulse may be strong enough to lead to the same result this is doubtful however because a peaceful gain-loving nation is not far-sighted and far-sightedness is needed for adequate military preparation especially in these days as a nation with its unarmed and armed shipping launches forth from its own shores the need is soon felt of points upon which the ships can rely for peaceful trading for refuge and supplies in the present day friendly though foreign ports are to be found all over the world and their shelter is enough while peace prevails it was not always so nor does peace always endure though the united states have been favored by so long a continuance of it in earlier times the merchant seaman seeking for trade in new and unexplored regions made his gains at risk of life and liberty from suspicious or hostile nations and was under great delays in collecting a full and profitable freight he therefore intuitively sought at the far end of his trade route one or more stations to be given to him by force or favor where he could fix himself or his agents in reasonable security where his ships could lie in safety and where the merchantable products of the land could be continually collecting awaiting the arrival of the home fleet which should carry them to the mother country as there was immense gain as well as much risk in these early voyages such establishments naturally multiplied and grew until they became colonies whose ultimate development and success depended upon the genius and policy of the nation from which they sprang and form a very great part of the history and particularly of the sea history of the world 
all colonies had not the simple and natural birth and growth above described many were more formal and purely political in their conception and founding the act of the rulers of the people rather than of private individuals but the trading station with its after expansion the work simply of the adventurer seeking gain was in its reasons and essence the same as the elaborately organized and chartered colony in both cases the mother country had won a foothold in a foreign land seeking a new outlet for what it had to sell a new sphere for its shipping more employment for its people more comfort and wealth for itself the needs of commerce however were not all provided for when safety had been secured at the far end of the road the voyages were long and dangerous the seas often beset with enemies in the most active days of colonizing there prevailed on the sea a lawlessness the very memory of which is now almost lost and the days of settled peace between maritime nations were few and far between thus arose the demand for stations along the road like the cape of good hope st helena and mauritius not primarily for trade but for defence and war the demand for the possession of posts like gibraltar malta louisbourg at the entrance of the gulf of st lawrence posts whose value was chiefly strategic though not necessarily wholly so colonies and colonial posts were sometimes commercial sometimes military in their character and it was exceptional that the same position was equally important in both points of view as new york was in these three things production with the necessity of exchanging products shipping whereby the exchange is carried on and colonies which facilitate and enlarge the operations of shipping and tend to protect it by multiplying points of safety is to be found the key to much of the history as well as of the policy of nations bordering upon the sea the policy has varied both with the spirit of the age and with the character and clear-sightedness of the rulers but the history of the seaboard nations has been less determined by the shrewdness and foresight of governments than by conditions of position extent configuration number and character of their people by what are called in a word natural conditions it must however be admitted and will be seen that the wise or unwise action of individual men has at certain periods had a great modifying influence upon the growth of sea power in the broad sense which includes not only the military strength afloat that rules the sea or any part of it by force of arms but also the peaceful commerce and shipping from which alone a military fleet naturally and healthfully springs and on which it securely rests the principal conditions affecting the sea power of nations may be enumerated as follows one geographical position two physical conformation including as connected therewith natural productions and climate three extent of territory four number of population five character of the people six character of the government including therein the national institutions one geographical position it may be pointed out in the first place that if a nation be so situated that it is neither forced to defend itself by land nor induced to seek extension of its territory by way of the land it has by the very unity of its aim directed upon the sea an advantage as compared with a people one of whose boundaries is continental this has been a great advantage to england over both france and holland as a sea-power the strength of the latter was early exhausted by the necessity of keeping up a large army and carrying on expensive wars to preserve her independence while the policy of france was constantly diverted sometimes wisely and sometimes most foolishly from the sea to projects of continental extension these military efforts expended wealth whereas a wiser and consistent use of her geographical position would have added to it the geographical position may be such as of itself to promote a concentration or to necessitate a dispersion of the naval forces
here again the british islands have an advantage over france the position of the latter touching the mediterranean as well as the ocean while it has its advantages is on the whole a source of military weakness at sea the eastern and western french fleets have only been able to unite after passing through the straits of gibraltar in attempting which they have often risked and sometimes suffered loss the position of the united states upon the two oceans would be either a source of great weakness or a cause of enormous expense had it a large sea commerce on both coasts england by her immense colonial empire has sacrificed much of this advantage of concentration of force around her own shores but the sacrifice was wisely made for the gain was greater than the loss as the event proved with the growth of her colonial system her war fleets also grew but her merchant shipping and wealth grew yet faster still in the wars of the american revolution and of the french republican empire to use the strong expression of a french author england despite the immense development of her navy seemed ever in the midst of riches to feel all the embarrassment of poverty the might of england was sufficient to keep alive the heart and the members whereas the equally extensive colonial empire of spain through her maritime weakness but offered so many points for insult and injury the geographical position of a country may not only favor the concentration of its forces but give the further strategic advantage of a central position and a good base for hostile operations against its probable enemies this again is the case with england on the one hand she faces holland and the northern powers on the other france and the atlantic when threatened with a coalition between france and the naval powers of the north sea and the baltic as she at times was her fleets in the downs and in the channel and even that off brest occupied interior positions and thus were readily able to interpose their united force against either one of the enemies which should seek to pass through the channel to effect a junction with its ally on either side also nature gave her better ports and a safer coast to approach formerly this was a very serious element in the passage through the channel but of late steam and the improvement of her harbors have lessened the disadvantage under which france once labored in the days of sailing ships the english fleet operated against brest making its base at torbay and plymouth the plan was simply this in easterly or moderate weather the blockading fleet kept its position without difficulty but in westerly gales when too severe they bore up for english ports knowing that the french fleet could not get out till the wind shifted which equally served to bring them back to their station the advantage of geographical nearness to an enemy or to the object of attack is nowhere more apparent than in that form of warfare which has lately received the name of commerce destroying which the french call guerre de course this operation of war being directed against peaceful merchant vessels which are usually defenceless calls for ships of small military force such ships having little power to defend themselves need a refuge or point of support near at hand which will be found either in certain parts of the sea controlled by the fighting ships of their country or in friendly harbors the latter give the strongest support because they are always in the same place and the approaches to them are more familiar to the commerce destroyer than to his enemy the nearness of france to england has thus greatly facilitated her guerre de course directed against the latter having ports on the north sea on the channel and on the atlantic her cruisers started from points near the focus of english trade both coming and going the distance of these ports from each other disadvantageous for regular military combinations is an advantage for this irregular secondary operation for the essence of the one is concentration of effort whereas for commerce destroying diffusion of effort is the rule commerce destroyers scatter that they may see and seize more prey 
these truths receive illustration from the history of the great french privateers whose bases and scenes of action were largely on the channel and north sea or else were found in distant colonial regions where islands like guadeloupe and martinique afforded similar near refuge the necessity of renewing coal makes the cruiser of the present day even more dependent than of old on his port public opinion in the united states has great faith in war directed against an enemy's commerce but it must be remembered that the republic has no ports very near the great centres of trade abroad her geographical position is therefore singularly disadvantageous for carrying on successful commerce destroying unless she finds bases in the ports of an ally if in addition to facility for offence nature has so placed a country that it has easy access to the high sea itself while at the same time it controls one of the great thoroughfares of the world's traffic it is evident that the strategic value of its position is very high such again is and to a greater degree was the position of england the trade of holland sweden russia denmark and that which went up the great rivers to the interior of germany had to pass through the channel close by her doors for sailing ships hugged the english coast this northern trade had moreover a peculiar bearing upon sea power for naval stores as they are commonly called were mainly drawn from the baltic countries but for the loss of gibraltar the position of spain would have been closely analogous to that of england looking at once upon the atlantic and the mediterranean with cadiz on the one side and cartagena on the other the trade to the levant must have passed under her hands and that round the cape of good hope not far from her doors but gibraltar not only deprived her of the control of the straits it also imposed an obstacle to the easy junction of the two divisions of her fleet at the present day looking only at the geographical position of italy and not at the other conditions affecting her sea-power it would seem that with her extensive sea-coast and good ports she is very well placed for exerting a decisive influence on the trade route to the levant and by the isthmus of suez this is true in a degree and would be much more so did italy now hold all the islands naturally italian but with malta in the hands of england and corsica in those of france the advantages of her geographical position are largely neutralized from race affinities and situation those two islands are as legitimately objects of desire to italy as gibraltar is to spain if the adriatic were a great highway of commerce italy's position would be still more influential these defects in her geographical completeness combined with other causes injurious to a full and secure development of sea power make it more than doubtful whether italy can for some time be in the front rank among the sea nations as the aim here is not an exhaustive discussion but merely an attempt to show by illustration how vitally the situation of a country may affect its career upon the sea this division of the subject may be dismissed for the present the more so as instances which will further bring out its importance will continually recur in the historical treatment two remarks however are here appropriate circumstances have caused the mediterranean sea to play a greater part in the history of the world both in a commercial and a military point of view than any other sheet of water of the same size nation after nation has striven to control it and the strife still goes on therefore a study of the conditions upon which preponderance in its waters has rested and now rests and of the relative military values of different points upon its coasts will be more instructive than the same amount of effort expended in another field furthermore it has at the present time a very marked analogy in many respects to the caribbean sea an analogy which will be still closer if a panama canal route ever be completed a study of the strategic conditions of the mediterranean which have received ample illustration will be an excellent prelude to a similar study of the caribbean which has comparatively little history the second remark bears upon the geographical position of the united states relatively to a central american canal 
if one be made and fulfil the hopes of its builders the caribbean will be changed from a terminus and place of local traffic or at best a broken and imperfect line of travel as it now is into one of the great highways of the world along this path the great commerce will travel bringing the interests of the other great nations the european nations close along our shores as they have never been before with this it will not be so easy as heretofore to stand aloof from international complications the position of the united states with reference to this route will resemble that of england to the channel and of the mediterranean countries to the suez route as regards influence and control over it depending upon geographical position it is of course plain that the centre of the national power the permanent base is much nearer than that of other great nations the positions now or hereafter occupied by them on island or mainland however strong will be but outposts of their power while in all the raw materials of military strength no nation is superior to the united states she is however weak in a confessed unpreparedness for war and her geographical nearness to the point of contention loses some of its value by the character of the gulf coast which is deficient in ports combining security from an enemy with facility for repairing warships of the first class without which ships no country can pretend to control any part of the sea in case of a contest for supremacy in the caribbean it seems evident from the depth of the south pass of the mississippi the nearness of new orleans and the advantages of the mississippi valley for water transit that the main effort of the country must pour down that valley and its permanent base of operations be found there the defence of the entrance to the mississippi however presents peculiar difficulties while the only two rival ports key west and pensacola have too little depth of water and are much less advantageously placed with reference to the resources of the country to get the full benefit of superior geographical position these defects must be overcome furthermore as her distance from the isthmus though relatively less is still considerable the united states will have to obtain in the caribbean stations fit for contingent or secondary bases of operations which by their natural advantages susceptibility of defence and nearness to the central strategic issue will enable her fleets to remain as near the scene as any opponent with ingress and egress from the mississippi sufficiently protected with such outposts in her hands and with the communications between them and the home base secured in short with proper military preparation for which she has all necessary means the preponderance of the united states on this field follows from her geographical position and her power with mathematical certainty two physical confirmation the peculiar features of the gulf coast just alluded to come properly under the head of physical confirmation of a country which is placed second for discussion among the conditions which affect the development of sea power the seaboard of a country is one of its frontiers and the easier the access offered by the frontier to the region beyond in this case the sea the greater will be the tendency of a people toward intercourse with the rest of the world by it if a country be imagined having a long seaboard but entirely without a harbor such a country can have no sea trade of its own no shipping no navy this was practically the case with belgium when it was a spanish and an austrian province the dutch in sixteen forty eight as a condition of peace after a successful war exacted that the scheldt should be closed to sea commerce this closed the harbour of antwerp and transferred the sea trade of belgium to holland the spanish netherlands ceased to be a sea power numerous and deep harbours are a source of strength and wealth and doubly so if they are the outlets of navigable streams which facilitate the concentration in them of a country's internal trade but by their very accessibility they become a source of weakness in war if not properly defended 
the dutch in sixteen sixty seven found little difficulty in ascending the thames and burning a large fraction of the english navy within sight of london whereas a few years later the combined fleets of england and france when attempting a landing in holland were foiled by the difficulties of the coast as much as by the valour of the dutch fleet in seventeen seventy eight the harbour of new york and with it undisputed control of the hudson river would have been lost to the english who were caught at disadvantage but for the hesitancy of the french admiral with that control new england would have been restored to close and safe communication with new york new jersey and pennsylvania and this blow following so closely on burgoyne's disaster of the year before would probably have led the english to make an earlier peace the mississippi is a mighty source of wealth and strength to the united states but the feeble defences of its mouth and the number of its subsidiary streams penetrating the country made it a weakness and a source of disaster to the southern confederacy and lastly in eighteen fourteen the occupation of the chesapeake and the destruction of washington gave a sharp lesson of the dangers incurred through the noblest waterways if their approaches be undefended a lesson recent enough to be easily recalled but which from the present appearance of the coast defences seems to be yet more easily forgotten nor should it be thought that conditions have changed circumstances and details of offence and defence have been modified in these days as before but the great conditions remain the same before and during the great napoleonic wars france had no port for ships of the line east of brest how great the advantage to england which in the same stretch has two great arsenals at plymouth and at portsmouth besides other harbours of refuge and supply this defect of confirmation has since been remedied by the works at cherbourg besides the contour of the coast involving easy access to the sea there are other physical conditions which lead people to the sea or turn them from it although france was deficient in military ports on the channel she had both there and on the ocean as well as in the mediterranean excellent harbours favourably situated for trade abroad and at the outlet of large rivers which would foster internal traffic but when richelieu had put an end to civil war frenchmen did not take to the sea with the eagerness and success of the english and dutch a principal reason for this has been plausibly found in the physical conditions which have made france a pleasant land with a delightful climate producing within itself more than its people needed england on the other hand received from nature but little and until her manufactures were developed had little to export their many wants combined with their restless activity and other conditions that favoured maritime enterprise led her people abroad and they there found lands more pleasant and richer than their own their needs and genius made them merchants and colonists then manufacturers and producers and between products and colonies shipping is the inevitable link so their sea power grew but if england was drawn to the sea holland was driven to it without the sea england languished but holland died in the height of her greatness when she was one of the chief factors in european politics a competent native authority estimated that the soil of holland could not support more than one-eighth of her inhabitants the manufactures of the country were then numerous and important but they had been much later in their growth than the shipping interest the poverty of the soil and the exposed nature of the coast drove the dutch first to fishing then the discovery of the process of curing the fish gave them material for export as well as home consumption and so laid the cornerstone of their wealth thus they had become traders at the time that the italian republics under the pressure of turkish power and the discovery of the passage round the cape of good hope were beginning to decline and they fell heirs to the great italian trade of the levant further favoured by their geographical position intermediate between the baltic france and the mediterranean and at the mouth of the german rivers they quickly absorbed nearly all the carrying trade of europe the wheat and naval stores of the baltic the trade of spain with her colonies in the new world the wines of france and the french coasting trade were little more than two hundred years ago transported in dutch shipping 
much of the carrying trade of england even was then done in dutch bottoms it will not be pretended that all this prosperity proceeded only from the poverty of holland's natural resources something does not grow from nothing what is true is that by the necessitous condition of her people they were driven to the sea and were from their mastery of the shipping business and the size of their fleets in a position to profit by the sudden expansion of commerce and the spirit of exploration which followed on the discovery of america and of the passage round the cape other causes concurred but their whole prosperity stood on the sea power to which their poverty gave birth their food their clothing the raw material for their manufactures the very timber and hemp with which they built and rigged their ships and they built nearly as many as all europe besides were imported and when a disastrous war with england in sixteen fifty three and sixteen fifty four had lasted eighteen months and their shipping business was stopped it is said the sources of revenue which had always maintained the riches of the state such as fisheries and commerce were almost dry workshops were closed work was suspended the zuyder zee became a forest of masts the country was full of beggars grass grew in the streets and in amsterdam fifteen hundred houses were untenanted a humiliating peace alone saved them from ruin this sorrowful result shows the weakness of a country depending wholly upon sources external to itself for the part it is playing in the world with large deductions owing to differences of conditions which need not here be spoken of the case of holland then has strong points of resemblance to that of great britain now and they are true prophets though they seem to be having small honour in their own country who warn her that the continuance of her prosperity at home depends primarily upon maintaining her power abroad men may be discontented at the lack of political privilege they will be yet more uneasy if they come to lack bread it is of more interest to americans to note that the result to france regarded as a power of the sea caused by the extent delightfulness and richness of the land has been reproduced in the united states in the beginning their forefathers held a narrow strip of land upon the sea fertile in parts though little developed abounding in harbors and near rich fishing grounds these physical conditions combined with an inborn love of the sea the pulse of that english blood which still beat in their veins to keep alive all those tendencies and pursuits upon which a healthy sea power depends almost every one of the original colonies was on the sea or on one of its great tributaries all export and import tended toward one coast interest in the sea and an intelligent appreciation of the part it played in the public welfare were easily and widely spread and a motive more influential than care for the public interest was also active for the abundance of shipbuilding materials and a relative fewness of other investments made shipping a profitable private interest how changed the present condition is all know the centre of power is no longer on the seaboard books and newspapers vie with one another in describing the wonderful growth and the still undeveloped riches of the interior capital there finds its best investments labour its largest opportunities the frontiers are neglected and politically weak the gulf and pacific coasts actually so the atlantic coast relatively to the central mississippi valley when the day comes that shipping again pays when the three sea frontiers find that they are not only militarily weak but poorer for lack of national shipping their united efforts may avail to lay again the foundations of our sea power till then those who follow the limitations which lack of sea power placed upon the career of france may mourn that their own country is being led by a like redundancy of home wealth into the same neglect of that great instrument among modifying physical conditions may be noted a form like that of italy a long peninsula with a central range of mountains dividing it into two narrow strips along which the roads connecting the different ports necessarily run 
only an absolute control of the sea can wholly secure such communications since it is impossible to know at what point an enemy coming from beyond the visible horizon may strike but still with an adequate naval force centrally posted there will be good hope of attacking his fleet which is at once his base and line of communications before serious damage has been done the long narrow peninsula of florida with key west at its extremity though flat and thinly populated presents at first sight conditions like those of italy the resemblance may be only superficial but it seems probable that if the chief scene of a naval war were the gulf of mexico the communications by land to the end of the peninsula might be a matter of consequence and open to attack when the sea not only borders or surrounds but also separates a country into two or more parts the control of it becomes not only desirable but vitally necessary such a physical condition either gives birth and strength to sea power or makes the country powerless such is the condition of the present kingdom of italy with its islands of sardinia and sicily and hence in its youth and still existing financial weakness it is seen to put forth such vigorous and intelligent efforts to create a military navy it has even been argued that with a navy decidedly superior to her enemies italy could better base her power upon her islands than upon her mainland for the insecurity of the lines of communication in the peninsula already pointed out would most seriously embarrass an invading army surrounded by a hostile people and threatened from the sea the irish sea separating the british islands rather resembles an estuary than an actual division but history has shown the danger from it to the united kingdom in the days of louis the fourteenth when the french navy nearly equalled the combined english and dutch the gravest complications existed in ireland which passed almost wholly under the control of the natives and the french nevertheless the irish sea was rather a danger to the english a weak point in their communications than an advantage to the french the latter did not venture their ships of the line in its narrow waters and expeditions intending to land were directed upon the ocean ports in the south and west at the supreme moment the great french fleet was sent upon the south coast of england where it decisively defeated the allies and at the same time twenty-five frigates were sent to st george's channel against the english communications in the midst of a hostile people the english army in ireland was seriously imperilled but was saved by the battle of the boyne and the flight of james the second this movement against the enemy's communications was strictly strategic and would be just as dangerous to england now as in sixteen ninety spain in the same century afforded an impressive lesson of the weakness caused by such separation when the parts are not knit together by a strong sea power she then still retained as remnants of her past greatness the netherlands now belgium sicily and other italian possessions not to speak of her vast colonies in the new world yet so low had the spanish sea-power fallen that a well-informed and sober-minded hollander of the day could claim that in spain all the coast is navigated by a few dutch ships and since the peace of sixteen forty eight their ships and seamen are so few that they have publicly begun to hire our ships to sail to the indies whereas they were formerly careful to exclude all foreigners from there it is manifest he goes on that the west indies being as the stomach to spain for from it nearly all the revenue is drawn must be joined to the spanish head by a sea force and that naples and the netherlands being like two arms they cannot lay out their strength for spain nor receive anything thence but by shipping all which may easily be done by our shipping in peace and by it obstructed in war half a century before sully the great minister of henry the fourth had characterized spain as one of those states whose legs and arms are strong and powerful but the heart infinitely weak and feeble since his day the spanish navy has suffered not only disaster but annihilation not only humiliation but degradation the consequences briefly were that shipping was destroyed manufactures perished with it 
the government depended for its support not upon a widespread healthy commerce and industry that could survive many a staggering blow but upon a narrow stream of silver trickling through a few treasure ships from america easily and frequently intercepted by an enemy's cruisers the loss of half a dozen galleons more than once paralyzed its movements for a year while the war in the netherlands lasted the dutch control of the sea forced spain to send her troops by a long and costly journey overland instead of by sea and the same cause reduced her to such straits for necessaries that by a mutual arrangement which seems very odd to modern ideas her wants were supplied by dutch ships which thus maintained the enemies of their country but received in return specie which was welcome in the amsterdam exchange in america the spanish protected themselves as best they might behind masonry unaided from home while in the mediterranean they escaped insult and injury mainly through the indifference of the dutch for the french and english had not yet begun to contend for mastery there in the course of history the netherlands naples sicily minorca havana manila and jamaica were wrenched away at one time or another from this empire without a shipping in short while spain's maritime impotence may have been primarily a symptom of her general decay it became a marked factor in precipitating her into the abyss from which she has not yet wholly emerged except alaska the united states has no outlying possession no foot of ground inaccessible by land its contour is such as to present few points specially weak from their saliency and all important parts of the frontiers can be readily attained cheaply by water rapidly by rail the weakest frontier the pacific is far removed from the most dangerous of possible enemies the internal resources are boundless as compared with present needs we can live off ourselves indefinitely in our little corner to use the expression of a french officer to the author yet should that little corner be invaded by a new commercial route through the isthmus the united states in her turn may have the rude awakening of those who have abandoned their share in the common birthright of all people the sea End of chapter 1, part 1chapter one part two of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty five by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain three extent of territory the last of the conditions affecting the development of a nation as a sea power and touching the country itself as distinguished from the people who dwell there is extent of territory this may be dismissed with comparatively few words as regards the development of sea power it is not the total number of square miles which a country contains but the length of its coastline and the character of its harbours that are to be considered as to these it is to be said that the geographical and physical conditions being the same extent of sea-coast is a source of strength or weakness according as the population is large or small a country is in this like a fortress the garrison must be proportioned to the enceinte a recent familiar instance is found in the american war of secession had the south had a people as numerous as it was warlike and a navy commensurate to its other resources as a sea-power the great extent of its sea-coast and its numerous inlets would have been elements of great strength the people of the united states and the government of that day justly prided themselves on the effectiveness of the blockade of the whole southern coast it was a great feat a very great feat but it would have been an impossible feat had the southerners been more numerous and a nation of seamen what was there 
shown was not as has been said how such a blockade can be maintained but that such a blockade is possible in the face of a population not only unused to the sea but also scanty in numbers those who recall how the blockade was maintained and the class of ships that blockaded during great part of the war know that the plan correct under the circumstances could not have been carried out in the face of a real navy scattered unsupported along the coast the united states ships kept their places singly or in small detachments in face of an extensive network of inland water communications which favored secret concentration of the enemy behind the first line of water communications were long estuaries and here and there strong fortresses upon either of which the enemy's ships could always fall back to elude pursuit or to receive protection had there been a southern navy to profit by such advantages or by the scattered condition of the united states ships the latter could not have been distributed as they were and being forced to concentrate for mutual support many small but useful approaches would have been left open to commerce but as the southern coast from its extent and many inlets might have been a source of strength so from those very characteristics it became a fruitful source of injury the great story of the opening of the mississippi is but the most striking illustration of an action that was going on incessantly all over the south at every breach of the sea frontier warships were entering the streams that had carried the wealth and supported the trade of the seceding states turned against them and admitted their enemies to their hearts dismay insecurity paralysis prevailed in regions that might under happier auspices have kept a nation alive through the most exhausting war never did sea power play a greater or a more decisive part than in the contest which determined that the course of the world's history would be modified by the existence of one great nation instead of several rival states in the north american continent but while just pride is felt in the well-earned glory of those days and the greatness of the results due to naval preponderance is admitted americans who understand the facts should never fail to remind the overconfidence of their countrymen that the south not only had no navy not only was not a seafaring people but that also its population was not proportioned to the extent of the sea coast which it had to defend four number of population after the consideration of the natural conditions of a country should follow an examination of the characteristics of its population as affecting the development of sea power and first among these will be taken because of its relations to the extent of the territory which has just been discussed the number of the people who live in it it has been said that in respect of dimensions it is not merely the number of square miles but the extent and character of the sea coast that is to be considered with reference to sea power and so in point of population it is not only the grand total but the number following the sea or at least readily available for employment on shipboard and for the creation of naval material that must be counted for example formerly and up to the end of the great wars following the french revolution the population of france was much greater than that of england but in respect of sea power in general peaceful commerce as well as military efficiency france was much inferior to england in the matter of military efficiency this fact is the more remarkable because at times in point of military preparation at the outbreak of war france had the advantage but she was not able to keep it thus in seventeen seventy eight when war broke out france through her maritime inscription was able to man at once fifty ships of the line england on the contrary by reason of the dispersal over the globe of that very shipping on which her naval strength so securely rested had much trouble in manning forty at home 
but in 1782 she had 120 in commission or ready for commission, while France had never been able to exceed 71. Again, as late as 1840, when the two nations were on the verge of war in the Levant, a most accomplished French officer of the day, while extolling the high state of efficiency of the French fleet and the eminent qualities of its admiral, and expressing confidence in the results of an encounter with an equal enemy goes on to say behind the squadron of twenty-one ships of the line which we could then assemble there was no reserve not another ship could have been commissioned within six months and this was due not only to lack of ships and of proper equipments though both were wanting our maritime inscription he continues was so exhausted by what we had done in manning twenty-one ships that the permanent levy established in all quarters did not supply reliefs for the men who were already more than three years on cruise a contrast such as this shows a difference in what is called staying power or reserve force which is even greater than appears on the surface for a great shipping afloat necessarily employs besides the crews a large number of people engaged in the various handicrafts which facilitate the making and repairing of naval material or following other callings more or less closely connected with the water and with craft of all kinds such kindred callings give an undoubted aptitude for the sea from the outset there is an anecdote showing curious insight into this matter on the part of one of england's distinguished seamen sir edward pellew when the war broke out in seventeen ninety three the usual scarceness of seamen was met eager to get to sea and unable to fill his complement otherwise than with landsmen he instructed his officers to seek for cornish miners reasoning from the conditions and dangers of their calling of which he had personal knowledge that they would quickly fit into the demands of sea life the result showed his sagacity for thus escaping an otherwise unavoidable delay he was fortunate enough to capture the first frigate taken in the war in single combat and what is especially instructive is that although but a few weeks in commission while his opponent had been over a year the losses heavy on both sides were nearly equal it may be urged that such reserve strength has now nearly lost the importance it once had because modern ships and weapons take so long to make and because modern states aim at developing the whole power of their armed force on the outbreak of war with such rapidity as to strike a disabling blow before the enemy can organize an equal effort to use a familiar phrase there will not be time for the whole resistance of the national fabric to come into play the blow will fall on the organized military fleet and if that yield the solidity of the rest of the structure will avail nothing to a certain extent this is true but then it has always been true though to a less extent formerly than now granted the meeting of two fleets which represent practically the whole present strength of their two nations if one of them be destroyed while the other remains fit for action there will be much less hope now than formerly that the vanquished can restore his navy for that war and the result will be disastrous just in proportion to the dependence of the nation upon her sea power a trafalgar would have been a much more fatal blow to england than it was to france had the english fleet then represented as the allied fleet did the bulk of the nation's power trafalgar in such a case would have been to england what austerlitz was to austria and jena to prussia an empire would have been laid prostrate by the destruction or disorganization of its military forces which it is said were the favorite objection of napoleon but does the consideration of such exceptional disasters in the past justify the putting a low value upon that reserve strength based upon the number of inhabitants fitted for a certain kind of military life which is here being considered the blows just mentioned were dealt by men of exceptional genius 
at the head of armed bodies of exceptional training esprit de corps and prestige and were besides inflicted upon opponents more or less demoralized by conscious inferiority and previous defeat austerlitz had been closely preceded by alm where thirty thousand austrians laid down their arms without a battle and the history of the previous years had been one long record of austrian reverse and french success trafalgar followed closely upon a cruise justly called a campaign of almost constant failure and farther back but still recent were the memories of st vincent for the spaniards and of the nile for the french in the allied fleet except the case of jena these crushing overthrows were not single disasters but final blows and in the jena campaign there was a disparity in numbers equipment and general preparation for war which makes it less applicable in considering what may result from a single victory england is at the present time the greatest maritime nation in the world in steam and iron she has kept the superiority she had in the days of sail and wood france and england are the two powers that have the largest military navies and it is so far an open question which of the two is the more powerful that they may be regarded as practically of equal strength in material for a sea war in the case of a collision can there be assumed such a difference of personnel or of preparation as to make it probable that a decisive inequality will result from one battle or one campaign if not the reserve strength will begin to tell organized reserve first then reserve of seafaring population reserve of mechanical skill reserve of wealth it seems to have been somewhat forgotten that england's leadership in mechanical arts gives her a reserve of mechanics who can easily familiarize themselves with the appliances of modern ironclads and as her commerce and industries feel the burden of the war the surplus of seamen and mechanics will go to the armed shipping the whole question of the value of a reserve developed or undeveloped amounts now to this have modern conditions of warfare made it probable that of two nearly equal adversaries one will be so prostrated in a single campaign that a decisive result will be reached in that time sea warfare has given no answer the crushing successes of prussia against austria and of germany against france appear to have been those of a stronger over a much weaker nation whether the weakness were due to natural causes or to official incompetency how would a delay like that of plevna have affected the fortune of war had turkey had any reserve of national power upon which to call if time be as is everywhere admitted a supreme factor in war it behooves countries whose genius is essentially not military whose people like all free people object to pay for large military establishments to see to it that they are at least strong enough to gain the time necessary to turn the spirit and capacity of their subjects into the new activities which war calls for if the existing force by land or sea is strong enough so to hold out even though at a disadvantage the country may rely upon its natural resources and strength coming into play for whatever they are worth its numbers its wealth its capacities of every kind if on the other hand what force it has can be overthrown and crushed quickly the most magnificent possibilities of natural power will not save it from humiliating conditions nor if its foe be wise from guarantees which will postpone revenge to a distant future the story is constantly repeated on the smaller fields of war if so and so can hold out a little longer this can be saved or that can be done as in sickness it is often said if the patient can only hold out so long the strength of his constitution may pull him through england to some extent is now such a country holland was such a country she would not pay and if she escaped it was but by the skin of her teeth 
never in time of peace and from fear of a rupture wrote their great statesman de witt will they take resolutions strong enough to lead them to pecuniary sacrifices beforehand the character of the dutch is such that unless danger stares them in the face they are indisposed to lay out money for their own defence i have to do with the people who liberal to profusion where they ought to economize are often sparing to avarice where they ought to spend that our own country is open to the same reproach is patent to all the world the united states has not that shield of defensive power behind which time can be gained to develop its reserve of strength as for a seafaring population adequate to her possible needs where is it such a resource proportionate to her coastline and population is to be found only in a national merchant shipping and its related industries which at present scarcely exist it will matter little whether the crews of such ships are native or foreign-born provided they are attached to the flag and her power at sea is sufficient to enable the most of them to get back in case of war when foreigners by thousands are admitted to the ballot it is of little moment that they are given fighting room on board ship though the treatment of the subject has been somewhat discursive it may be admitted that a great population following callings related to the sea is now as formerly a great element of sea power that the united states is deficient in that element and that its foundations can be laid only in a large commerce under her own flag five national character the effect of national character and aptitudes upon the development of sea power will next be considered if sea power be really based upon a peaceful and extensive commerce aptitude for commercial pursuits must be a distinguishing feature of the nations that have at one time or another been great upon the sea history almost without exception affirms that this is true save the romans there is no marked instance to the contrary all men seek gain and more or less love money but the way in which gain is sought will have a marked effect upon the commercial fortunes and the history of the people inhabiting a country if history may be believed the way in which the spaniards and their kindred nation the portuguese sought wealth not only brought a blot upon the national character but was also fatal to the growth of a healthy commerce and so to the industries upon which commerce lives and ultimately to that national wealth which was sought by mistaken paths the desire for gain rose in them to fierce avarice so they sought in the new-found worlds which gave such an impetus to the commercial and maritime development of the countries of europe not new fields of industry not even the healthy excitement of exploration and adventure but gold and silver they had many great qualities they were bold enterprising temperate patient of suffering enthusiastic and gifted with intense national feeling when to these qualities were, are added the advantages of spain's position and well-situated ports the fact that she was first to occupy large and rich portions of the new worlds and long remained without a competitor and that for a hundred years after the discovery of america she was the leading state in europe she might have been expected to take the foremost place among the sea powers exactly the contrary was the result as all know since the battle of lepanto in fifteen seventy one though engaged in many wars no sea victory of any consequence shines on the pages of spanish history and the decay of her commerce sufficiently accounts for the painful and sometimes ludicrous inaptness shown on the decks of her ships of war 
doubtless such a result is not to be attributed to one cause only doubtless the government of spain was in many ways such as to cramp and blight a free and healthy development of private enterprise but the character of a great people breaks through or shapes the character of its government and it can hardly be doubted that had the bent of the people been toward trade the action of government would have been drawn into the same current the great field of the colonies also was remote from the centre of that despotism which blighted the growth of old spain as it was thousands of spaniards of the working as well as the upper classes left spain and the occupations in which they engaged abroad sent home little but specie or merchandise of small bulk requiring but small tonnage the mother country herself produced little but wool fruit and iron her manufactures were not her industries suffered her population steadily decreased both she and her colonies depended upon the dutch for so many of the necessaries of life that the products of their scanty industries could not suffice to pay for them so that holland merchants writes a contemporary who carry money to most parts of the world to buy commodities must out of this single country of europe carry home money which they receive in payment of their goods thus their eagerly sought emblem of wealth passed quickly from their hands it has already been pointed out how weak from a military point of view spain was from this decay of her shipping her wealth being in small bulk on a few ships following more or less regular routes was easily seized by an enemy and the sinews of war paralyzed whereas the wealth of england and holland scattered over thousands of ships in all parts of the world received many bitter blows in many exhausting wars without checking a growth which though painful was steady the fortunes of portugal united to spain during a most critical period of her history followed the same downward path although foremost in the beginning of the race for development by sea she fell utterly behind the mines of brazil were the ruin of portugal as those of mexico and peru had been of spain all manufactures fell into insane contempt ere long the english supplied the portuguese not only with clothes but with all merchandise all commodities even to salt fish and grain after their gold the portuguese abandoned their very soil the vineyards of oporto were finally bought by the english with brazilian gold which had only passed through portugal to be spread throughout england we are assured that in fifty years five hundred millions of dollars were extracted from the mines of brazil and that at the end of the time portugal had but twenty-five millions in specie a striking example of the difference between real and fictitious wealth the english and dutch were no less desirous of gain than the southern nations each in turn has been called a nation of shopkeepers but the jeer in so far as it is just is to the credit of their wisdom and uprightness they were no less bold no less enterprising no less patient indeed they were more patient in that they sought riches not by the sword but by labour which is the reproach meant to be implied by the epithet for thus they took the longest instead of what seemed the shortest road to wealth but these two peoples radically of the same race had other qualities no less important than those just named which combined with their surroundings to favour their development by sea they were by nature business men traders producers negotiators therefore both in their native country and abroad whether settled in the ports of civilized nations or of barbarous eastern rulers or in colonies of their own foundation they everywhere strove to draw out all the resources of the land to develop and increase them the quick instinct of the born trader shopkeeper if you will sought continually new articles to exchange and this search combined with the industrious character evolved through generations of labour made them necessarily producers 
at home they became great as manufacturers abroad where they controlled the land grew richer continually products multiplied and the necessary exchange between home and the settlements called for more ships their shipping therefore increased with these demands of trade and nations with less aptitude for maritime enterprise even france herself great as she has been called for their products and for the service of their ships thus in many ways they advance to power at sea this natural tendency and growth were indeed modified and seriously checked at times by the interference of other governments jealous of a prosperity which their own people could invade only by the aid of artificial support a support which will be considered under the head of governmental action as affecting sea power the tendency to trade involving of necessity the production of something to trade with is the national characteristic most important to the development of sea power granting it and a good seaboard it is not likely that the dangers of the sea or any aversion to it will deter a people from seeking wealth by the paths of ocean commerce where wealth is sought by other means it may be found but it will not necessarily lead to sea power take france france has a fine country an industrious people an admirable position the french navy has known periods of great glory and in its lowest estate has never dishonoured the military reputation so dear to the nation yet as a maritime state securely resting upon a broad basis of sea commerce france as compared with other historical sea peoples has never held more than a respectable position the chief reason for this so far as national character goes is the way in which wealth is sought as spain and portugal sought it by digging gold out of the ground the temper of the french people leads them to seek it by thrift economy hoarding it is said to be harder to keep than to make a fortune possibly but the adventurous temper which risks what it has to gain more has much in common with the adventurous spirit that conquers worlds for commerce the tendency to save and put aside to venture timidly and on a small scale may lead to a general diffusion of wealth on a like small scale but not to the risks and development of external trade and shipping interests to illustrate and the incident is given only for what it is worth a french officer speaking to the author about the panama canal said i have two shares in it in france we don't do as you where a few people take a great many shares each with us a large number of people take one share or a very few when these were in the market my wife said to me you take two shares one for you and one for me as regards the stability of a man's personal fortunes this kind of prudence is doubtless wise but when excessive prudence or financial timidity becomes a national trait it must tend to hamper the expansion of commerce and of the nation's shipping the same caution in money matters appearing in another relation of life has checked the production of children and keeps the population of france nearly stationary the noble classes of europe inherited from the middle ages a supercilious contempt for peaceful trade which has exercised a modifying influence upon its growth according to the national character of different countries the pride of the spaniards fell easily in with this spirit of contempt and cooperated with that disastrous unwillingness to work and wait for wealth which turned them away from commerce in france the vanity which is conceded even by frenchmen to be a national trait led in the same direction the numbers and brilliancy of the nobility and the consideration enjoyed by them set a seal of inferiority upon an occupation which they despised rich merchants and manufacturers sighed for the honours of nobility and upon obtaining them abandoned their lucrative professions therefore while the industry of the people and the fruitfulness of the soil saved commerce from total decay it was pursued under a sense of humiliation which caused its best representatives to escape from it as soon as they could 
Louis the fourteenth, under the influence of Colbert, put forth an ordinance authorizing all noblemen to take an interest in merchant ships, goods, and merchandise, without being considered as having derogated from nobility, provided they did not sell at retail and the reason given for this action was that it imports the good of our subjects and our own satisfaction to efface the relic of a public opinion universally prevalent that maritime commerce is incompatible with nobility but a prejudice involving conscious and open superiority is not readily effaced by ordinances especially when vanity is a conspicuous trait in national character and many years later montesquieu taught that it is contrary to the spirit of monarchy that the nobility should engage in trade in holland there was a nobility but the state was republican in name allowed large scope to personal freedom and enterprise and the centres of power were in the great cities the foundation of the national greatness was money or rather wealth wealth as a source of civic distinction carried with it also power in the state and with power there went social position and consideration in england the same result obtained the nobility were proud but in a representative government the power of wealth could be neither put down nor overshadowed it was patent to the eyes of all it was honoured by all and in england as well as holland the occupations which were the source of wealth shared in the honour given to wealth itself thus in all the countries named social sentiment the outcome of national characteristics had a marked influence upon the national attitude toward trade in yet another way does the national genius affect the growth of sea power in its broadest sense and that is in so far as it possesses the capacity for planting healthy colonies of colonization as of all other growths it is true that it is most healthy when it is most natural therefore colonies that spring from the felt wants and natural impulses of a whole people will have the most solid foundations and their subsequent growth will be surest when they are least trammelled from home if the people have the genius for independent action men of the past three centuries have keenly felt the value to the mother country of colonies as outlets for the home products and as a nursery for commerce and shipping but efforts at colonization have not had the same general origin nor have different systems all had the same success the efforts of statesmen however far-seeing and careful have not been able to supply the lack of strong natural impulse nor can the most minute regulation from home produce as good results as a happier neglect when the germ of self-development is found in the national character there has been no greater display of wisdom in the national administration of successful colonies than in that of unsuccessful perhaps there has been even less if elaborate system and supervision careful adaptation of means to ends diligent nursing could avail for colonial growth the genius of england has less of this systematizing faculty than the genius of france but england not france has been the great colonizer of the world successful colonization with its consequent effect upon commerce and sea power depends essentially upon national character because colonies grow best when they grow of themselves naturally the character of the colonist not the care of the home government is the principle of the colony's growth this truth stands out the clearer because the general attitude of all the home governments toward their colonies was entirely selfish however founded as soon as it was recognized to be of consequence the colony became to the home country a cow to be milked to be cared for of course but chiefly as a piece of property valued for the returns it gave 
legislation was directed toward a monopoly of its external trade the places in its government afforded posts of value for occupants from the mother country and the colony was looked upon as the sea still so often is as a fit place for those who were ungovernable or useless at home the military administration however so long as it remains a colony is the proper and necessary attribute of the home government the fact of england's unique and wonderful success as a great colonizing nation is too evident to be dwelt upon and the reason for it appears to lie chiefly in two traits of the national character the english colonist naturally and readily settles down in his new country identifies his interests with it and though keeping an affectionate remembrance of the home from which he came has no restless eagerness to return in the second place the englishman at once and instinctively seeks to develop the resources of the new country in the broadest sense in the former particular he differs from the french who were ever longingly looking back to the delights of their pleasant land in the latter from the spaniards whose range of interest and ambition was too narrow for the full evolution of the possibilities of a new country the character and the necessities of the dutch led them naturally to plant colonies and by the year sixteen fifty they had in the east indies in africa and in america a large number only to name which would be tedious they were then far ahead of england in this matter but though the origin of these colonies purely commercial in its character was natural there seems to have been lacking to them a principle of growth in planting them they never sought an extension of empire but merely an acquisition of trade and commerce they attempted conquest only when forced by the pressure of circumstances generally they were content to trade under the protection of the sovereign of the country this placid satisfaction with gain alone unaccompanied by political ambition tended like the despotism of france and spain to keep the colonies mere commercial dependencies upon the mother country and so kill the natural principle of growth before quitting this head of the inquiry it is well to ask how far the national character of americans is fitted to develop a great sea power should other circumstances become favourable it seems scarcely necessary however to do more than appeal to a not very distant past to prove that if legislative hindrances be removed and more remunerative fields of enterprise filled up the sea-power will not long delay its appearance the instinct for commerce bold enterprise in the pursuit of gain and a keen scent for the trails that lead to it all exist and if there be in the future any fields calling for colonization it cannot be doubted that americans will carry to them all their inherited aptitude for self-government and independent growth End of chapter one part two chapter one part three of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain six character of the government in discussing the effects upon the development of a nation's sea power exerted by its government and institutions it will be necessary to avoid a tendency to over philosophizing to confine attention to obvious and immediate causes and their plain results without prying too far beneath the surface for remote and ultimate influences nevertheless it must be noted that particular forms of government with their accompanying institutions and the character of rulers at one time or another have exercised a very marked influence upon the development of sea power the various traits of a country and its people which have so far been considered constitute the natural characteristics with which a nation like a man begins its career 
the conduct of the government in turn corresponds to the exercise of the intelligent will-power which according as it is wise energetic and persevering or the reverse causes success or failure in a man's life or a nation's history it would seem probable that a government in full accord with the natural bias of its people would most successfully advance its growth in every respect and in the matter of sea power the most brilliant successes have followed where there has been intelligent direction by a government fully imbued with the spirit of the people and conscious of its true general bent such a government is most certainly secured when the will of the people or of their best natural exponents has some large share in making it but such free governments have sometimes fallen short while on the other hand despotic power wielded with judgment and consistency has created at times a great sea commerce and a brilliant navy with greater directness than can be reached by the slower processes of a free people the difficulty in the latter case is to ensure perseverance after the death of a particular despot england having undoubtedly reached the greatest height of sea power of any modern nation the action of her government first claims attention in general direction this action has been consistent though often far from praiseworthy it has aimed steadily at the control of the sea one of its most arrogant expressions dates back as far as the reign of james i when she had scarce any possessions outside her own islands before virginia or massachusetts was settled here is richelieu's account of it the duke of sully minister of henry the fourth one of the most chivalrous princes that ever lived having embarked at calais in a french ship wearing the french flag at the main was no sooner in the channel than meeting an english dispatch boat which was there to receive him the commander of the latter ordered the french ship to lower her flag the duke considering that his quality freed him from such an affront boldly refused but this refusal was followed by three cannon shot which piercing his ship pierced the heart likewise of all good frenchmen might forced him to yield what right forbade and for all the complaints he made he could get no better reply from the english captain than this that just as his duty obliged him to honour the ambassador's rank it also obliged him to exact the honour due to the flag of his master as sovereign of the sea if the words of king james himself were more polite they nevertheless had no other effect than to compel the duke to take counsel of his prudence feigning to be satisfied while his wound was all the time smarting and incurable henry the great had to practise moderation on this occasion but with the resolve another time to sustain the rights of his crown by the force that with the aid of time he should be able to put upon the sea this act of unpardonable insolence according to modern ideas was not so much out of accord with the spirit of nations in that day it is chiefly noteworthy as the most striking as well as one of the earliest indications of the purpose of england to assert herself at all risks upon the sea and the insult was offered under one of her most timid kings to an ambassador immediately representing the bravest and ablest of french sovereigns this empty honour of the flag a claim insignificant except as the outward manifestation of the purpose of a government was as rigidly exacted under cromwell as under the king's it was one of the conditions of peace yielded by the dutch after their disastrous war of sixteen fifty four cromwell a despot in everything but name was keenly alive to all that concerned england's honour and strength and did not stop at barren salutes to promote them hardly yet possessed of power the english navy sprang rapidly into a new life and vigour under his stern rule england's rights or reparation for her wrongs were demanded by her fleets throughout the world in the baltic in the mediterranean against the barbary states in the west indies 
and under him the conquest of jamaica began that extension of her empire by force of arms which has gone on to our own days nor were equally strong peaceful measures for the growth of english trade and shipping forgotten cromwell's celebrated navigation act declared that all imports into england or her colonies must be conveyed exclusively in vessels belonging to england herself or to the country in which the products carried were grown or manufactured this decree aimed specially at the dutch the common carriers of europe was resented throughout the commercial world but the benefit to england in those days of national strife and animosity was so apparent that it lasted long under the monarchy a century and a quarter later we find nelson before his famous career had begun showing his zeal for the welfare of england's shipping by enforcing this same act in the west indies against american merchant ships when cromwell was dead and charles the second sat on the throne of his father this king false to the english people was yet true to england's greatness and to the traditional policy of her government on the sea in his treacherous intrigues with louis the fourteenth by which he aimed to make himself independent of parliament and people he wrote to louis there are two impediments to a perfect union the first is the great care france is now taking to create a commerce and to be an imposing maritime power this is so great a cause of suspicion with us who can possess importance only by our commerce and our naval force that every step which france takes in this direction will perpetuate the jealousy between the two nations in the midst of the negotiations which preceded the detestable attack of the two kings upon the dutch republic a warm dispute arose as to who should command the united fleets of france and england charles was inflexible on this point it is the custom of the english said he to command at sea and he told the french ambassador plainly that were he to yield his subjects would not obey him in the projected partition of the united provinces he reserved for england the maritime plunder in positions that control the mouths of the rivers scheldt and meuse the navy under charles preserved for some time the spirit and discipline impressed on it by cromwell's iron rule though later it shared in the general decay of morale which marked this evil reign monk having by a great strategic blunder sent off a fourth of his fleet found himself in sixteen sixty six in presence of a greatly superior dutch force disregarding the odds he attacked without hesitation and for three days maintained the fight with honour though with loss such conduct is not war but in the single eye that looked to england's naval prestige and dictated his action common as it was to england's people as well as to her government has lain the secret of final success following many blunders through the centuries charles's successor james the second was himself a seaman and had commanded in two great sea fights when william the third came to the throne the governments of england and holland were under one hand and continued united in one purpose against louis the fourteenth until the peace of utrecht in seventeen thirteen that is for a quarter of a century the english government more and more steadily and with conscious purpose pushed on the extension of her sea dominion and fostered the growth of her sea power while as an open enemy she struck at france upon the sea so as an artful friend many at least believed she sat the power of holland afloat the treaty between the two countries provided that of the sea forces holland should furnish three-eighths england five-eighths or nearly double such a provision coupled with a further one which made holland keep up an army of one hundred and two thousand against england's forty thousand virtually threw the land war on one and the sea war on the other the tendency whether designed or not is evident and at the peace while holland received compensation by land england obtained besides commercial privileges in france spain and the spanish west indies 
the important maritime concessions of gibraltar and port mahan in the mediterranean of newfoundland nova scotia and hudson's bay in north america the naval power of france and spain had disappeared that of holland thenceforth steadily declined posted thus in america the west indies and the mediterranean the english government thenceforth moved firmly forward on the path which made of the english kingdom the british empire for the twenty-five years following the peace of utrecht peace was the chief aim of the ministers who directed the policy of the two great seaboard nations france and england but amid all the fluctuations of continental politics in a most unsettled period abounding in petty wars and shifty treaties the eye of england was steadily fixed on the maintenance of her sea power in the baltic her fleets checked the attempts of peter the great upon sweden and so maintained a balance of power in that sea from which she drew not only a great trade but the chief part of her naval stores and which the czar aimed to make a russian lake denmark endeavoured to establish an east india company aided by foreign capital england and holland not only forbade their subjects to join it but threatened denmark and thus stopped an enterprise they thought adverse to their sea interests in the netherlands which by the utrecht treaty had passed to austria a similar east india company having ostend for its port was formed with the emperor's sanction this step meant to restore to the low countries the trade lost to them through their natural outlet of the scheldt was opposed by the sea powers england and holland and their greediness for the monopoly of trade helped in this instance by france stifled this company also after a few years of struggling life in the mediterranean the utrecht settlement was disturbed by the emperor of austria england's natural ally in the then existing state of european politics backed by england he having already naples claimed also sicily in exchange for sardinia spain resisted and her navy just beginning to revive under a vigorous minister alberoni was crushed and annihilated by the english fleet off cape Passaro in seventeen eighteen while the following year a french army at the bidding of england crossed the pyrenees and completed the work by destroying the spanish dockyards thus england in addition to gibraltar and mahan in her own hands saw naples and sicily in those of a friend while an enemy was struck down in spanish america the limited privileges to english trade wrung from the necessities of spain were abused by an extensive and scarcely disguised smuggling system and when the exasperated spanish government gave way to excesses in the mode of suppression both the minister who counselled peace and the opposition which urged war defended their opinions by alleging the effects of either upon england's sea power and honour while england's policy thus steadily aimed at widening and strengthening the basis of her sway upon the ocean the other governments of europe seemed blind to the dangers to be feared from her sea growth the miseries resulting from the overweening power of spain in days long gone by seemed to be forgotten forgotten also the more recent lesson of the bloody and costly wars provoked by the ambition and exaggerated power of louis the fourteenth under the eyes of the statesmen of europe there was steadily and visibly being built up a third overwhelming power destined to be used as selfishly as aggressively though not as cruelly and much more successfully than any that had preceded it this was the power of the sea whose workings because more silent than the clash of arms are less often noted though lying clearly enough on the surface it can scarcely be denied that england's uncontrolled dominion of the seas during almost the whole period chosen for our subject was by long odds the chief among the military factors that determined the final issue so far however was this influence from being foreseen after utrecht 
that france for twelve years moved by personal exigencies of her rulers sided with england against spain and when fleury came into power in seventeen twenty six though this policy was reversed the navy of france received no attention and the only blow at england was the establishment of a bourbon prince a natural enemy to her upon the throne of the two sicilies in seventeen thirty six when war broke out with spain in seventeen thirty nine the navy of england was in numbers more than equal to the combined navies of spain and france and during the quarter of a century of nearly uninterrupted war that followed this numerical disproportion increased in these wars england at first instinctively afterward with conscious purpose under a government that recognized her opportunity and the possibilities of her great sea power rapidly built up that mighty colonial empire whose foundations were already securely laid in the characteristics of her colonists and the strength of her fleets in strictly european affairs her wealth the outcome of her sea power made her play a conspicuous part during the same period the system of subsidies which began half a century before in the wars of marlborough and received its most extensive development half a century later in the napoleonic wars maintained the efforts of her allies which would have been crippled if not paralyzed without them who can deny that the government which with one hand strengthened its fainting allies on the continent with the life-blood of money and with the other drove its own enemies off the sea and out of their chief possessions canada martinique guadeloupe havana manila gave to its country the foremost role in european politics and who can fail to see that the power which dwelt in that government with a land narrow in extent and poor in resources sprang directly from the sea the policy in which the english government carried on the war is shown by a speech of pitt the master spirit during its course though he lost office before bringing it to an end condemning the peace of seventeen sixty three made by his political opponent he said france is chiefly if not exclusively formidable to us as a maritime and commercial power what we gain in this respect is valuable to us above all through the injury to her which results from it you have left to france the possibility of reviving her navy yet england's gains were enormous her rule in india was assured and all north america east of the mississippi in her hands by this time the onward path of her government was clearly marked out had assumed the force of a tradition and was consistently followed the war of the american revolution was it is true a great mistake looked at from the point of view of sea power but the government was led into it insensibly by a series of natural blunders putting aside political and constitutional considerations and looking at the question as purely military or naval the case was this the american colonies were large and growing communities at a great distance from england so long as they remained attached to the mother country as they then were enthusiastically they formed a solid base for her sea power in that part of the world but their extent and population were too great when coupled with the distance from england to afford any hope of holding them by force if any powerful nations were willing to help them this if however involved a notorious probability the humiliation of france and spain was so bitter and so recent that they were sure to seek revenge and it was well known that france in particular had been carefully and rapidly building up her navy had the colonies been thirteen islands the sea-power of england would quickly have settled the question but instead of such a physical barrier they were separated only by local jealousies which a common danger sufficiently overcame to enter deliberately on such a contest to try to hold by force so extensive a territory with a large hostile population so far from home was to renew the seven years war with france and spain and with the americans against instead of for england 
the seven years war had been so heavy a burden that a wise government would have known that the added weight could not be borne and have seen it was necessary to conciliate the colonists the government of the day was not wise and a large element of england's sea power was sacrificed but by mistake not wilfully through arrogance not through weakness this steady keeping to a general line of policy was doubtless made specially easy for successive english governments by the clear indications of the country's conditions singleness of purpose was to some extent imposed the firm maintenance of her sea power the haughty determination to make it felt the wise state of preparation in which its military element was kept were yet more due to that feature of her political institutions which practically gave the government during the period in question into the hands of a class a landed aristocracy such a class whatever its defects otherwise readily takes up and carries on a sound political tradition is naturally proud of its country's glory and comparatively insensible to the sufferings of the community by which that glory is maintained it readily lays on the pecuniary burden necessary for preparation and for endurance of war being as a body rich it feels those burdens less not being commercial the sources of its own wealth are not so immediately endangered and it does not share that political timidity which characterizes those whose property is exposed and business threatened the proverbial timidity of capital yet in england this class was not insensible to anything that touched her trade for good or ill both houses of parliament vied in careful watchfulness over its extension and protection and to the frequency of their inquiries a naval historian attributes the increased efficiency of the executive power in its management of the navy such a class also naturally imbibes and keeps up a spirit of military honor which is of the first importance in ages when military institutions have not yet provided the sufficient substitute in what is called esprit de corps but although full of class feeling and class prejudice which made themselves felt in the navy as well as elsewhere their practical sense left open the way of promotion to its highest honors to the more humbly born and every age saw admirals who had sprung from the lowest of the people in this the temper of the english upper class differed markedly from that of the french as late as seventeen eighty nine at the outbreak of the revolution the french navy list still bore the name of an official whose duty was to verify the proofs of noble birth on the part of those intending to enter the naval school since eighteen fifteen and especially in our own day the government of england has passed very much more into the hands of the people at large whether her sea power will suffer therefrom remains to be seen its broad basis still remains in a great trade large mechanical industries and an extensive colonial system whether a democratic government will have the foresight the keen sensitiveness to national position and credit the willingness to ensure its prosperity by adequate outpouring of money in times of peace all which are necessary for military preparation is yet an open question popular governments are not generally favorable to military expenditure however necessary and there are signs that england tends to drop behind it has already been seen that the dutch republic even more than the english nation drew its prosperity and its very life from the sea the character and policy of its government were far less favorable to a consistent support of sea power composed of seven provinces with the political name of the united provinces the actual distribution of power may be roughly described to americans as an exaggerated example of states rights each of the maritime provinces had its own fleet and its own admiralty with consequent jealousies this disorganizing tendency was partly counteracted by the great preponderance of the province of holland which alone contributed five-sixths of the fleet and fifty-eight per cent of the taxes and consequently had a proportionate share in directing the national policy 
although intensely patriotic and capable of making the last sacrifices for freedom the commercial spirit of the people penetrated the government which indeed might be called a commercial aristocracy and made it averse to war and to the expenditures which are necessary in preparing for war as has before been said it was not until danger stared them in the face that the burgomasters were willing to pay for their defences while the republican government lasted however this economy was practised least of all upon the fleet and until the death of john de witt in sixteen seventy two and the peace with england in sixteen seventy four the dutch navy was in point of numbers and equipment able to make a fair show against the combined navies of england and france its efficiency at this time undoubtedly saved the country from the destruction planned by the two kings with de witt's death the republic passed away and was followed by the practically monarchical government of william of orange the lifelong policy of this prince then only eighteen was resistance to louis the fourteenth and to the extension of french power this resistance took shape upon the land rather than the sea a tendency promoted by england's withdrawal from the war as early as sixteen seventy six admiral de reuter found the force given him unequal to cope with the french alone with the eyes of the government fixed on the land frontier the navy rapidly declined in sixteen eighty eight when william of orange needed a fleet to convoy him to england the burgomasters of amsterdam objected that the navy was incalculably decreased in strength as well as deprived of its ablest commanders when king of england william still kept his position as stadtholder and with it his general european policy he found in england the sea power he needed and used the resources of holland for the land war this dutch prince consented that in the allied fleets and councils of war the dutch admiral should sit below the junior english captain and dutch interests at sea were sacrificed as readily as dutch pride to the demands of england when william died his policy was still followed by the government which succeeded him its aims were wholly centred upon the land and at the peace of utrecht which closed a series of wars extending over forty years holland having established no sea claim gained nothing in the way of sea resources of colonial extension or of commerce of the last of these wars an english historian says the economy of the dutch greatly hurt their reputation and their trade their men of war in the mediterranean were always victuals short and their convoys were so weak and ill provided that for one ship that we lost they lost five which begat a general notion that we were the safer carriers which certainly had a good effect hence it was that our trade rather increased than diminished in this war from that time holland ceased to have a great sea power and rapidly lost the leading position among the nations which that power had built up it is only just to say that no policy could have saved from decline this small though determined nation in face of the persistent enmity of louis the fourteenth the friendship of france ensuring peace on her landward frontier would have enabled her at least for a longer time to dispute with england the dominion of the seas and as allies the navies of the two continental states might have checked the growth of the enormous sea power which has just been considered sea peace between england and holland was only possible by the virtual subjection of one or the other for both aimed at the same object between france and holland it was otherwise and the fall of holland proceeded not necessarily from her inferior size and numbers but from faulty policy on the part of the two governments it does not concern us to decide which was the more to blame france admirably situated for the possession of sea-power received a definite policy for the guidance of her government from two great rulers henry the fourth and richelieu with certain well-defined projects of extension eastward upon the land were combined a steady resistance to the house of austria which then ruled in both austria and spain and an equal purpose of resistance to england upon the sea to further this latter end as well as for other reasons holland was to be courted as an ally commerce and fisheries as the basis of sea-power were to be encouraged and a military navy was to be built up richelieu left what he called his political will 
in which he pointed out the opportunities of france for achieving sea power based upon her position and resources and french writers consider him the virtual founder of the navy not merely because he equipped ships but from the breadth of his views and his measures to ensure sound institutions and steady growth after his death mazarin inherited his views and general policy but not his lofty and martial spirit and during his rule the newly formed navy disappeared when louis the fourteenth took the government into his own hands in sixteen sixty one there were but thirty ships of war of which only three had as many as sixty guns then began a most astonishing manifestation of the work which can be done by absolute government ably and systematically wielded that part of the administration which dealt with trade manufactures shipping and colonies was given to a man of great practical genius colbert who had served with richelieu and had drunk in fully his ideas and policy he pursued his aims in a spirit thoroughly french everything was to be organized the spring of everything was in the minister's cabinet to organize producers and merchants as a powerful army subjected to an active and intelligent guidance so as to secure an industrial victory over france by order and unity of efforts and to obtain the best products by imposing on all workmen the processes recognized as best by competent men to organize seamen and distant commerce in large bodies like the manufactures and internal commerce and to give as a support to the commercial power of france a navy established on a firm basis and of dimensions hitherto unknown such we are told were the aims of colbert as regards two of the three links in the chain of sea power for the third the colonies at the far end of the line the same governmental direction and organization were evidently proposed for the government began by buying back canada newfoundland nova scotia and the french west india islands from the parties who then owned them here then is seen pure absolute uncontrolled power gathering up into its hands all the reins for the guidance of a nation's course and proposing so to direct it as to make among other things a great sea power to enter into the details of colbert's action is beyond our purpose it is enough to note the chief part played by the government in building up the sea power of the state and that this very great man looked not to any one of the bases on which it rests to the exclusion of the others but embraced them all in his wise and provident administration agriculture which increases the products of the earth and manufactures which multiply the products of man's industry internal trade routes and regulations by which the exchange of products from the interior to the exterior is made easier shipping and customs regulations tending to throw the carrying trade into french hands and so to encourage the building of french shipping by which the home and colonial products should be carried back and forth colonial administration and development by which a far-off market might be continually growing up to be monopolized by the home trade treaties with foreign states favoring french trade and imposts on foreign ships and products tending to break down that of rival nations all these means embracing countless details were employed to build up for france one production two shipping three colonies and markets in a word sea power the study of such a work is simpler and easier when thus done by one man sketched out by a kind of logical process than when slowly wrought by conflicting interests in a more complex government in the few years of colbert's administration is seen the whole theory of sea power put into practice in the systematic centralizing french way while the illustration of the same theory in english and dutch history is spread over generations such growth however was forced and depended upon the endurance of the absolute power which watched over it and as colbert was not king his control lasted only till he lost the king's favor it is however most interesting to note the results of his labors in the proper field for governmental action in the navy it has been said that in sixteen sixty one when he took office 
there were but thirty armed ships of which three only had over sixty guns in sixteen sixty six there were seventy of which fifty were ships of the line and twenty were fire ships in sixteen seventy one from seventy the number had increased to one hundred and ninety six in sixteen eighty three there were one hundred and seven ships of from twenty four to one hundred and twenty guns twelve of which carried over seventy six guns besides many smaller vessels the order and system introduced into the dockyards made them vastly more efficient than the english an english captain a prisoner in france while the effect of colbert's work still lasted in the hands of his son writes when i was first brought prisoner thither i lay four months in a hospital at brest for care of my wounds while there i was astonished at the expedition used in manning and fitting out their ships which till then i thought could be done nowhere sooner than in england where we have ten times the shipping and consequently ten times the seamen they have in france but there i saw twenty sail of ships of about sixty guns each got ready in twenty days time they were brought in and the men were discharged and upon an order from paris they were careened keeled up rigged victualled manned and out again in the said time with the greatest ease imaginable i likewise saw a ship of one hundred guns that had all her guns taken out in four or five hours time which i never saw done in england in twenty-four hours and this was the greatest ease and less hazard than at home this i saw under my hospital window a french naval historian cites certain performances which are simply incredible such as that the keel of a galley was laid at four o'clock and that at nine she left port fully armed these traditions may be accepted as pointing with the more serious statements of the english officer to a remarkable degree of system and order and abundant facilities for work yet all this wonderful growth forced by the action of the government withered away like jonah's gourd when the government's favour was withdrawn time was not allowed for its roots to strike down deep into the life of the nation colbert's work was in the direct line of richelieu's policy and for a time it seemed there would continue the course of action which would make france great upon the sea as well as predominant upon the land for reasons which it is not yet necessary to give louis came to have feelings of bitter enmity against holland and as these feelings were shared by charles the second the two kings determined on the destruction of the united provinces this war which broke out in sixteen seventy two though more contrary to natural feeling on the part of england was less of a political mistake for her than for france and especially as regards sea power france was helping to destroy a probable and certainly an indispensable ally england was assisting in the ruin of her greatest rival on the sea at this time indeed still her commercial superior france staggering under debt and utter confusion in her finances when louis mounted the throne was just seeing her way clear in sixteen seventy two under colbert's reforms and their happy results the war lasting six years undid the greater part of his work the agricultural classes manufactures commerce and the colonies all were smitten by it the establishments of colbert languished and the order he had established in the finances was overthrown thus the action of louis and he alone was the directing government of france struck at the roots of her sea power and alienated her best sea ally the territory and the military power of france were increased but the springs of commerce and of a peaceful shipping had been exhausted in the process and although the military navy was for some years kept up with splendour and efficiency it soon began to dwindle and by the end of the reign had practically disappeared the same false policy as regards the sea marked the rest of this reign of fifty-four years louis steadily turned his back upon the sea interests of france except the fighting ships and either could not or would not see that the latter were of little use and uncertain life if the peaceful shipping and the industries by which they were supported perished his policy aiming at supreme power in europe by military strength and territorial extension forced england and holland into an alliance which as has before been said directly drove france off the sea and indirectly swamped holland's power thereon 
colbert's navy perished and for the last ten years of louis's life no great french fleet put to sea though there was constant war the simplicity of form in an absolute monarchy thus brought out strongly how great the influence of government can be upon both the growth and the decay of sea power End of chapter one part three chapter one part four of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain the latter part of louis's life thus witnessed that power failing by the weakening of its foundations of commerce and of the wealth that commerce brings the government that followed likewise absolute of set purpose and at the demand of england gave up all pretence of maintaining an effective navy the reason for this was that the new king was a minor and the regent being bitterly at enmity with the king of spain to injure him and preserve his own power entered into alliance with england he aided her to establish austria the hereditary enemy of france in naples and sicily to the detriment of spain and in union with her destroyed the spanish navy and dockyards here again is found a personal ruler disregarding the sea interests of france ruining a natural ally and directly aiding as louis the fourteenth indirectly and unintentionally aided the growth of a mistress of the seas this transient phase of policy passed away with the death of the regent in seventeen twenty six but from that time until seventeen sixty the government of france continued to disregard her maritime interests it is said indeed that owing to some wise modifications of her fiscal regulations mainly in the direction of free trade and due to law a minister of scotch birth commerce with the east and west indies wonderfully increased and that the islands of guadeloupe and martinique became very rich and thriving but both commerce and colonies lay at the mercy of england when war came for the navy fell into decay in seventeen fifty six when things were no longer at their worst france had but forty-five ships of the line england nearly one hundred and thirty and when the forty-five were to be armed and equipped there was found to be neither material nor rigging nor supplies not even enough artillery nor was this all lack of system in the government says a french writer brought about indifference and opened the door to disorder and lack of discipline never had unjust promotions been so frequent so also never had more universal discontent been seen money and intrigue took the place of all else and brought in their train commands and power nobles and upstarts with influence at the capital and self-sufficiency in the seaports thought themselves dispensed with merit waste of the revenues of the state and of the dockyards knew no bounds honour and modesty were turned into ridicule as if the evils were not thus great enough the ministry took pains to efface the heroic traditions of the past which had escaped the general wreck to the energetic fights of the great reign succeeded by order of the court affairs of circumspection to preserve to the wasted material a few armed ships increased opportunity was given to the enemy from this unhappy principle we were bound to a defensive as advantageous to the enemy as it was foreign to the genius of our people this circumspection before the enemy laid down for us by orders betrayed in the long run the national temper and the abuse of the system led to acts of indiscipline and defection under fire of which a single instance would vainly be sought in the previous century a false policy of continental extension swallowed up the resources of the country and was doubly injurious because by leaving defenceless its colonies and commerce it exposed the greatest source of wealth to be cut off as in fact happened the small squadrons that got to sea were destroyed by vastly superior force 
the merchant shipping was swept away and the colonies canada martinique guadeloupe india fell into england's hands if it did not take too much space interesting extracts might be made showing the woeful misery of france the country that had abandoned the sea and the growing wealth of england amid all her sacrifices and exertions a contemporary writer has thus expressed his view of the policy of france at this period france by engaging so heartily as she has done in the german war has drawn away so much of her attention and her revenue from her navy that it enabled us to give such a blow to her maritime strength as possibly she may never be able to recover her engagement in the german war has likewise drawn her from the defence of her colonies by which means we have conquered some of the most considerable she possessed it has withdrawn her from the protection of her trade by which it is entirely destroyed while that of england has never in the profoundest peace been in so flourishing a condition so that by embarking in this german war france has suffered herself to be undone so far as regards her particular and immediate quarrel with england in the seven years war france lost thirty-seven ships of the line and fifty-six frigates a force three times as numerous as the whole navy of the united states at any time in the days of sailing ships for the first time since the middle ages says a french historian speaking of the same war england had conquered france single-handed almost without allies france having powerful auxiliaries she had conquered solely by the superiority of her government yes but it was by the superiority of her government using the tremendous weapon of her sea power the reward of a consistent policy perseveringly directed to one aim the profound humiliation of france which reached its depths between seventeen sixty and seventeen sixty three at which latter date she made peace has an instructive lesson for the united states in this our period of commercial and naval decadence we have been spared her humiliation let us hope to profit by her subsequent example between the same years seventeen sixty and seventeen sixty three the french people rose as afterward in seventeen ninety three and declared they would have a navy popular feeling skilfully directed by the government took up the cry from one end of france to the other the navy must be restored gifts of ships were made by cities by corporations and by private subscriptions a prodigious activity sprang up in the lately silent ports everywhere ships were building or repairing this activity was sustained the arsenals were replenished the material of every kind was put on a satisfactory footing the artillery reorganized and ten thousand trained gunners drilled and maintained the tone and action of the naval officers of the day instantly felt the popular impulse for which indeed some loftier spirits among them had been not only waiting but working at no time was greater mental and professional activity found among french naval officers than just then when their ships had been suffered to rot away by governmental inaction thus a prominent french officer of our own day writes the sad condition of the navy in the reign of louis the fifteenth by closing to officers the brilliant career of bold enterprises and successful battles forced them to fall back upon themselves they drew from study the knowledge they were to put to the proof some years later thus putting into practice that fine saying of montesquieu adversity is our mother prosperity our stepmother by the year seventeen sixty nine was seen in all its splendour that brilliant galaxy of officers whose activities stretched to the ends of the earth and who embraced in their works and in their investigations all the branches of human knowledge the academie de marine founded in seventeen fifty two was reorganized the academie's first director a post-captain named bigot de morogue wrote an elaborate treatise on naval tactics the first original work on the subject since pole hosts which it was designed to supersede morogues must have been studying and formulating his problems in tactics in days when france had no fleet and was unable so much as to raise her head at sea under the blows of her enemy 
at the same time england had no similar book and an english lieutenant in seventeen sixty two was just translating a part of host's great work omitting by far the larger part it was not until nearly twenty years later that clark a scotch private gentleman published an ingenious study of naval tactics in which he pointed out to english admirals the system by which the french had thwarted their thoughtless and ill-combined attacks the researches of the academie de la marine and the energetic impulse which it gave to the labours of officers were not as we hope to show later without influence upon the relatively prosperous condition in which the navy was at the beginning of the american war it has already been pointed out that the american war of independence involved a departure from england's traditional and true policy by committing her to a distant land war while powerful enemies were waiting for an opportunity to attack her at sea like france in the then recent german wars like napoleon later in the spanish war england through undue self-confidence was about to turn a friend into an enemy and so expose the real basis of her power to a rude proof the french government on the other hand avoided the snare into which it had so often fallen turning her back on the european continent having the probability of neutrality there and the certainty of alliance with spain by her side france advanced to the contest with a fine navy and a brilliant though perhaps relatively inexperienced body of officers on the other side of the atlantic she had the support of a friendly people and of her own or allied ports both in the west indies and on the continent the wisdom of this policy the happy influence of this action of the government upon her sea-power is evident but the details of the war do not belong to this part of the subject to americans the chief interest of that war is found upon the land but to naval officers upon the sea for it was essentially a sea war the intelligent and systematic efforts of twenty years bore their due fruit for though the warfare afloat ended with a great disaster the combined efforts of the french and spanish fleets undoubtedly bore down england's strength and robbed her of her colonies in the various naval undertakings and battles the honour of france was upon the whole maintained though it is difficult upon consideration of the general subject to avoid the conclusion that the inexperience of french seamen as compared with english the narrow spirit of jealousy shown by the noble corps of officers toward those of different antecedents and above all the miserable traditions of three quarters of a century already alluded to the miserable policy of a government which taught them first to save their ships to economize the material prevented french admirals from reaping not the mere glory but the positive advantages that more than once were within their grasp when monk said the nation that would rule upon the sea must always attack he set the keynote to england's naval policy and had the instructions of the french government consistently breathed the same spirit the war of seventeen seventy eight might have ended sooner and better than it did it seems ungracious to criticise the conduct of a service to which under god our nation owes that its birth was not a miscarriage but writers of its own country abundantly reflect the spirit of the remark a french officer who served afloat during this war in a work of calm and judicial tone says what must the young officers have thought who were at sandy hook with d'estaing at st christopher with de grasse even those who arrived at rhode island with de ternay when they saw that these officers were not tried at their return again another french officer of much later date justifies the opinion expressed when speaking of the war of the american revolution in the following terms it was necessary to get rid of the unhappy prejudices of the days of the regency and of louis the fifteenth but the mishaps of which they were full were too recent to be forgotten by our ministers thanks to a wretched hesitation fleets which had rightly alarmed england became reduced to ordinary proportions 
entrenching themselves in a false economy the ministry claimed that by reason of the excessive expenses necessary to maintain the fleet the admirals must be ordered to maintain the greatest circumspection as though in war half measures have not always led to disasters so too the orders given to our squadron chiefs were to keep the sea as long as possible without engaging in actions which might cause the loss of vessels difficult to replace so that more than once complete victories which would have crowned the skill of our admirals and the courage of our captains were changed into successes of little importance a system which laid down as a principle that an admiral should not use the force in his hands which sent him against the enemy with the foreordained purpose of receiving rather than making the attack a system which sapped moral power to save material resources must have unhappy results it is certain that this deplorable system was one of the causes of the lack of discipline and startling defections which marked the periods of louis the sixteenth of the first republic and of the first empire within ten years of the peace of seventeen eighty three came the french revolution but that great upheaval which shook the foundations of states loosed the ties of social order and drove out of the navy nearly all the trained officers of the monarchy who were attached to the old state of things did not free the french navy from a false system it was easier to overturn the form of government than to uproot a deep-seated tradition here again a third french officer of the highest rank and literary accomplishments speaking of the inaction of villeneuve the admiral who commanded the french rear at the battle of the nile and who did not leave his anchors while the head of the column was being destroyed a day was to come trafalgar in which villeneuve in his turn like de grasse before him and like du Caille, would complain of being abandoned by part of his fleet we have come to suspect some secret reason for this fatal coincidence it is not natural that among so many honourable men there should so often be found admirals and captains incurring such a reproach if the name of some of them is to this very day sadly associated with the memory of our disasters we may be sure the fault is not wholly their own we must rather blame the nature of the operations in which they were engaged and that system of defensive war prescribed by the french government which pitt in the english parliament proclaimed to be the forerunner of certain ruin that system when we wished to renounce it had already penetrated our habits it had so to say weakened our arms and paralyzed our self-reliance too often did our squadrons leave port with a special mission to fulfil and with the intention of avoiding the enemy to fall in with him was at once a piece of bad luck it was thus that our ships went into action they submitted to it instead of forcing it fortune would have hesitated longer between the two fleets and not have borne in the end so heavily against ours if brouet's meeting nelson halfway could have gone out to fight him this fettered and timid war which velleray and martin had carried on had lasted long thanks to the circumspection of some english admirals and the traditions of the old tactics it was with these traditions that the battle of the nile had broken the hour for decisive action had come some years later came trafalgar and again the government of france took up a new policy with the navy the author last quoted speaks again the emperor whose eagle glance traced plans of campaign for his fleets as for his armies was wearied by these unexpected reverses he turned his eyes from the one field of battle in which fortune was faithless to him and decided to pursue england elsewhere than upon the seas he undertook to rebuild his navy but without giving it any part in the struggle which became more furious than ever nevertheless far from slackening the activity of our dockyards redoubled every year ships of the line were either laid down or added to the fleet venice and genoa under his control saw their old splendours rise again and from the shores of the elbe to the head of the adriatic all the ports of the continent emulously seconded the creative thought of the emperor numerous squadrons were assembled in the scheldt in brest roads and in toulon 
but to the end the emperor refused to give this navy full of ardor and self-reliance an opportunity to measure its strength with the enemy cast down by constant reverses he had kept up our armed ships only to oblige our enemies to blockades whose enormous cost must end by exhausting their finances when the empire fell france had one hundred and three ships of the line and fifty-five frigates to turn now from the particular lessons drawn from the history of the past to the general question of the influence of government upon the sea career of its people it is seen that that influence can work in two distinct but closely related ways first in peace the government by its policy can favor the natural growth of a people's industries and its tendencies to seek adventure and gain by way of the sea or it can try to develop such industries and such sea-going bent when they do not naturally exist or on the other hand the government may by mistaken action check and fetter the progress which the people left to themselves would make in any one of these ways the influence of the government will be felt making or marring the sea power of the country in the matter of peaceful commerce upon which alone it cannot be too often insisted a thoroughly strong navy can be based secondly for war the influence of the government will be felt in its most legitimate manner in maintaining an armed navy of a size commensurate with the growth of its shipping and the importance of the interests connected with it more important even than the size of the navy is the question of its institutions favoring a healthful spirit and activity and providing for rapid development in time of war by an adequate reserve of men and of ships and by measures for drawing out that general reserve power which has before been pointed to when considering the character and pursuits of the people undoubtedly under this second head of warlike preparation must come the maintenance of suitable naval stations in those distant parts of the world to which the armed shipping must follow the peaceful vessels of commerce the protection of such stations must depend either upon direct military force as do gibraltar and malta or upon a surrounding friendly population such as the american colonists once were to england and it may be presumed the australian colonists now are such friendly surroundings and backing joined to a reasonable military provision are the best of defences and when combined with decided preponderance at sea make a scattered and extensive empire like that of england secure for while it is true that an unexpected attack may cause disaster in some one quarter the actual superiority of naval power prevents such disaster from being general or irremediable history has sufficiently proved this england's naval bases have been in all parts of the world and her fleets have at once protected them kept open the communications between them and relied upon them for shelter colonies attached to the mother country afford therefore the surest means of supporting abroad the sea power of a country in peace the influence of the government should be felt in promoting by all means a warmth of attachment and a unity of interest which will make the welfare of one the welfare of all and the quarrel of one the quarrel of all and in war or rather for war by inducing such measures of organization and defence as shall be felt by all to be a fair distribution of a burden of which each reaps the benefit such colonies the united states has not and is not likely to have as regards purely military naval stations the feeling of her people was probably accurately expressed by an historian of the english navy a hundred years ago speaking then of gibraltar and port mahan military governments said he agree so little with the industry of a trading people and are in themselves so repugnant to the genius of the british people that i do not wonder that men of good sense and of all parties have inclined to give up these as tangiers was given up having therefore no foreign establishments either colonial or military the ships of war of the united states in war will be like land birds unable to fly far from their own shores to provide resting places for them where they can coal and repair would be one of the first duties of a government proposing to itself the development of the power of the nation at sea 
as the practical object of this inquiry is to draw from the lessons of history inferences applicable to one's own country and service it is proper now to ask how far the conditions of the united states involve serious danger and call for action on the part of the government in order to build again her sea power it will not be too much to say that the action of the government since the civil war and up to this day has been effectively directed solely to what has been called the first link in the chain which makes sea power internal development great production with the accompanying aim and boast of self-sufficingness such has been the object such to some extent the result in this the government has faithfully reflected the bent of the controlling elements of the country though it is not always easy to feel that such controlling elements are truly representative even in a free country however that may be there is no doubt that besides having no colonies the intermediate link of a peaceful shipping and the interests involved in it are now likewise lacking in short the united states has only one link of the three the circumstances of naval war have changed so much within the last hundred years that it may be doubted whether such disastrous effects on the one hand or such brilliant prosperity on the other as were seen in the wars between england and france could now recur in her secure and haughty sway of the seas england imposed a yoke on neutrals which will never again be borne and the principle that the flag covers the goods is for ever secured the commerce of a belligerent can therefore now be safely carried on in neutral ships except when contraband of war or to blockaded ports and as regards the latter it is also certain that there will be no more paper blockades putting aside therefore the question of defending her seaports from capture or contribution as to which there is practical unanimity in theory and entire indifference in practice what need has the united states of sea power her commerce is even now carried on by others why should her people desire that which if possessed must be defended at great cost so far as this question is economical it is outside the scope of this work but conditions which may entail suffering and loss on the country by war are directly pertinent to it granting therefore that the foreign trade of the united states going and coming is on board ships which an enemy cannot touch except when bound to a blockaded port what will constitute an efficient blockade the present definition is that it is such as to constitute a manifest danger to a vessel seeking to enter or leave the port this is evidently very elastic many can remember that during the civil war after a night attack on the united states fleet off charleston the confederates next morning sent out a steamer with some foreign consuls on board who so far satisfied themselves that no blockading vessel was in sight that they issued a declaration to that effect on the strength of this declaration some southern authorities claimed that the blockade was technically broken and could not be technically re-established without a new notification is it necessary to constitute a real danger to blockade runners that the blockading fleet should be in sight half a dozen fast steamers cruising twenty miles off shore between the new jersey and long island coast would be a very real danger to ships seeking to go in or out by the principal entrance to new york and similar positions might effectively blockade boston the delaware and the chesapeake the main body of the blockading fleet prepared not only to capture merchant ships but to resist military attempts to break the blockade need not be within sight nor in a position known to the shore the bulk of nelson's fleet was fifty miles from cadiz two days before trafalgar with a small detachment watching close to the harbour the allied fleet began to get under way at seven a m and nelson even under the conditions of those days knew it by nine thirty the english fleet at that distance was a very real danger to its enemy it seems possible in these days of submarine telegraphs that the blockading forces inshore and offshore and from one port to another might be in telegraphic communication with one another along the whole coast of the united states readily giving mutual support 
and if by some fortunate military combination one detachment were attacked in force it could warn the others and retreat upon them granting that such a blockade off one port were broken on one day by fairly driving away the ships maintaining it the notification of its being re-established could be cabled all over the world the next to avoid such blockades there must be a military force afloat that will at all times so endanger a blockading fleet that it can by no means keep its place then neutral ships except those laden with contraband of war can come and go freely and maintain the commercial relations of the country with the world outside it may be urged that with the extensive sea-coast of the united states a blockade of the whole line cannot be effectively kept up no one will more readily concede this than officers who remember how the blockade of the southern coast alone was maintained but in the present condition of the navy and it may be added with any additions not exceeding those so far proposed by the government the attempt to blockade boston new york the delaware the chesapeake and the mississippi in other words the great centres of export and import would not entail upon one of the large maritime nations efforts greater than have been made before england has at the same time blockaded brest the biscay coast toulon and cadiz when there were powerful squadrons lying within the harbours it is true that commerce in neutral ships can then enter other ports of the united states than those named but what a dislocation of the carrying traffic of the country what failure of supplies at times what inadequate means of transport by rail or water of dockage of lighterage of warehousing will be involved in such an enforced change of the ports of entry will there be no money loss no suffering consequent upon this and when with much pain and expense these evils have been partially remedied the enemy may be led to stop the new inlets as he did the old the people of the united states will certainly not starve but they may suffer grievously as for supplies which are contraband of war is there not reason to fear that the united states is not now able to go alone if an emergency should arise the question is eminently one in which the influence of the government should make itself felt to build up for the nation a navy which if not capable of reaching distant countries shall at least be able to keep clear the chief approaches to its own the eyes of the country have for a quarter of a century been turned from the sea the results of such a policy and of its opposite will be shown in the instance of france and of england without asserting a narrow parallelism between the case of the united states and either of these it may safely be said that it is essential to the welfare of the whole country that the conditions of trade and commerce should remain as far as possible unaffected by an external war in order to do this the enemy must be kept not only out of our ports but far away from our coasts can this navy be had without restoring the merchant shipping it is doubtful history has proved that such a purely military sea power can be built up by a despot as was done by louis the fourteenth but though so fair seeming experience showed that his navy was like a growth which having no root soon withers away but in a representative government any military expenditure must have a strongly represented interest behind it convinced of its necessity such an interest in sea-power does not exist cannot exist here without action by the government how such a merchant shipping should be built up whether by subsidies or by free trade by constant administration of tonics or by free movement in the open air is not a military but an economical question even had the united states a great national shipping it may be doubted whether a sufficient navy would follow the distance which separates her from other great powers in one way of protection is also a snare the motive if any there be which will give the united states a navy is probably now quickening in the central american isthmus let us hope it will not come to the birth too late 
here concludes the general discussion of the principal elements which affect favorably or unfavorably the growth of sea power in nations the aim has been first to consider those elements in their natural tendency for or against and then to illustrate by particular examples and by the experience of the past such discussions while undoubtedly embracing a wider field yet fall mainly within the province of strategy as distinguished from tactics the considerations and principles which enter into them belong to the unchangeable or unchanging order of things remaining the same in cause and effect from age to age they belong as it were to the order of nature of whose stability so much is heard in our day whereas tactics using as its instruments the weapons made by man shares in the change and progress of the race from generation to generation from time to time the superstructure of tactics has to be altered or wholly torn down but the old foundations of strategy so far remain as though laid upon a rock there will next be examined the general history of europe and america with particular reference to the effect exercised upon that history and upon the welfare of the people by sea power in its broad sense from time to time as occasion offers the aim will be to recall and reinforce the general teaching already elicited by particular illustrations the general tenor of the study will therefore be strategical in that broad definition of naval strategy which has before been quoted and accepted naval strategy has for its end to found support and increase as well in peace as in war the sea power of a country in the matter of particular battles while freely admitting that the change of details has made obsolete much of their teaching the attempt will be made to point out where the application or neglect of true general principles has produced decisive effects and other things being equal those actions will be preferred which from their association with the names of the most distinguished officers may be presumed to show how far just tactical ideas obtained in a particular age or a particular service it will also be desirable where analogies between ancient and modern weapons appear on the surface to derive such probable lessons as they offer without laying undue stress upon the points of resemblance finally it must be remembered that among all changes the nature of man remains much the same the personal equation though uncertain in quantity and quality in the particular instance is sure always to be found end of chapter one part four chapter two part one of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain state of europe in sixteen sixty second anglo-dutch war sixteen sixty five to sixteen sixty seven sea battles of low stoft and of the four days the period at which our historical survey is to begin has been loosely stated as the middle of the seventeenth century the year sixteen sixty will now be taken as the definite date at which to open in may of that year charles the second was restored to the english throne amid the general rejoicing of the people in march of the following year upon the death of cardinal mazarin louis the fourteenth assembled his ministers and said to them i have summoned you to tell you that it has pleased me hitherto to permit my affairs to be governed by the late cardinal i shall in future be my own prime minister i direct that no decree be sealed except by my orders and i order the secretaries of state and the superintendent of the finances to sign nothing without my command the personal government thus assumed was maintained in fact as well as in name for over half a century within one twelve month then are seen setting forward upon a new stage of national life after a period of confusion more or less prolonged the two states which amid whatever inequalities have had the first places in the sea history of modern europe and america indeed of the world at large 
sea history however is but one factor in that general advance and decay of nations which is called their history and if sight be lost of the other factors to which it is so closely related a distorted view either exaggerated or the reverse of its importance will be formed it is with the belief that that importance is vastly underrated if not practically lost sight of by people unconnected with the sea and particularly by the people of the united states in our own day that this study has been undertaken the date taken 1660 followed closely another which marked a great settlement of european affairs setting the seal of treaty upon the results of a general war known to history as the thirty years war this other date was that of the treaty of westphalia or munster in 1648 in this the independence of the dutch united provinces long before practically assured was formally acknowledged by spain and it being followed in sixteen fifty nine by the treaty of the pyrenees between france and spain the two gave to europe a state of general external peace destined soon to be followed by a series of almost universal wars which lasted as long as louis the fourteenth lived wars which were to induce profound changes in the map of europe during which new states were to arise others to decay and all to undergo large modifications either in extent of dominion or in political power in these results maritime power directly or indirectly had a great share we must first look at the general condition of european states at the time from which the narrative starts in the struggles extending over nearly a century whose end is marked by the peace of westphalia the royal family known as the house of austria had been the great overwhelming power which all others feared during the long reign of the emperor charles v who abdicated a century before the head of that house had united in his own person the two crowns of austria and spain which carried with them among other possessions the countries we now know as holland and belgium together with a preponderating influence in italy after his abdication the two great monarchies of austria and spain were separated but though ruled by different persons they were still in the same family and tended toward that unity of aim and sympathy which marked dynastic connections in that and the following century to this bond of union was added that of a common religion during the century before the peace of westphalia the extension of family power and the extension of the religion professed were the two strongest motives of political action this was the period of the great religious wars which arrayed nation against nation principality against principality and often in the same nation faction against faction religious persecution caused the revolt of the protestant dutch provinces against spain which issued after eighty years of more or less constant war in the recognition of their independence religious discord amounting to civil war at times distracted france during the greater part of the same period profoundly affecting not only her internal but her external policy these were the days of st bartholomew of the religious murder of henry the fourth of the siege of la rochelle of constant intriguing between roman catholic spain and roman catholic frenchmen as the religious motive acting in a sphere to which it did not naturally belong and in which it had no rightful place died away the political necessities and interests of states began to have juster weight not that they had been wholly lost sight of in the meantime but the religious animosities had either blinded the eyes or fettered the action of statesmen it was natural that in france one of the greatest sufferers from religious passions owing to the number and character of the protestant minority this reaction should first and most markedly be seen placed between spain and the german states among which austria stood foremost without a rival internal union and checks upon the power of the house of austria were necessities of political existence 
happily providence raised up to her in close succession two great rulers henry the fourth and richelieu men in whom religion fell short of bigotry and who when forced to recognize it in the sphere of politics did so as masters and not as slaves under them french statesmanship received a guidance which richelieu formulated as a tradition and which moved on the following general lines one internal union of the kingdom appeasing or putting down religious strife and centralizing authority in the king two resistance to the power of the house of austria which actually and necessarily carried with it alliance with protestant german states and with holland three extension of the boundaries of france to the eastward at the expense mainly of spain which then possessed not only the present belgium but other provinces long since incorporated with france and four the creation and development of a great sea power adding to the wealth of the kingdom and intended specially to make head against france's hereditary enemy england for which end again the alliance with holland was to be kept in view such were the broad outlines of policy laid down by statesmen in the front rank of genius for the guidance of that country whose people have not without cause claimed to be the most complete exponent of european civilization foremost in the march of progress combining political advance with individual development this tradition carried on by mazarin was received from him by louis the fourteenth it will be seen how far he was faithful to it and what were the results to france of his action meanwhile it may be noted that of these four elements necessary to the greatness of france sea power was one and as the second and third were practically one in the means employed it may be said that sea power was one of the two great means by which france's external greatness was to be maintained england on the sea austria on the land indicated the direction that french effort was to take as regards the condition of france in sixteen sixty and her readiness to move onward in the road marked by richelieu it may be said that internal peace was secured the power of the nobles wholly broken religious discords at rest the tolerant edict of nantes was still in force while the remaining protestant discontent had been put down by the armed hand all power was absolutely centred in the throne in other respects though the kingdom was at peace the condition was less satisfactory there was practically no navy commerce internal and external was not prosperous the finances were in disorder the army small spain the nation before which all others had trembled less than a century before was now long in decay and scarcely formidable the central weakness had spread to all parts of the administration in extent of territory however she was still great the spanish netherlands still belonged to her she held naples sicily and sardinia gibraltar had not yet fallen into english hands her vast possessions in america with the exception of jamaica conquered by england a few years before were still untouched the condition of her sea-power both for peace and war has been already alluded to many years before richelieu had contracted a temporary alliance with spain by virtue of which she placed forty ships at his disposal but the bad condition of the vessels for the most part ill-armed and ill-commanded compelled their withdrawal the navy of spain was then in full decay and its weakness did not escape the piercing eye of the cardinal an encounter which took place between the spanish and dutch fleets in sixteen thirty nine shows most plainly the state of degradation into which this once proud navy had fallen her navy at this time says the narrative quoted met one of those shocks a succession of which during this war degraded her from her high station of mistress of the seas in both hemispheres to a contemptible rank among maritime powers the king was fitting out a powerful fleet to carry the war to the coasts of sweden and for its equipment had commanded a reinforcement of men and provisions to be sent from dunkirk a fleet accordingly set sail but were attacked by von tromp some captured the remainder forced to retire within the harbour again 
soon after tromp seized three english neutral ships carrying one thousand seventy spanish soldiers from cadiz to dunkirk he took the troops out but let the ships go free leaving seventeen vessels to blockade dunkirk tromp with the remaining twelve advanced to meet the enemy's fleet on its arrival it was soon seen entering the straits of dover to the number of sixty-seven sail and having two thousand troops being joined by de witt with four more ships tromp with his small force made a resolute attack upon the enemy the fight lasted till four p m when the spanish admiral took refuge in the downs tromp determined to engage if they should come out but oquendo with his powerful fleet many of which carried from sixty to a hundred guns suffered himself to be blockaded and the english admiral told tromp he was ordered to join the spaniards if hostilities began tromp sent home for instructions and the action of england only served to call out the vast maritime powers of the dutch tromp was rapidly reinforced to ninety-six sail and twelve fire-ships and ordered to attack leaving a detached squadron to observe the english and to attack them if they helped the spaniards he began the fight embarrassed by a thick fog under cover of which the spaniards cut their cables to escape many running too close to shore went aground and most of the remainder attempting to retreat were sunk captured or driven on the french coast never was victory more complete when a navy submits to such a line of action all tone and pride must have departed but the navy only shared in the general decline which made spain henceforward have an ever lessening weight in the policy of europe in the midst of the splendors of her court and language says guizot the spanish government felt itself weak and sought to hide its weakness under its immobility philip the fourth and his minister weary of striving only to be conquered looked but for the security of peace and only sought to put aside all questions which would call for efforts of which they felt themselves incapable divided and enervated the house of austria had even less ambition than power and except when absolutely forced a pompous inertia became the policy of the successors of charles v such was the spain of that day that part of the spanish dominions which was then known as the low countries or the roman catholic netherlands our modern belgium was about to be a fruitful source of variance between france and her natural ally the dutch republic this state whose political name was the united provinces had now reached the summit of its influence and power a power based as has already been explained wholly upon the sea and upon the use of that element made by the great maritime and commercial genius of the dutch people a recent french author thus describes the commercial and colonial conditions at the accession of louis the fourteenth of this people which beyond any other in modern times save only england has shown how the harvest of the sea can lift up to wealth and power a country intrinsically weak and without resources holland had become the phoenicia of modern times mistresses of the scheldt the united provinces closed the outlets of antwerp to the sea and inherited the commercial power of that rich city which an ambassador of venice in the fifteenth century had compared to venice herself they received besides in their principal cities the working men of the low countries who fled from spanish tyranny of conscience the manufactures of clothes linen stuffs etc which employed six hundred thousand souls open new sources of gain to a people previously content with the trade in cheese and fish fisheries alone had already enriched them the herring fishery supported nearly one-fifth of the population of holland producing three hundred thousand tons of salt fish and bringing in more than eight million francs annually the naval and commercial power of the republic developed rapidly the merchant fleet of holland alone numbered ten thousand sail one hundred and sixty eight thousand seamen and supported two hundred and sixty thousand inhabitants she had taken possession of the greater part of the european carrying trade 
and had added thereto since the peace all the carriage of merchandise between america and spain did the same service for the french ports and maintained an importation traffic of thirty six million francs the north countries brandenburg denmark sweden muscovy poland access to which was opened by the baltic to the provinces were for them an inexhaustible market of exchange they fed it by the produce they sold there and by purchase of the products of the north wheat timber copper hemp and furs the total value of merchandise yearly shipped in dutch bottoms in all seas exceeded a thousand million francs the dutch had made themselves to use a contemporary phrase the wagoners of all seas it was through its colonies that the republic had been able thus to develop its sea trade it had the monopoly of all the products of the east produce and spices from asia were by her brought to europe of a yearly value of sixteen million francs the powerful east india company founded in sixteen o two had built up in asia an empire with possessions taken from the portuguese mistress in sixteen fifty of the cape of good hope which guaranteed it a stopping place for its ships it reigned as a sovereign in ceylon and upon the coasts of malabar and coromandel it had made batavia its seat of government and extended its traffic to china and japan meanwhile the west india company of more rapid rise but less durable had manned eight hundred ships of war and trade it had used them to seize the remnants of portuguese power upon the shores of guinea as well as in brazil the united provinces had thus become the warehouse wherein were collected the products of all nations the colonies of the dutch at this time were scattered throughout the eastern seas in india and malacca in java the moluccas and various parts of the vast archipelago lying to the northward of australia they had possessions on the west coast of africa and as yet the colony of new amsterdam remained in their hands in south america the dutch west india company had owned nearly three hundred leagues of coast from bahia in brazil northward but much had recently escaped from their hands the united provinces owed their consideration and power to their wealth and their fleets the sea which beats like an inveterate enemy against their shores had been subdued and made a useful servant the land was to prove their destruction a long and fierce strife had been maintained with an enemy more cruel than the sea the spanish kingdom the successful ending with its delusive promise of rest and peace but sounded the knell of the dutch republic so long as the power of spain remained unimpaired or at least great enough to keep up the terror that she had long inspired it was to the interest of england and of france both sufferers from spanish menace and intrigue that the united provinces should be strong and independent when spain fell and repeated humiliations showed that her weakness was real and not seeming other motives took the place of fear england coveted holland's trade and sea dominion france desired the spanish netherlands the united provinces had reason to oppose the latter as well as the former under the combined assaults of the two rival nations the intrinsic weakness of the united provinces was soon to be felt and seen open to attack by the land few in numbers and with a government ill adapted to put forth the united strength of a people above all unfitted to keep up adequate preparation for war the decline of the republic and the nation was to be more striking and rapid than the rise as yet however in sixteen sixty no indications of the coming fall were remarked the republic was still in the front rank of the great powers of europe if in sixteen fifty four the war with england had shown a state of unreadiness wonderful in a navy that had so long humbled the pride of spain on the seas on the other hand the provinces in sixteen fifty seven had effectually put a stop to the insults of france directed against her commerce and a year later by their interference in the baltic between denmark and sweden they had hindered sweden from establishing in the north a preponderance disastrous to them 
they forced her to leave open the entrance to the baltic of which they remained masters no other navy being able to dispute its control with them the superiority of their fleet the valor of their troops the skill and firmness of their diplomacy had caused the prestige of their government to be recognized weakened and humiliated by the last english war they had replaced themselves in the rank of great powers at this moment charles the second was restored the general character of the government has been before mentioned and need here only be recalled it was a loosely knit confederacy administered by what may not inaccurately be called a commercial aristocracy with all the political timidity of that class which has so much to risk in war the effect of these two factors sectional jealousy and commercial spirit upon the military navy was disastrous it was not kept up properly in peace there were necessarily rivalries in a fleet which was rather a maritime coalition than a united navy and there was too little of a true military spirit among the officers a more heroic people than the dutch never existed the annals of dutch sea-fights give instances of desperate enterprise and endurance certainly not excelled perhaps never equalled elsewhere but they also exhibit instances of defection and misconduct which show a lack of military spirit due evidently to lack of professional pride and training this professional training scarcely existed in any navy of that day but its place was largely supplied in monarchical countries by the feeling of a military caste it remains to be noted that the government weak enough from the causes named was yet weaker from the division of the people into two great factions bitterly hating each other the one which was the party of the merchants burgomasters and now in power favoured the confederate republic as described the other desired a monarchical government under the house of orange the republican party wished for a french alliance if possible and a strong navy the orange party favoured england to whose royal house the prince of orange was closely related and a powerful army under these conditions of government and weak in numbers the united provinces in sixteen sixty with their vast wealth and external activities resembled a man kept up by stimulants factitious strength cannot endure indefinitely but it is wonderful to see this small state weaker by far in numbers than either england or france endure the onslaught of either singly and for two years of both in alliance not only without being destroyed but without losing her place in europe she owed this astonishing result partly to the skill of one or two men but mainly to her sea power the conditions of england with reference to her fitness to enter upon the impending strife differed from those of both holland and france although monarchical in government and with much real power in the king's hands the latter was not able to direct the policy of the kingdom wholly at his will he had to reckon as louis had not with the temper and wishes of his people what louis gained for france he gained for himself the glory of france was his glory charles aimed first at his own advantage then at that of england but with the memory of the past ever before him he was determined above all not to incur his father's fate nor a repetition of his own exile therefore when danger became imminent he gave way before the feeling of the english nation charles himself hated holland he hated it as a republic he hated the existing government because opposed in internal affairs to his connections the house of orange and he hated it yet more because in the days of his exile the republic as one of the conditions of peace with cromwell had driven him from her borders he was drawn to france by the political sympathy of a would-be absolute ruler possibly by his roman catholic bias and very largely by the money paid him by louis which partially freed him from the control of parliament in following these tendencies of his own charles had to take account of certain decided wishes of his people the english of the same race as the dutch and with similar conditions of situation were declared rivals for the control of the sea and of commerce and as the dutch were now leading in the race the english were the more eager and bitter a special cause of grievance was found in the action of the dutch east 
india company which claimed the monopoly of trade in the east and had obliged distant princes with whom it treated to close their states to foreign nations who were thus excluded not only from the dutch colonies but from all the territory of the indies conscious of greater strength the english also wished to control the action of dutch politics and in the days of the english republic had even sought to impose a union of the two governments at the first therefore popular rivalry and enmity seconded the king's wishes the more so as france had not for some years been formidable on the continent as soon however as the aggressive policy of louis the fourteenth was generally recognized the english people both nobles and commons felt the great danger to be there as a century before it had been in spain the transfer of the spanish netherlands belgium to france would tend toward the subjection of europe and especially would be a blow to the sea-power both of the dutch and english for it was not to be supposed that louis would allow the scheldt and port of antwerp to remain closed as they then were under a treaty wrung by the dutch from the weakness of spain the reopening to commerce of that great city would be a blow alike to amsterdam and to london with the revival of inherited opposition to france the ties of kindred began to tell the memory of past alliance against the tyranny of spain was recalled and similarity of religious faith still a powerful motive drew the two together at the same time the great and systematic efforts of colbert to build up the commerce and the navy of france excited the jealousy of both the sea powers rivals themselves they instinctively turned against a third party intruding upon their domain charles was unable to resist the pressure of his people under all these motives wars between england and holland ceased and were followed after charles's death by close alliance although her commerce was less extensive the navy of england in sixteen sixty was superior to that of holland particularly in organization and efficiency the stern enthusiastic religious government of cromwell grounded on military strength had made its mark both on the fleet and army the names of several of the superior officers under the protector among which that of monk stands foremost appear in the narrative of the first of the dutch wars under charles this superiority in tone and discipline gradually disappeared under the corrupting influence of court favour in a licentious government and holland which upon the whole was worsted by england alone upon the sea in sixteen sixty five successfully resisted the combined navies of england and france in sixteen seventy two as regards the material of the three fleets we are told that the french ships had greater displacement than the english relatively to the weight of artillery and stores hence they could keep when fully loaded a greater height of battery their hulls also had better lines these advantages would naturally follow from the thoughtful and systematic way in which the french navy at that time was restored from a state of decay and has a lesson of hope for us in the present analogous condition of our own navy the dutch ships from the character of their coast were flatter bottomed and of less draught and thus were able when pressed to find a refuge among the shoals but they were in consequence less weatherly and generally of lighter scantling than those of either of the other nations thus as briefly as possible have been sketched the conditions degree of power and aims which shaped and controlled the policy of the four principal seaboard states of the day spain france england and holland from the point of view of this history these will come most prominently and most often into notice but as other states exercised a powerful influence upon the course of events and our aim is not merely naval history but an appreciation of the effect of naval and commercial power upon the course of general history it is necessary to state shortly the condition of the rest of europe america had not yet begun to play a prominent part in the pages of history or in the policies of cabinets germany was then divided into many small governments with the one great empire of austria 
the policy of the smaller states shifted and it was the aim of france to combine as many of them as possible under her influence in pursuance of her traditional opposition to austria with france thus working against her on the one side austria was in imminent peril on the other from the constant assaults of the turkish empire still vigorous though decaying the policy of france had long inclined to friendly relations with turkey not only as a check upon austria but also from her wish to engross the trade with the levant colbert in his extreme eagerness for the sea power of france favoured this alliance it will be remembered that greece and egypt were then parts of the turkish empire prussia as now known did not exist the foundations of the future kingdom were then being prepared by the elector of brandenburg a powerful minor state which was not yet able to stand quite alone but carefully avoided a formally dependent position the kingdom of poland still existed a most disturbing and important factor in european politics because of its weak and unsettled government which kept every other state anxious lest some unforeseen turn of events there should tend to the advantage of a rival it was the traditional policy of france to keep poland upright and strong russia was still below the horizon coming but not yet come within the circle of european states and their living interests she and the other powers bordering upon the baltic were naturally rivals for preponderance in that sea in which the other states and above all the maritime states had a particular interest as the source from which naval stores of every kind were chiefly drawn sweden and denmark were at this time in a state of constant enmity and were to be found on opposite sides in the quarrels that prevailed for many years past and during the early years of louis the fourteenth sweden was for the most part in alliance with france her bias was that way the general state of europe being as described the spring that was to set the various wheels in motion was in the hands of louis the fourteenth the weakness of his immediate neighbours the great resources of his kingdom only waiting for development the unity of direction resulting from his absolute power his own practical talent and untiring industry aided during the first half of his reign by a combination of ministers of singular ability all united to make every government in europe hang more or less upon his action and be determined by if not follow his lead the greatness of france was his object and he had the choice of advancing it by either of two roads by the land or by the sea not that the one wholly forbade the other but that france overwhelmingly strong as she then was had not power to move with equal steps on both paths louis chose extension by land he had married the eldest daughter philip the fourth the then reigning king of spain and though by the treaty of marriage she had renounced all claim to her father's inheritance it was not difficult to find reasons for disregarding this stipulation technical grounds were found for setting it aside as regarded certain portions of the netherlands and franche comte and negotiations were entered into with the court of spain to annul it altogether the matter was the more important because the male heir to the throne was so feeble that it was evident that the austrian line of spanish kings would end in him the desire to put a french prince on the spanish throne either himself thus uniting the two crowns or else one of his family thus putting the house of bourbon in authority on both sides of the pyrenees was the false light which led louis astray during the rest of his reign to the final destruction of the sea power of france and the impoverishment and misery of his people louis failed to understand that he had to reckon with all europe the direct project on the spanish throne had to wait for a vacancy but he got ready at once to move upon the spanish possessions to the east of france in order to do this more effectually he cut off from spain every possible ally by skilful diplomatic intrigues the study of which would give a useful illustration of strategy in the realm of politics but he made two serious mistakes to the injury of the sea power of france portugal had until twenty years before been united to the crown of spain and the claim to it had not been surrendered louis considered that were spain to regain that kingdom she would be too strong for him easily to carry out his aims among other means of prevention he promoted a marriage between charles the second and the infanta of portugal in consequence of which portugal ceded to england 
bombay in india and tangiers in the straits of gibraltar which was reputed an excellent port we see here a french king in his eagerness for extension by land inviting england to the mediterranean and forwarding her alliance with portugal the latter was the more curious as louis already foresaw the failure of the spanish royal house and should rather have wished the union of the peninsular kingdoms as a matter of fact portugal became a dependent and outpost of england by which she readily landed in the peninsula down to the days of napoleon indeed if independent of spain she is too weak not to be under the control of the power that rules the sea and so has readiest access to her louis continued to support her against spain and secured her independence he also interfered with the dutch and compelled them to restore brazil which they had taken from the portuguese on the other hand louis obtained from charles the second the cession of dunkirk on the channel which had been seized and used by cromwell this surrender was made for money and was inexcusable from the maritime point of view dunkirk was for the english a bridgehead into france to france it became a haven for privateers the bane of england's commerce in the channel and the north sea as the french sea power waned england in treaty after treaty exacted the dismantling of the works of dunkirk which it may be said in passing was the home port of the celebrated jean bar and other great french privateersmen meanwhile the greatest and wisest of louis ministers colbert was diligently building up that system of administration which by increasing and solidly basing the wealth of the state should bring a sure greatness and prosperity than the king's more showy enterprises with those details that concern the internal development of the kingdom this history has no concern beyond the incidental mention that production both agricultural and manufacturing received his careful attention but upon the sea a policy of skilful aggression upon the shipping and commerce of the dutch and english quickly began and was instantly resented great trading companies were formed directing french enterprise to the baltic to the levant to the east and west indies customs regulations were amended to encourage french manufactures and to allow goods to be stored in bond in the great ports by which means it was hoped to make france take holland's place as the great warehouse for europe a function for which her geographical position eminently fitted her while tonnage duties on foreign shipping direct premiums on home-built ships and careful rigorous colonial decrees giving french vessels the monopoly of trade to and from the colonies combined to encourage the growth of her mercantile marine england retaliated at once the dutch more seriously threatened because their carrying trade was greater and their home resources smaller only remonstrated for a time but after three years they also made reprisals colbert relying on the great superiority of france as an actual and still more as a possible producer feared not to move steadily on the grasping path marked out which in building up a great merchant shipping would lay the broad base for the military shipping which was being yet more rapidly forced on by the measures of the state prosperity grew apace at the end of twelve years everything was flourishing everything rich in the state which was in utter confusion when he took charge of the finances and marine under him says a french historian france grew by peace as she had grown by war the warfare of tariffs and premiums skilfully conducted by him tended to reduce within just limits the exorbitant growth of commercial and maritime power which holland had arrogated at the expense of other nations and to restrain england which was burning to wrest this supremacy from holland in order to use it in a manner much more dangerous to europe the interest of france seemed to be peace in europe and america a mysterious voice at once the voice of the past and of the future called for her warlike activity on other shores this voice found expression through the mouth of leibnitz one of the world's great men who pointed out to louis that to turn the arms of france against egypt would give her in the dominion of the mediterranean and the control of eastern trade a victory over holland greater than the most successful campaign on land and while ensuring a much-needed peace within his kingdom would build up a power on the sea that would ensure preponderance in europe 
this memorial called louis from the pursuit of glory on the land to seek the durable grandeur of france in the possession of a great sea-power the elements of which thanks to the genius of colbert he had in his hands a century later a greater man than louis sought to exalt himself and france by the path pointed out by leibnitz but napoleon did not have as louis had a navy equal to the task proposed this project of leibnitz will be more fully referred to when the narrative reaches the momentous date at which it was broached when louis with his kingdom and navy in the highest pitch of efficiency stood at the point where the roads parted and then took the one which settled that france should not be the power of the sea this decision which killed colbert and ruined the prosperity of france was felt in its consequences from generation to generation afterward as the great navy of england in war after war swept the seas ensured the growing wealth of the island kingdom through exhausting strifes while drying up the external resources of french trade and inflicting consequent misery the false line of policy that began with louis the fourteenth also turned france away from a promising career in india in the days of his successor End of chapter two part one chapter two part two of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain meanwhile the two maritime states england and holland though eyeing france distrustfully had greater and growing grudges against each other which under the fostering care of charles the second led to war the true cause was doubtless commercial jealousy and the conflict sprang immediately from collisions between the trading companies hostilities began on the west coast of africa and an english squadron in sixteen sixty four after subduing several dutch stations there sailed to new amsterdam now new york and seized it all these affairs took place before the formal declaration of war in february sixteen sixty five this war was undoubtedly popular in england the instinct of the people found an expression by the lips of monk who is reported to have said what matters this or that reason what we want is more of the trade which the dutch now have there is also little room to doubt that despite the pretensions of the trading companies the government of the united provinces would gladly have avoided the war the able man who was at their head saw too clearly the delicate position in which they stood between england and france they claimed however the support of the latter in virtue of a defensive treaty made in sixteen sixty two louis allowed the claim but unwillingly and the still young navy of france gave practically no help the war between the two sea states was wholly maritime and had the general characteristics of all such wars three great battles were fought the first off lowestoft on the norfolk coast june thirteenth sixteen sixty five the second known as the four days battle in the straits of dover often spoken of by french writers as that of the pas de calais lasting from the eleventh to the fourteenth of june sixteen sixty six and the third off the north foreland august four of the same year in the first and last of these the english had a decided success in the second the advantage remained with the dutch this one only will be described at length because of it alone has been found such a full coherent account as will allow a clear and accurate tactical narrative to be given there are in these fights points of interest more generally applicable to the present day than are the details of somewhat obsolete tactical movements in the first battle off lowestoft it appears that the dutch commander opdem who was not a seaman but a cavalry officer had very positive orders to fight the discretion proper to a commander-in-chief on the spot was not entrusted to him to interfere thus with the commander in the field or afloat is one of the most common temptations to the government in the cabinet and is generally disastrous 
tourville the greatest of louis XIV's admirals was forced thus to risk the whole french navy against his own judgment and a century later a great french fleet escaped from the english admiral keith through his obedience to imperative orders from his immediate superior who was sick in port in the lowestoft fight the dutch van gave way and a little later one of the junior admirals of the centre optum's own squadron being killed the crew was seized with a panic took the command of the ship from her officers and carried her out of action this movement was followed by twelve or thirteen other ships leaving a great gap in the dutch line the occurrence shows what has before been pointed out that the discipline of the dutch fleet and the tone of the officers were not high despite the fine fighting qualities of the nation and although it is probably true that there were more good seamen among the dutch than among the english captains the natural steadfastness and heroism of the hollanders could not wholly supply that professional pride and sense of military honor which it is the object of sound military institutions to encourage popular feeling in the united states is pretty much at sea in this matter there is with it no intermediate step between personal courage with a gun in its hand and entire military efficiency optum seeing the battle going against him seems to have yielded to a feeling approaching despair he sought to grapple the english commander-in-chief who on this day was the duke of york the king's brother he failed in this and in the desperate struggle which followed his ship blew up shortly after three or as one account says four dutch ships ran foul of one another and this group was burned by one fire-ship three or four others singly met the same fate a little later the dutch fleet was now in disorder and retreated under cover of the squadron of van tromp son of the famous old admiral who in the days of the commonwealth sailed through the channel with a broom at his masthead fire-ships are seen here to have played a very conspicuous part more so certainly than in the war of sixteen fifty three though at both periods they formed an appendage to the fleet there is on the surface an evident resemblance between the role of the fire-ship and the part assigned in modern warfare to the torpedo cruiser the terrible character of the attack the comparative smallness of the vessel making it and the large demands upon the nerve of the assailant are the chief points of resemblance the great points of difference are the comparative certainty with which the modern vessel can be handled which is partly met by the same advantage in the ironclad over the old ship of the line and the instantaneousness of the injury by torpedo whose attack fails or succeeds at once whereas that of the fire-ship required time for effecting the object which in both cases is total destruction of the hostile ship instead of crippling or otherwise reducing it an appreciation of the character of fire-ships of the circumstances under which they attained their greatest usefulness and of the causes which led to their disappearance may perhaps help in the decision to which nations must come as to whether the torpedo cruiser pure and simple is a type of weapon destined to survive in fleets a french officer who has been examining the records of the french navy states that the fire-ship first appears incorporated as an arm of the fleet in sixteen thirty six whether specially built for the purpose or whether altered from other purposes to be fitted for their particular end they received a special equipment the command was given to officers not noble with the grade of captain of fire-ship five subordinate officers and twenty-five seamen made up the crew easily known by grappling irons which were always fitted to their yards the fire-ship saw its role growing less in the early years of the eighteenth century it was finally to disappear from the fleets whose speed it delayed and whose evolutions were by it complicated as the ships of war grew larger their action in concert with fire-ships became daily more difficult on the other hand there had already been abandoned the idea of combining them with the fighting ships to form a few groups 
each provided with all the means of attack and defence the formation of the close-hauled line of battle by assigning the fire-ships a place in a second line placed half a league on the side farthest from the enemy made them more and more unfitted to fulfil their office the official plan of the battle of malaga seventeen o four drawn up immediately after the battle shows the fire-ship in this position as laid down by paul host finally the use of shells enabling ships to be set on fire more surely and quickly and introduced on board at the period of which we are now treating though the general use did not obtain until much later was the last blow to the fire-ship those who are familiar with the theories and discussions of our own day on the subject of fleet tactics and weapons will recognize in this short notice of a long obsolete type certain ideas which are not obsolete the fire-ship disappeared from fleets whose speed it delayed in heavy weather small bulk must always mean comparatively small speed in a moderate sea we are now told the speed of the torpedo boat falls from twenty knots to fifteen or less and the seventeen to nineteen knot cruiser can either run away from the pursuing boats or else hold them at a distance under fire of machine and heavy guns these boats are sea-going and it is thought can keep the sea in all weathers but to be on board a one hundred and ten foot torpedo boat when the sea is lively is said to be far from agreeable the heat noise and rapid vibrations of the engines are intense cooking seems to be out of the question and it is said that if food were well cooked few would be able to appreciate it to obtain necessary rest under these conditions added to the rapid motions of the boat is most difficult larger boats are to be built but the factor of loss of speed in rough weather will remain unless the size of the torpedo cruiser is increased to a point that will certainly lead to fitting them with something more than torpedoes like fire ships small torpedo cruisers will delay the speed and complicate the evolutions of the fleet with which they are associated the disappearance of the fire ship was also hastened we are told by the introduction of shell firing or incendiary projectiles and it is not improbable that for deep-sea fighting the transfer of the torpedo to a class of larger ships will put an end to the mere torpedo cruiser the fire ship continued to be used against fleets at anchor down to the days of the american civil war and the torpedo boat will always be useful within an easy distance of its port a third phase of naval practice two hundred years ago mentioned in the extract quoted involves an idea very familiar to modern discussions namely the group formation the idea of combining fire ships with the fighting ships to form a few groups each provided with all the means of attack and defence was for a time embraced for we are told that it was later on abandoned the combining of the ships of a fleet into groups of two three or four meant to act specially together is now largely favoured in england less so in france where it meets strong opposition no question of this sort ably advocated on either side is to be settled by one man's judgment nor until time and experience have applied their infallible tests it may be remarked however that in a well-organized fleet there are two degrees of command which are in themselves both natural and necessary that can be neither done away nor ignored these are the command of the whole fleet as one unit and the command of each ship as a unit in itself when a fleet becomes too large to be handled by one man it must be subdivided and in the heat of action become practically two fleets acting to one common end as nelson in his noble order at trafalgar said the second in command will after my intentions are made known to him mark the force of the after which so well protects the functions both of the commander-in-chief and the second have the entire direction of his line to make the attack upon the enemy and to follow up the blow until they are captured or destroyed 
the size and cost of the individual ironclad of the present day makes it unlikely that fleets will be so numerous as to require subdivision but whether they are or not does not affect the decision of the group question looking simply to the principle underlying the theory and disregarding the seeming tactical clumsiness of the special groups proposed the question is shall there be introduced between the natural commands of the admiral and of the captains of the individual ships a third artificial contrivance which on the one hand will in effect partly supersede the supreme authority and on the other will partly fetter the discretion of commanders of ships a further difficulty springing from the narrow principle of support specially due to particular ships on which the group system rests is this that when signals can no longer be seen the duty of the captain to his own ship and to the fleet at large will be complicated by his duty to observe certain relations to particular ships which particular ships must in time come to have undue prominence in his views the group formation had its day of trial in old times and disappeared before the test of experience whether in its restored form it will survive time will show it may be said before quitting the subject that as an order of sailing corresponding to the root step of an army in march a loose group formation has some advantages maintaining some order without requiring that rigid exactness of position to observe which by day and night must be a severe strain on captain and deck officers such a root order should not however be permitted until a fleet has reached high tactical precision to return to the question of fire ships and torpedo boats the role of the latter it is often said is to be found in that melee which is always to succeed a couple of headlong passes between the opposing fleets in the smoke and confusion of that hour is the opportunity of the torpedo boat this certainly sounds plausible and the torpedo vessel certainly has a power of movement not possessed by the fire-ship a melee of the two fleets however was not the condition most favourable for the fire-ship i shall quote here from another french officer whose discussion of these anglo-dutch sea fights in a late periodical is singularly clear and suggestive he says far from impeding the direct action of the fire-ship which was not or nearly so during the confused battles of the war of sixteen fifty two the regularity and ensemble newly attained in the movements of squadrons seem rather to favour it the fire-ships played a very important part at the battles of lowestoft pas de calais and the north foreland thanks to the good order preserved by the ships of the line these incendiary ships can indeed be better protected by the artillery much more efficiently directed than before toward a distinct and determined end in the midst of the confused melees of sixteen fifty two the fire-ship acted so to speak alone seeking by chance an enemy to grapple running the risk of a mistake without protection against the guns of the enemy nearly sure to be sunk by him or else burned uselessly all now in sixteen sixty five has become different its prey is clearly pointed out it knows it follows it easily into the relatively fixed position had by it in the enemy's line on the other hand the ships of his own division do not lose sight of the fire-ship they accompany it as far as possible cover it with their artillery to the end of its course and disengage it before burning if the fruitlessness of the attempt is seen soon enough evidently under such conditions its action always uncertain it cannot be otherwise nevertheless acquires greater chances of success these instructive comments need perhaps the qualifying or additional remark that confusion in the enemy's order at the time that your own remains good gives the best opening for a desperate attack the writer goes on to trace the disappearance of the fire-ship here then we see the fire-ship at the point of its highest importance that importance will decrease the fire-ship itself will end by disappearing from engagements in the open sea 
when naval artillery becoming more perfect shall have greater range be more accurate and more rapid when ships receiving better forms greater steering power more extensive and better balanced sail power shall be able thanks to quicker speed and handling to avoid almost certainly the fire ships sent against them when finally fleets led on principles of tactics as skilful as they were timid a tactics which will predominate a century later during the whole war of american independence when these fleets in order not to jeopardize the perfect regularity of their order of battle will avoid coming to close quarters and will leave to the cannon alone to decide the fate of an action in this discussion the writer has in view the leading feature which while aiding the action of the fire-ship also gives this war of sixteen sixty five its peculiar interest in the history of naval tactics in it is found for the first time the close-hauled line of battle undeniably adopted as the fighting order of the fleets it is plain enough that when those fleets numbered as they often did from eighty to a hundred ships such lines would be very imperfectly formed in every essential both of line and interval but the general aim is evident amid whatever imperfections of execution the credit for this development is generally given to the duke of york afterward james the second but the question to whom the improvement is due is of little importance to see officers of the present day when compared with the instructive fact that so long a time elapsed between the appearance of the large sailing ship with its broadside battery and the systematic adoption of the order which was best adapted to develop the full power of the fleet for mutual support to us having the elements of the problem in our hands together with the result finally reached that result seemed simple enough almost self-evident why did it take so long for the capable men of that day to reach it the reason and herein lies the lesson for the officer of to-day was doubtless the same that leaves the order of battle so uncertain now namely that the necessity of war did not force men to make up their minds until the dutch at last met in the english their equals on the sea the sequence of ideas which resulted in the line of battle is clear and logical though familiar enough to seamen it will be here stated in the words of the writer last quoted because they have a neatness and precision entirely french with the increase of power of the ship of war and with the perfecting of its sea and warlike qualities there has come an equal progress in the art of utilizing them as naval evolutions become more skilful their importance grows from day to day to these evolutions there is needed a base a point from which they depart and to which they return a fleet of warships must be always ready to meet an enemy logically therefore this point of departure for naval evolutions must be the order of battle now since the disappearance of galleys almost all the artillery is found upon the sides of a ship of war hence it is the beam that must necessarily and always be turned toward the enemy on the other hand it is necessary that the sight of the latter must never be interrupted by a friendly ship only one formation allows the ships of the same fleet to satisfy fully these conditions that formation is the line ahead column this line therefore is imposed as the only order of battle and consequently as the basis of all fleet tactics in order that this order of battle this long thin line of guns may not be injured or broken at some point weaker than the rest there is at the same time felt the necessity of putting in it only ships which if not of equal force have at least equally strong sides logically it follows at the same moment in which the line ahead became definitively the order for battle there was established the distinction between the ships of the line alone destined for a place therein and the lighter ships meant for other uses if to these we add the considerations which led to making the line of battle a close hauled line we have the problem fully worked out but the chain of reasoning was as clear two hundred and fifty years ago as it is now why then was it so long in being worked out partly no doubt because old traditions in those days 
traditions of galley fighting had hold of and confused men's minds chiefly because men are too indolent to seek out the foundation truths of the situation in their day and develop the true theory of action from its base up as a rare instance of clear-sightedness recognizing such a fundamental change in conditions and predicting results words of admiral la brousse of the french navy written in eighteen forty are most instructive thanks to steam he wrote ships will be able to move in any direction with such speed that the effects of collision may and indeed must as they formerly did take the place of projectile weapons and annul the calculations of the skilful manoeuvre the ram will be favourable to speed without destroying the nautical qualities of a ship as soon as one power shall have adopted this terrible weapon all others must accept it under pain of evident inferiority and thus combats will become combats of ram against ram while forbearing the unconditional adhesion to the ram as the controlling weapon of the day which the french navy has yielded the above brief argument may well be taken as an instance of the way in which researches into the order of battle of the future should be worked out a french writer commenting on la brousse's paper says twenty-seven years were scarce enough for our fathers counting from sixteen thirty eight the date of building the Kuran to sixteen sixty five to pass from the tactical order of the line abreast the order for galleys to that of the line ahead we ourselves needed twenty-nine years from eighteen thirty when the first steamship was brought into our fleet to eighteen fifty nine when the application of the principle of ram fighting was affirmed by laying down the sol farino and the magenta to work a revolution in the contrary direction so true it is that truth is always slow in getting to the light this transformation was not sudden not only because the new material required time to be built and armed but above all it is sad to say because the necessary consequences of the new motive power escaped most minds we come now to the justly celebrated four days battle of june sixteen sixty six which claims special notice not only on account of the great number of ships engaged on either side nor yet only for the extraordinary physical endurance of the men who kept up a hot naval action for so many successive days but also because the commanders-in-chief on either side monk and de Ruyte, were the most distinguished seamen or rather sea commanders brought forth by their respective countries in the seventeenth century monk was possibly inferior to blake in the annals of the english navy but there is a general agreement that de Ruyte is the foremost figure not only in the dutch service but among all the naval officers of that age the account about to be given is mainly taken from a recent number of the revue maritain a colonial and is there published as a letter recently discovered from a dutch gentleman serving as a volunteer on board de ruite's ship to a friend in france the narrative is delightfully clear and probable qualities not generally found in the description of those long ago fights and the satisfaction it gave was increased by finding in the memoirs of the count de guiche who also served as volunteer in the fleet and was taken to de ruite after his own vessel had been destroyed by a fire-ship an account confirming the former in its principal details this additional pleasure was unhappily marred by recognizing certain phrases as common to both stories and a comparison showed that the two could not be accepted as independent narratives there are however points of internal difference which make it possible that the two accounts are by different eye-witnesses who compared and corrected their versions before sending them out to their friends or writing them in their journals the numbers of the two fleets were english about eighty ships the dutch about one hundred but the inequality in numbers was largely compensated by the greater size of many of the english a great strategic blunder by the government in london immediately preceded the fight the king was informed that a french squadron was on its way from the atlantic to join the dutch 
he had once divided his fleet sending twenty ships under prince rupert to the westward to meet the french while the remainder under monk were to go east and oppose the dutch a position like that of the english fleet threatened with an attack from two quarters presents one of the subtlest temptations to a commander the impulse is very strong to meet both by dividing his own numbers as charles did but unless in possession of overwhelming force it is an error exposing both divisions to be beaten separately which as we are about to see actually happened in this case the result of the first two days was disastrous to the larger english division under monk which was then obliged to retreat toward rupert and probably the opportune return of the latter alone saved the english fleet from a very serious loss or at the least from being shut up in their own ports a hundred and forty years later in the exciting game of strategy that was played in the bay of biscay before trafalgar the english admiral cornwallis made precisely the same blunder dividing his fleet into two equal parts out of supporting distance which napoleon at the time characterized as a glaring piece of stupidity the lesson is the same in all ages the dutch had sailed for the english coast with a fair easterly wind but it changed later to south-west with thick weather and freshened so that de ruite to avoid being driven too far came to anchor between dunkirk and the downs the fleet then rode with its head to the south-south-west and the van on the right while tromp who commanded the rear division in the natural order was on the left for some cause this left was most to windward the centre squadron under ruite being to leeward and the right or van to leeward again of the centre this was the position of the dutch fleet at daylight of june eleventh sixteen sixty six and although not expressly so stated it is likely from the whole tenor of the narratives that it was not in good order the same morning monk who was also at anchor made out the dutch fleet to leeward and although so inferior in numbers determined to attack at once hoping that by keeping the advantage of the wind he would be able to commit himself only so far as might seem best he therefore stood along the dutch line on the starboard tack leaving the right and centre out of cannon shot until he came abreast of the left tromp's squadron monk then had thirty-five ships well in hand but the rear had opened and was straggling as is apt to be the case with long columns with the thirty-five he then put his helm up and ran down for tromp whose squadron cut their cables and made sail on the same tack the two engaged lines thus standing over toward the french coast and the breeze heeling the ships so that the english could not use their lower deck guns the dutch centre and rear also cut and followed the movement but being so far to leeward could not for some time come into action it was during this time that a large dutch ship becoming separated from her own fleet was set on fire and burned doubtless the ship in which was count de guiche as they drew near dunkirk the english went about probably altogether for in the return to the northward and westward the proper english van fell in with and was roughly handled by the dutch centre under ruite himself this fate would be more likely to befall the rear and indicates that a simultaneous movement had reversed the order the engaged ships had naturally lost to leeward thus enabling ruite to fetch up with them two english flagships were here disabled and cut off one the swiftsure hauled down her colours after the admiral a young man of only twenty-seven was killed highly to be admired says a contemporary writer was the resolution of vice-admiral barclay who though cut off from the line surrounded by enemies great numbers of his men killed his ship disabled and boarded on all sides yet continued fighting almost alone killed several with his own hand and would accept no quarter till at length being shot in the throat with a musket-ball he retired into the captain's cabin where he was found dead extended at his full length upon a table and almost covered with his own blood quite as heroic but more fortunate in its issue was the conduct of the other english admiral thus cut off and the incidents of his struggle though not specially instructive otherwise are worth quoting as giving a lively picture of the scenes which passed in the heat of the contests of those days and afford colouring to otherwise dry details 
being in a short time completely disabled one of the enemy's fire-ships grappled him on the starboard quarter he was however freed by the almost incredible exertions of his lieutenant who having in the midst of the flames loosed the grappling iron swung back on board his own ship unhurt the dutch bent on the destruction of this unfortunate ship sent a second which grappled her on the larboard side and with greater success than the former for the sails instantly taking fire the crew were so terrified that nearly fifty of them jumped overboard the admiral sir john harmon seeing this confusion ran with his sword drawn among those who remained and threatened with instant death the first man who should attempt to quit the ship or should not exert himself to quench the flames the crew then returned to their duty and got the fire under but the rigging being a good deal burned one of the topsail yards fell and broke sir john's leg in the midst of this accumulated distress a third fire-ship prepared to grapple him but was sunk by the guns before she could effect her purpose the dutch vice-admiral avertsen now bore down to him and offered quarter but sir john replied no no it has not come to that yet and giving him a broadside killed the dutch commander after which the other enemies sheered off it is therefore not surprising that the account we have been following reported two english flagships lost one by a fire-ship the english chief still continued on the port tack and says the writer as night fell we could see him proudly leading his line past the squadron of north holland and zealand the actual rear but proper van which from noon up to that time had not been able to reach the enemy from their leewardly position the merit of monk's attack as a piece of grand tactics is evident and bears a strong resemblance to that of nelson at the nile discerning quickly the weakness of the dutch order he had attacked a vastly superior force in such a way that only part of it could come into action and though the english actually lost more heavily they carried off a brilliant prestige and must have left considerable depression and heart burning among the dutch the eye-witness goes on the affair continued until ten p m friends and foes mixed together and as likely to receive injury from one as from the other it will be remarked that the success of the day and the misfortunes of the english came from their being too much scattered too extended in their line but for which we could never have cut off a corner of them as we did the mistake of monk was in not keeping his ships better together that is closed up the remark is just the criticism scarcely so the opening out of the line was almost unavoidable in so long a column of sailing ships and was one of the chances taken by monk when he offered battle the english stood off on the port tack to the west or west northwest and next day returned to the fight the dutch were now on the port tack in natural order the right leading and were to windward but the enemy being more weatherly and better disciplined soon gained the advantage of the wind the english this day had forty-four ships in action the dutch about eighty many of the english as before said larger the two fleets passed on opposite tacks the english to windward but tromp in the rear seeing that the dutch order of battle was badly formed the ships in two or three lines overlapping and so masking each other's fire went about and gained to windward of the enemy's van which he was able to do from the length of the line and because the english running parallel to the dutch order were off the wind at this moment two flag officers of the dutch van kept broad off presenting their sterns to the english ruite greatly astonished tried to stop them but in vain and therefore felt obliged to imitate the manoeuvre in order to keep his squadron together but he did so with some order keeping some ships around him and was joined by one of the van ships disgusted with the conduct of his immediate superior tromp was now in great danger separated by his own act first and then by the conduct of the van from his own fleet by the english and would have been destroyed but for ruite who seeing the urgency of the case hauled up for him the van and centre thus standing back for the rear on the opposite tack to that on which they entered action this prevented the english from keeping up the attack on tromp lest ruite should gain the wind of them which they could not afford to yield because of their very inferior numbers 
both the action of tromp and that of the junior flag officers in the van though showing very different degrees of warlike ardor bring out strongly the lack of subordination and of military feeling which has been charged against the dutch officers as a body no signs of which appear among the english at this time how keenly ruiter felt the conduct of his lieutenants was manifested when tromp immediately after this partial action went on board his flagship the seamen cheered him but ruiter said this is no time for rejoicing but rather for tears indeed our position was bad each squadron acting differently in no line and all the ships huddled together like a flock of sheep so packed that the english might have surrounded all of them with their forty ships the english were in admirable order but did not push their advantage as they should whatever the reason the reason no doubt was the same that often prevented sailing ships from pressing an advantage disability from crippled spars and rigging added to the inexpediency of such inferior numbers risking a decisive action ruiter was thus able to draw his fleet out into line again although much maltreated by the english and the two fleets passed again on opposite tacks the dutch to leeward and ruiter's ship the last in his column as he passed the english rear he lost his main top mast and mainyard after another partial rencounter the english drew away to the northwest toward their own shores the dutch following them the wind being still from southwest but light the english were now fairly in retreat and the pursuit continued all night ruiter's own ship dropping out of sight in the rear from her crippled state the third day monk continued retreating to the westward he burned by the english accounts three disabled ships sent ahead those that were most crippled and himself brought up the rear with those that were in fighting condition which are variously stated again by the english at twenty-eight and sixteen in number one of the largest and finest of the english fleet the royal prince of ninety guns ran aground on the galloper shoal and was taken by tromp but monk's retreat was so steady and orderly that he was otherwise unmolested this shows that the dutch had suffered very severely toward evening rupert's squadron was seen and all the ships of the english fleet except those crippled in action were at last united the next day the wind came out again very fresh from the southwest giving the dutch the weather gauge the english instead of attempting to pass upon opposite tacks came up from astern relying upon the speed and handiness of their ships so doing the battle engaged all along the line on the port tack the english to leeward the dutch fire ships were badly handled and did no harm whereas the english burned two of their enemies the two fleets ran on thus exchanging broadsides for two hours at the end of which time the bulk of the english fleet had passed through the dutch line all regularity of order was henceforward lost at this moment says the eye-witness the lookout was extraordinary for all were separated the english as well as we but luck would have it that the largest of our fractions surrounding the admiral remained to windward and the largest fraction of the english also with their admiral remained to leeward this was the cause of our victory and their ruin our admiral had with him thirty-five or forty ships of his own and of other squadrons for the squadrons were scattered and order much lost the rest of the dutch ships had left him the leader of the van van ness had gone off with fourteen ships in chase of three or four english ships which under a press of sail had gained to windward of the dutch van van tromp with the rear squadron had fallen to leeward and so had to keep on to leeward of ruiter and the english main body after van ness in order to rejoin the admiral by passing round the english centre de ruiter and the english main body kept up a sharp action beating to windward all the time tromp having carried sail overtook van ness and returned bringing the van back with him but owing to the constant plying to windward of the english main body he came up to leeward of it and could not rejoin ruiter who was to windward ruiter seeing this made signal to the ships around him and the main body of the dutch kept away before the wind which was then very strong thus in less than no time we found ourselves in the midst of the english who being attacked on both sides were thrown into confusion and saw their whole order destroyed as well by dint of the action as by the strong wind that was then blowing this was the hottest of the fight we saw the high admiral of england separated from his fleet followed only by one fire ship with that he gained to windward and passing through the north holland squadron placed himself again at the head of fifteen or twenty ships that rallied to him 
thus ended this great sea fight the most remarkable in some of its aspects that has ever been fought upon the ocean amid conflicting reports it is not possible to do more than estimate the results a fairly impartial account says the states lost in these actions three vice-admirals two thousand men and four ships the loss of the english was five thousand killed and three thousand prisoners and they lost besides seventeen ships of which nine remained in the hands of the victors there is no doubt that the english had much the worst of it and that this was owing wholly to the original blunder of weakening the fleet by a great detachment sent in another direction great detachments are sometimes necessary evils but in this case no necessity existed granting the approach of the french the proper course for the english was to fall with their whole fleet upon the dutch before their allies could come up this lesson is as applicable to-day as it ever was a second lesson likewise of present application is the necessity of sound military institutions for implanting correct military feeling pride and discipline great as was the first blunder of the english and serious as was the disaster there can be no doubt that the consequences would have been much worse but for the high spirit and skill with which the plans of monk were carried out by his subordinates and the lack of similar support to ruite on the part of the dutch subalterns in the movements of the english we hear nothing of two juniors turning tail at a critical moment nor of a third with misdirected ardor getting on the wrong side of the enemy's fleet their drill also their tactical precision was remarked even then the frenchman de guiche after witnessing this four days fight wrote nothing equals the beautiful order of the english at sea never was a line drawn straighter than that formed by their ships thus they bring all their fire to bear upon those who draw near them they fight like a line of cavalry which is handled according to rule and applies itself solely to force back those who oppose whereas the dutch advance like cavalry whose squadrons leave their ranks and come separately to the charge the dutch government averse to expense unmilitary in its tone and incautious from long and easy victory over the degenerate navy of spain had allowed its fleet to sink into a mere assembly of armed merchantmen things were at their worst in the days of cromwell taught by the severe lessons of that war the united provinces under an able ruler had done much to mend matters but full efficiency had not yet been gained in sixteen sixty six as in sixteen fifty three says a french naval writer the fortune of war seemed to lean to the side of the english of the three great battles fought two were decided victories and the third though adverse had but increased the glory of her seamen this was due to the intelligent boldness of monk and rupert the talents of part of the admirals and captains and the skill of the seamen and soldiers under them the wise and vigorous efforts made by the government of the united provinces and the undeniable superiority of ruite in experience and genius over any one of his opponents could not compensate for the weakness or incapacity of part of the dutch officers and the manifest inferiority of the men under their orders england as has been said before still felt the impress of cromwell's iron hand upon her military institutions but that impress was growing weaker before the next dutch war monk was dead and was poorly replaced by the cavalier rupert court extravagance cut down the equipment of the navy as did the burgomaster's parsimony and court corruption undermined discipline as surely as commercial indifference the effect was evident when the fleets of the two countries met again six years later End of chapter two, part two. Chapter two, part three of the influence of sea power upon history, sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three, by Alfred Thayer Mahan. This liberal box recording is in the public domain there was one well-known feature of all the military navies of that day which calls for a passing comment for its correct bearing and value is not always perhaps not generally seen the command of fleets and of single vessels was often given to soldiers to military men unaccustomed to the sea and ignorant how to handle the ship that duty being entrusted to another class of officer looking closely into the facts it is seen that this made a clean division between the direction of the fighting and of the motive power of the ship this is the essence of the matter and the principle is the same whatever the motive power may be 
the inconvenience and inefficiency of such a system was obvious then as it is now and the logic of facts gradually threw the two functions into the hands of one corps of officers the result being the modern naval officer as that term is generally understood unfortunately in this process of blending the less important function was allowed to get the upper hand the naval officer came to feel more proud of his dexterity in managing the motive power of his ship than of his skill in developing her military efficiency the bad effects of this lack of interest in military science became most evident when the point of handling fleets was reached because for that military skill told most and previous study was most necessary but it was felt in the single ship as well hence it came to pass and especially in the english navy that the pride of the seaman took the place of the pride of the military man the english naval officer thought more of that which likened him to the merchant captain than of that which made him akin to the soldier in the french navy this result was less general owing probably to the more military spirit of the government and especially of the nobility to whom the rank of officer was reserved it was not possible that men whose whole association was military all of whose friends looked upon arms as the one career for a gentleman could think more of the sails and rigging than of the guns or the fleet the english corps of officers was of different origin there was more than the writer thought in macaulay's well-known saying there were seamen and there were gentlemen in the navy of charles the second but the seamen were not gentlemen and the gentlemen were not seamen the trouble was not in the absence or presence of gentlemen as such but in the fact that under the conditions of that day the gentleman was pre-eminently the military element of society and that the seamen after the dutch wars gradually edged the gentleman and with him the military tone and spirit as distinguished from simple courage out of the service even such men of family as herbert and russell william the third's admirals says the biographer of lord hawke were sailors indeed but only able to hold their own by adopting the boisterous manners of the hardy tarpaulin the same national traits which made the french inferior as seamen made them superior as military men not in courage but in skill to this day the same tendency obtains the direction of the motive power has no such consideration as the military functions in the navies of the latin nations the studious and systematic side of the french character also inclined the french officer when not a trifler to consider and develop tactical questions in a logical manner to prepare himself to handle fleets not merely as a seaman but as a military man the result showed in the american revolutionary war that despite a mournful history of governmental neglect men who were first of all military men inferior though they were in opportunities as seamen to their enemies could meet them on more than equal terms as to tactical skill and were practically their superiors in handling fleets the false theory has already been pointed out which directed the action of the french fleet not to crushing its enemy but to some ulterior aim but this does not affect the fact that in tactical skill the military men were superior to the mere seamen though their tactical skill was applied to mistaken strategic ends the source whence the dutch mainly drew their officers does not certainly appear for while the english naval historian in sixteen sixty six says that most of the captains of their fleet were sons of rich burgomasters placed there for political reasons by the grand pensionary and without experience duquesne the ablest french admiral of the day comments in sixteen seventy six on the precision and skill of the dutch captains in terms very disparaging to his own it is likely from many indications that they were generally merchant seamen with little original military feeling 
but the severity with which the delinquents were punished both by the state and by popular frenzy seems to have driven these officers who were far from lacking the highest personal courage into a sense of what military loyalty and subordination required they made a very different record in sixteen seventy two from that of sixteen sixty six before finally leaving the four days fight the conclusions of another writer may well be quoted such was that bloody battle of the four days or straits of calais the most memorable sea fight of modern days not indeed by its results but by the aspect of its different phases by the fury of the combatants by the boldness and skill of the leaders and by the new character which it gave to sea warfare more than any other this fight marks clearly the passage from former methods to the tactics of the end of the seventeenth century for the first time we can follow as though traced upon a plan the principal movements of the contending fleets it seems quite clear that to the dutch as well as to the british have been given a tactical book and a code of signals or at the least written instructions extensive and precise to serve instead of such a code we feel that each admiral now has his squadron in hand and that even the commander-in-chief disposes at his will during the fight of the various subdivisions of his fleet compare this action with those of sixteen fifty two and one plain fact stares you in the face that between the two dates naval tactics have undergone a revolution such were the changes that distinguished the war of sixteen sixty five from that of sixteen fifty two as in the latter epoch the admiral still thinks the weather gauge an advantage for his fleet but it is no longer from the tactical point of view the principal we might almost say the sole preoccupation now he wishes above all to keep his fleet in good order and compact as long as possible so as to keep the power of combining during the action the movements of the different squadrons look at Rueté at the end of the four days fight with great difficulty he has kept to windward of the english fleet yet he does not hesitate to sacrifice this advantage in order to unite the two parts of his fleet which are separated by the enemy if at the later fight off the north foreland great intervals exist between the dutch squadrons if the rear afterward continues to withdraw from the centre ruite deplores such a fault as the chief cause of his defeat he so deplores it in his official report he even accuses tromp who was his personal enemy of treason or cowardice an unjust accusation but which none the less shows the enormous importance thenceforth attached during the action to the reunion of the fleet into a whole strictly and regularly maintained this commentary is justified in so far as it points out general aims and tendencies but the results were not as complete as might be inferred from it the english notwithstanding their heavy loss in the four days battle were at sea again within two months much to the surprise of the dutch and on the fourth of august another severe fight was fought off the north foreland ending in the complete defeat of the latter who retired to their own coasts the english followed and effected an entrance into one of the dutch harbours where they destroyed a large fleet of merchantmen as well as a town of some importance toward the end of sixteen sixty six both sides were tired of the war which was doing great harm to trade and weakening both navies to the advantage of the growing sea power of france negotiations looking toward peace were opened but charles the second ill disposed to the united provinces confident that the growing pretensions of louis the fourteenth to the spanish netherlands would break up the existing alliance between holland and france and relying also upon the severe reverses suffered at sea by the dutch was exacting and haughty in his demands to justify and maintain this line of conduct he should have kept up his fleet the prestige of which had been so advanced by its victories instead of that poverty the result of extravagance and of his home policy led him to permit it to decline 
ships in large numbers were laid up and he readily adopted an opinion which chimed in with his penury and which as it has had advocates at all periods of sea history should be noted and condemned here this opinion warmly opposed by monk was that as the dutch were chiefly supported by trade as the supply of their navy depended upon trade and as experience showed nothing provoked the people so much as injuring their trade his majesty should therefore apply himself to this which would effectually humble them at the same time that it would less exhaust the english than fitting out such mighty fleets as had hitherto kept the sea every summer upon these motives the king took a fatal resolution of laying up his great ships and keeping only a few frigates on the cruise in consequence of this economical theory of carrying on a war the grand pensionary of holland de witt who had the year before caused soundings of the thames to be made sent into the river under de Ruyte a force of sixty or seventy ships of the line which on the fourteenth of june sixteen sixty seven went up as high as gravesend destroying ships at chatham and in the medway and taking possession of sheerness the light of the fires could be seen from london and the dutch fleet remained in possession of the mouth of the river until the end of the month under this blow following as it did upon the great plague and the great fire of london charles consented to peace which was signed july thirty one sixteen sixty seven and is known as the peace of breda the most lasting result of the war was the transfer of new york and new jersey to england thus joining her northern and southern colonies in north america before going on again with the general course of the history of the times it will be well to consider for a moment the theory which worked so disastrously for england in sixteen sixty seven that namely of maintaining a sea war mainly by preying upon the enemy's commerce this plan which involves only the maintenance of a few swift cruisers and can be backed by the spirit of greed in a nation fitting out privateers without direct expense to the state possesses the specious attractions which economy always presents the great injury done to the wealth and prosperity of the enemy is also undeniable and although to some extent his merchant ships can shelter themselves ignobly under a foreign flag while the war lasts this guerre de course as the french call it this commerce destroying to use our own phrase must if in itself successful greatly embarrass the foreign government and distress its people such a war however cannot stand alone it must be supported to use the military phrase unsubstantial and evanescent in itself it cannot reach far from its base that base must be either home ports or else some solid outpost of the national power on the shore or the sea a distant dependency or a powerful fleet failing such support the cruiser can only dash out hurriedly a short distance from home and its blows though painful cannot be fatal it was not the policy of sixteen sixty seven but cromwell's powerful fleets of ships of the line in sixteen fifty two that shut the dutch merchantmen in their ports and caused the grass to grow in the streets of amsterdam when instructed by the suffering of that time the dutch kept large fleets afloat through two exhausting wars though their commerce suffered greatly they bore up the burden of the strife against england and france united forty years later louis the fourteenth was driven by exhaustion to the policy adopted by charles the second through parsimony then were the days of the great french privateers jean bart forbin duguay truin ducasse and others the regular fleets of the french navy were practically withdrawn from the ocean during the great war of the spanish succession seventeen o two to seventeen twelve the french naval historian says unable to renew the naval armaments louis the fourteenth increased the number of cruisers upon the more frequented seas especially the channel and the german ocean not far from home it will be noticed 
in these different spots the cruisers were always in a position to intercept or hinder the movements of transports laden with troops and of the numerous convoys carrying supplies of all kinds in these seas in the centre of the commercial and political world there is always work for cruisers notwithstanding the difficulties they met owing to the absence of large friendly fleets they served advantageously the cause of the two peoples french and spanish these cruisers in the face of the anglo-dutch power needed good luck boldness and skill these three conditions were not lacking to our seamen but then what chiefs and what captains they had the english historian on the other hand while admitting how severely the people and commerce of england suffered from the cruisers bitterly reflecting at times upon the administration yet refers over and over again to the increasing prosperity of the whole country and especially of its commercial part in the preceding war on the contrary from sixteen eighty nine to sixteen ninety seven when france sent great fleets to sea and disputed the supremacy of the ocean how different the result the same english writer says of that time with respect to our trade it is certain that we suffered infinitely more not merely than the french for that was to be expected from the greater number of our merchant ships but than we ever did in any former war this proceeded in great measure from the vigilance of the french who carried on the war in a piratical way it is out of all doubt that taking all together our traffic suffered excessively our merchants were many of them ruined macaulay says of this period during many months of sixteen ninety three the english trade with the mediterranean had been interrupted almost entirely there was no chance that a merchantman from london or amsterdam would if unprotected reach the pillars of hercules without being boarded by a french privateer and the protection of armed vessels was not easily obtained why because the vessels of england's navy were occupied watching the french navy and this diversion of them from the cruisers and privateers constituted the support which a commerce-destroying war must have a french historian speaking of the same period in england sixteen ninety six says the state of the finances was deplorable money was scarce maritime insurance thirty per cent the navigation act was virtually suspended and the english shipping reduced to the necessity of sailing under the swedish and danish flags half a century later the french government was again reduced by a long neglect of the navy to a cruising warfare with what results first the french historian says from june seventeen fifty six to june seventeen sixty french privateers captured from the english more than twenty five hundred merchantmen in seventeen sixty one though france had not so to speak a single ship of the line at sea and though the english had taken two hundred and forty of our privateers their comrades still took eight hundred and twelve vessels but he goes on to say the prodigious growth of the english shipping explains the number of these prizes in other words the suffering involved to england in such numerous captures which must have caused great individual injury and discontent did not really prevent the growing prosperity of the state and of the community at large the english naval historian speaking of the same period says while the commerce of france was nearly destroyed the trading fleet of england covered the seas every year her commerce was increasing the money which the war carried out was returned by the produce of her industry eight thousand merchant vessels were employed by the english merchants and again summing up the results of the war after stating the immense amount of specie brought into the kingdom by foreign conquests he says the trade of england increased gradually every year and such a scene of national prosperity while waging a long bloody and costly war was never before shown by any people in the world on the other hand the historian of the french navy speaking of an earlier phase of the same wars says the english fleets having nothing to resist them swept the seas our privateers and single cruisers having no fleet to keep down the abundance of their enemies ran short careers 
twenty thousand french seamen lay in english prisons when on the other hand in the war of the american revolution france resumed the policy of colbert and of the early reign of louis the fourteenth and kept large battle fleets afloat the same result again followed as in the days of tourville for the first time says the annual register forgetting or ignorant of the experience of sixteen ninety three and remembering only the glories of the later wars english merchant ships were driven to take refuge under foreign flags finally in quitting this part of the subject it may be remarked that in the island of martinique the french had a powerful distant dependency upon which to base a cruising warfare and during the seven years war as afterward during the first empire it with guadeloupe was the refuge of numerous privateers the records of the english admiralty raise the losses of the english in the west indies during the first years of the seven years war to fourteen hundred merchantmen taken or destroyed the english fleet was therefore directed against the islands both of which fell involving a loss to the trade of france greater than all the depredations of her cruisers on the english commerce besides breaking up the system but in the war of seventeen seventy eight the great fleets protected the islands which were not even threatened at any time so far we have been viewing the effect of a purely cruising warfare not based upon powerful squadrons only upon that particular part of the enemy's strength against which it is theoretically directed upon its commerce and general wealth upon the sinews of war the evidence seems to show that even for its own special ends such a mode of war is inconclusive worrying but not deadly it might almost be said that it causes needless suffering what however is the effect of this policy upon the general ends of the war to which it is one of the means and to which it is subsidiary how again does it react upon the people that practise it as the historical evidences will come up in detail from time to time it need here only be summarized the result to england in the days of charles the second has been seen her coast insulted her shipping burned almost within sight of her capital in the war of the spanish succession when the control of spain was the military object while the french depended upon a cruising war against commerce the navies of england and holland unopposed guarded the coast of the peninsula blocked the port of toulon forced the french succors to cross the pyrenees and by keeping open the sea highway neutralized the geographical nearness of france to the seat of war their fleet seized gibraltar barcelona and Menorca, and cooperating with the austrian army failed by little of reducing toulon in the seven years war the english fleets seized or aided in seizing all the most valuable colonies of france and spain and made frequent descents on the french coast the war of the american revolution affords no lesson the fleets being nearly equal the next most striking instance to americans is the war of eighteen twelve everybody knows how our privateers swarmed over the seas and that from the smallness of our navy the war was essentially indeed solely a cruising war except upon the lakes it is doubtful if more than two of our ships at any time acted together the injury done to english commerce thus unexpectedly attacked by a distant foe which had been undervalued may be fully conceded but on the one hand the american cruisers were powerfully supported by the french fleet which being assembled in larger or smaller bodies in the many ports under the emperor's control from antwerp to venice tied the fleets of england to blockade duty and on the other hand when the fall of the emperor released them our coasts were insulted in every direction the chesapeake entered and controlled its shores wasted the potomac ascended and washington burned the northern frontier was kept in a state of alarm though their squadrons absolutely weak but relatively strong sustained the general defence while in the south the mississippi was entered unopposed and new orleans barely saved when negotiations for peace were opened the bearing of the english toward the american envoys was not that of men who felt their country to be threatened with an unbearable evil 
the late civil war with the cruises of the alabama and sumter and their consorts revived the tradition of commerce destroying in so far as this is one means to a general end and is based upon a navy otherwise powerful it is well but we need not expect to see the feats of those ships repeated in the face of a great sea power in the first place those cruises were powerfully supported by the determination of the united states to blockade not only the chief centres of southern trade but every inlet of the coast thus leaving few ships available for pursuit in the second place had there been ten of those cruisers where there was one they would not have stopped the incursion in southern waters of the union fleet which penetrated to every point accessible from the sea and in the third place the undeniable injury direct and indirect inflicted upon individuals and upon one branch of the nation's industry and how high that shipping industry stands in the writer's estimation need not be repeated did not in the least influence or retard the event of the war such injuries unaccompanied by others are more irritating than weakening on the other hand will any refuse to admit that the work of the great union fleets powerfully modified and hastened an end which was probably inevitable in any case as a sea power the south then occupied the place of france in the wars we have been considering while the situation of the north resembled that of england and as in france the sufferers in the confederacy were not a class but the government and the nation at large it is not the taking of individual ships or convoys be they few or many that strikes down the money power of a nation it is the possession of that overbearing power on the sea which drives the enemy's flag from it or allows it to appear only as a fugitive and which by controlling the great common closes the highways by which commerce moves to and from the enemy's shores this overbearing power can only be exercised by great navies and by them on the broad sea less efficiently now than in the days when the neutral flag had not its present immunity it is not unlikely that in the event of a war between maritime nations an attempt may be made by the one having a great sea power and wishing to break down its enemy's commerce to interpret the phrase effective blockade in the manner that best suits its interests at the time to assert that the speed and disposal of its ships make the blockade effective at much greater distances and with fewer ships than formerly the determination of such a question will depend not upon the weaker belligerent but upon neutral powers it will raise the issue between belligerent and neutral rights and if the belligerent have a vastly overpowering navy he may carry his point just as england when possessing the mastery of the seas long refused to admit the doctrine of the neutral flag covering the goods End of chapter two chapter three part one of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three war of england and france in alliance against the united provinces sixteen seventy two to sixteen seventy four finally of france against combined europe sixteen seventy four to sixteen seventy eight sea battles of sol bay the texel and stromboli part one shortly before the conclusion of the peace of breda louis the fourteenth made his first step toward seizing parts of the spanish netherlands and franche comte at the same time that his armies moved forward he sent out a state paper setting forth his claims upon the territories in question this paper showed unmistakably the ambitious character of the young king roused the anxiety of europe and doubtless increased the strength of the peace party in england under the leadership of holland but with the hearty co-operation of the english minister an alliance was formed between the two countries and sweden hitherto the friend of france to check 
louis's advance before his power became too great the attack first on the netherlands in sixteen sixty seven and then on franche comte in sixteen sixty eight showed the hopeless weakness of spain to defend her possessions they fell almost without a blow the policy of the united provinces relative to the claims of louis at this time was summed up in the phrase that france was good as a friend but not as a neighbor they were unwilling to break their traditional alliance but still more unwilling to have her on their border the policy of the english people though not of their king turned toward the dutch in the increased greatness of louis they saw danger to all europe to themselves more especially if by a settled preponderance on the continent his hands were free to develop his sea power flanders once in the power of louis the fourteenth wrote the english ambassador temple the dutch feel that their country will be only a maritime province of france and sharing that opinion he advocated the policy of resistance to the latter country whose domination in the low countries he considered as a threatened subjection of all europe he never ceased to represent to his government how dangerous to england would be the conquest of the sea provinces by france and he urgently pointed out the need of a prompt understanding with the dutch this would be the best revenge said he for the trick france has played us in involving us in the last war with the united provinces these considerations brought the two countries together in that triple alliance with sweden which has been mentioned and which for a time checked the onward movement of louis but the wars between the two sea nations were too recent the humiliation of england in the thames too bitter and the rivalries that still existed too real too deeply seated in the nature of things to make that alliance durable it needed the dangerous power of louis and his persistence in a course threatening to both to weld the union of these natural antagonists this was not to be done without another bloody encounter louis was deeply angered at the triple alliance and his wrath was turned mainly upon holland in which from the necessities of her position he recognized his most steadfast opponent for the time however he seemed to yield the more readily because of the probable approaching failure of the spanish royal line and the ambition he had of getting more than merely the territory lying to the east of france when the throne became vacant but though he dissembled and yielded from that time he set his mind upon the destruction of the republic this policy was directly contrary to that laid down by richelieu and to the true welfare of france it was to england's interest at least just then that the united provinces should not be trodden down by france but it was much more to the interest of france that they should not be subjected to england england free from the continent might stand alone upon the seas contending with france but france hampered by her continental politics could not hope to wrest the control of the seas from england without an ally this ally louis proposed to destroy and he asked england to help him the final result is already known but the outlines of the contest must now be followed before the royal purpose had passed into action and while there was still time to turn the energies of france into another channel a different course was proposed to the king this was the project of leibnitz before spoken of which has special interest for our subject because in proposing to reverse the lines which louis then laid down to make continental expansion secondary and growth beyond the sea the primary object of france the tendency avowedly and necessarily was to base the greatness of the country upon the control of the sea and of commerce the immediate object offered to the france of that day with the attainment of which however she could not have stopped short was the conquest of egypt 
that country which facing both the mediterranean and eastern seas gave control of the great commercial route which in our own day has been completed by the suez canal that route had lost much of its value by the discovery of the way round the cape of good hope and yet more by the unsettled and piratical conditions of the seas through which it lay but with a really strong naval power of occupying the key of the position it might have been largely restored such a power posted in egypt would in the already decaying condition of the ottoman empire have controlled the trade not only of india and the far east but also of the levant but the enterprise could not have stopped there the necessity of mastering the mediterranean and opening the red sea closed to christian vessels by mohammedan bigotry would have compelled the occupation of stations on either side of egypt and france would have been led step by step as england has been led by the possession of india to the seizure of points like malta cyprus aden in short to a great sea power that is clear now but it will be interesting to hear the arguments by which leibnitz sought to convince the french king two hundred years ago after pointing out the weakness of the turkish empire and the readiness with which it might be further embarrassed by stirring up austria and poland the latter the traditional ally of france after showing that france had no armed enemy in the mediterranean and that on the other side of egypt she would meet the portuguese colonies longing to obtain protection against the dutch in india the memorial proceeds the conquest of egypt that holland of the east is infinitely easier than that of the united provinces france needs peace in the west war at a distance war with holland will probably ruin the new indian companies as well as the colonies and commerce lately revived by france and will increase the burdens of the people while diminishing their resources the dutch will retire into their maritime towns stand there on the defensive in perfect safety and assume the offensive on the sea with great chance of success if france does not obtain a complete victory over them she loses all her influence in europe and by victory she endangers that influence in egypt on the contrary a repulse almost impossible will be of no great consequence and victory will give the dominion of the seas the commerce of the east and of india the preponderance in christendom and even the empire of the east on the ruins of the ottoman power the possession of egypt opens the way to conquests worthy of alexander the extreme weakness of the orientals is no longer a secret whoever has egypt will have all the coasts and islands of the indian ocean it is in egypt that holland will be conquered it is there she will be despoiled of what alone renders her prosperous the treasures of the east she will be struck without being able to ward off the blow should she wish to oppose the designs of france upon egypt she would be overwhelmed with the universal hatred of christians attacked at home on the contrary not only could she ward off the aggression but she could avenge herself sustained by universal public opinion which suspects the views of france of ambition the memorial had no effect all that the efforts of ambition and human prudence could do to lay the foundations for the destruction of a nation louis the fourteenth now did diplomatic strategy on a vast scale was displayed in order to isolate and hem in holland louis who had been unable to make europe accept the conquest of belgium by france now hoped to induce it to see without trembling the fall of holland his efforts were in the main successful the triple alliance was broken the king of england though contrary to the wishes of his people made an offensive alliance with louis and the holland when the war began found herself without an ally in europe except the worn-out kingdom of spain and the elector of brandenburg then by no means a first-class state but in order to obtain the help of charles the second louis not only engaged to pay him 
large sums of money but also to give to england from the spoils of holland and belgium wall Karen, sluiz and cadsan and even the islands of goree and vurn the control that is of the mouths of the great commercial rivers the scheldt and the meuse with regard to the united fleets of the two nations it was agreed that the officer bearing the admiral's flag of england should command in chief the question of naval precedence was reserved by not sending the admiral of france afloat but it was practically yielded it is evident that in his eagerness for the ruin of holland and his own continental aggrandizement louis was playing directly into england's hand as to power on the sea a french historian is justified in saying these negotiations have been wrongly judged it has been often repeated that charles sold england to louis the fourteenth this is true only of internal policy charles indeed plotted the political and religious subjugation of england with the help of a foreign power but as to external interests he did not sell them for the greater share in the profit from the ruin of the dutch was to go to england during the years preceding the war the dutch made every diplomatic effort to avert it but the hatred of charles and louis prevented any concession being accepted as final an english royal yacht was ordered to pass through the dutch ships of war in the channel and to fire on them if they did not strike their flags in january sixteen seventy two england sent an ultimatum summoning holland to acknowledge the right of the english crown to the sovereignty of the british seas and to order its fleets to lower their flags to the smallest english man-of-war and demands such as these received the support of a french king the dutch continued to yield but seeing at length that all concessions were useless they in february ordered into commission seventy-five ships of the line besides smaller vessels on the twenty third of march the english without declaration of war attacked a fleet of dutch merchantmen and on the twenty ninth the king declared war this was followed april sixth by the declaration of louis the fourteenth and on the twenty eighth of the same month he set out to take command in person of his army the war which now began including the third and last of the great contests between the english and dutch upon the ocean was not like those before it purely a sea war and it will be necessary to mention its leading outlines on the land also not only in order to clearness of impression but also to bring out the desperate straits to which the republic was reduced and the final deliverance through its sea power in the hands of the great seaman de Ruité. the naval war differs from those that preceded it in more than one respect but its most distinctive feature is that the dutch except on one occasion at the very beginning did not send out their fleet to meet the enemy but made what may properly be called a strategic use of their dangerous coast and shoals upon which were based their sea operations to this course they were forced by the desperate odds under which they were fighting but they did not use their shoals as a mere shelter the warfare they waged was the defensive offensive when the wind was fair for the allies to attack ruite kept under cover of his islands or at least on ground where the enemy dared not follow but when the wind served so that he might attack in his own way he turned and fell upon them there are also apparent indications of tactical combinations on his part of a higher order than have yet been met though it is possible that the particular acts referred to consisting in partial attacks amounting to little more than demonstrations against the french contingent may have sprung from political motives this solution for the undoubted fact that the dutch attacked the french lightly has not been met with elsewhere by the writer but it seems possible that the rulers of the united provinces may have wished not to increase the exasperation of their most dangerous enemy by humiliating his fleet and so making it less easy to his pride to accept their offers 
there is however an equally satisfactory military explanation in the supposition that the french being yet inexperienced ruyter thought it only necessary to contain them while falling in force upon the english the latter fought throughout with their old gallantry but less than their old discipline whereas the attacks of the dutch were made with a sustained and unanimous vigor that showed a great military advance the action of the french was at times suspicious it has been alleged that louis ordered his admiral to economize his fleet and there is good reason to believe that toward the end of the two years that england remained in his alliance he did do so the authorities of the united provinces knowing that the french fleet at brest was to join the english in the thames made great exertions to fit out their squadron so as to attack the latter before the junction was made but the wretched lack of centralization in their naval administration caused this project to fail the province of zealand was so backward that its contingent a large fraction of the whole was not ready in time and it has been charged that the delay was due not merely to mismanagement but to disaffection to the party in control of the government a blow at the english fleet in its own waters by a superior force before its ally arrived was a correct military conception judging from the after history of this war it might well have produced a profound effect upon the whole course of the struggle ruyter finally got to sea and fell in with the allied fleets but though fully intending to fight fell back before them to his own coast the allies did not follow him there but retired apparently in full security to southwold bay on the east coast of england some ninety miles north of the mouth of the thames there they anchored in three divisions two english the rear and centre of the allied line to the northward and the van composed of french ships to the southward ruyter followed them and on the early morning of june seventh sixteen seventy two the dutch fleet was signalled by a french lookout frigate in the northward and eastward standing down before a northeast wind for the allied fleet from which a large number of boats and men were ashore in watering parties the dutch order of battle was in two lines the advanced one containing eighteen ships with fire ships their total force was ninety-one ships of the line that of the allies one hundred and one the wind was blowing toward the coast which here trends nearly north and south and the allies were in an awkward position they had first to get under way and they could not fall back to gain time or room to establish their order most of the ships cut their cables and the english made sail on the starboard tack heading about north northwest a course which forced them soon to go about whereas the french took the other tack the battle began therefore by the separation of the allied fleet ruyter sent one division to attack the french or rather to contain them for these opponents exchanged only a distant cannonade although the dutch being to windward had the choice of closer action if they wished it as their commander bankert was not censured it may be supposed he acted under orders and he was certainly in command a year later and acting with great judgment and gallantry at the battle of the texel meanwhile ruyter fell furiously upon the two english divisions and apparently with superior forces for the english naval historians claim that the dutch were in the proportion of three to two if this can be accepted it gives a marked evidence of ruyter's high qualities as a general officer in advance of any other who appears in this century the results of the battle considered simply as an engagement were decisive both sides lost heavily but the honours and the substantial advantages all belonged to the dutch or rather to de ruyter he had outgeneraled the allies by his apparent retreat and then returning had surprised them wholly unprepared the false move by which the english two-thirds of the whole stood to the northward and westward while the other third the french went off to the east and south separated the allied fleet 
Ruitet threw his whole force into the gap, showing front to the French with a division probably smaller in numbers, but which from its position to windward had the choice of coming to close action or not, while with the remainder he fell in much superior strength upon the English. Paul Host says that Vice Admiral Destray, commanding the French, had taken measures for tacking and breaking through the Dutch division opposed to him so as to rejoin the duke of york the allied commander-in-chief it may be so for d'estray was a very brave man and not enough of a seaman to appreciate the dangers of the attempt but no such move was begun and both the english and ruitet thought that the french rather avoided than sought close action had d'estray however gone about and attempted to break through the line of experienced dutchmen to windward of him with the still raw seamen of france the result would have been as disastrous as that which overtook the spanish admiral at the battle of st vincent a hundred and twenty-five years later when he tried to reunite his broken fleet by breaking through the close order of jervis and nelson the truth which gradually dawns through a mass of conflicting statements is that the duke of york though a fair seaman and a brave man was not an able one that his fleet was not in good order and was thus surprised that his orders beforehand were not so precise as to make the french admiral technically disobedient in taking the opposite tack from the commander-in-chief and so separating the squadrons and that ruitet profited most ably by the surprise which he had himself prepared and by the further opportunity given him by the ineptness of his enemies unless for circumstances that are not stated the french admiral took the right tack with a north-east wind for it led out to sea and would give room for manoeuvring had the duke of york chosen the same the allied fleet would have gone out together with only the disadvantage of the wind and bad order in that case however ruitet could and probably would have done just what he did at the texel a year later check the van the french with a small containing force and fall with the mass of his fleet upon the centre and rear it is the similarity of his action in both cases under very different conditions that proves he intended at southwall bay merely to keep the french in check while he destroyed the english in this battle called indifferently southwall bay and sole bay ruitet showed a degree of skill combined with vigour which did not appear upon the sea after his death until the days of suffren and nelson his battles of the war of sixteen seventy two were no affairs of circumspection though they were fought circumspectly his aim was no less than the enemy's total overthrow by joining good combinations to fury of attack at sole bay he was somewhat though not greatly inferior to his enemies afterward much more so the substantial results of sole bay fight were wholly favourable to the dutch the allied fleets were to have assisted the operations of the french army by making a descent upon the coast of zealand ruitet's attack had inflicted an amount of damage and caused an expenditure of ammunition which postponed the sailing of the fleet for a month it was a diversion not only important but vital in the nearly desperate condition to which the united provinces were reduced ashore it may be added as an instructive comment on the theory of commerce destroying that after this staggering check to the enemy's superior forces ruitet met and convoyed safely to port a fleet of dutch merchantmen the progress of the land campaign must now be briefly described early in may the french army in several corps moved forward passing through the outskirts of the spanish netherlands and directing their attack upon holland from the south and east the republican party which was in power in holland had neglected the army and now made the mistake of scattering the force they had among many fortified towns trusting that each would do something toward delaying the french louis however under the advice of turenne simply observed the more important places while the second-rate towns surrendered nearly as fast as they were summoned 
the army of the provinces as well as their territory thus passing rapidly by fractions into the power of the enemy within a month the french were in the heart of the country having carried all before them and with no organized force remaining in their front sufficient of itself to stop them in the fortnight following the battle of sol bay terror and disorganization spread throughout the republic on the fifteenth of june the grand pensionary obtained permission of the states-general to send a deputation to louis the fourteenth begging him to name the terms on which he would grant them peace any humiliation to the foreigner was better in the eyes of the politician than to see the opposite party the house of orange come into power on his downfall while negotiations were pending the dutch towns continued to surrender and on the twentieth of june a few french soldiers entered muiden the key to amsterdam they were only stragglers though the large body to which they belonged was near at hand and the burghers who had admitted them under the influence of the panic prevailing throughout the land seeing that they were alone soon made them drunk and put them out the nobler feeling that animated amsterdam now made itself felt in muiden a body of troops hurried up from the capital and the smaller city was saved situated on the zuyder zee two hours distant from amsterdam at the junction of a number of rivers and canals muiden not only held the key of the principal dikes by which amsterdam could surround herself with a protecting inundation it also held the key of the harbour of this great city all the ships which went from the north sea to amsterdam by the zuyder zee being obliged to pass under its guns muiden saved and its dikes open amsterdam had time to breathe and remained free to break off her communications by land and to maintain them by sea it was the turning point of the invasion but what would have been the effect upon the spirit of the dutch oppressed by defeat and distracted in council if in that fateful fortnight which went before the allied fleet had attacked their coasts from this they were saved by the battle of sol bay negotiations continued the burgomasters the party representing wealth and commerce favoured submission they shrank from the destruction of their property and trade new advances were made but while the envoys were still in the camp of louis the populace and the orange party rose and with them the spirit of resistance on the twenty fifth of june amsterdam opened the dikes and her example was followed by the other cities of holland immense loss was entailed but the flooded country and the cities contained therein standing like islands amid the waters were safe from attack by land forces until freezing weather the revolution continued william of orange afterward william the third of england was on the eighth of july made stadtholder and head of the army and navy and the two de witts the heads of the republican party were murdered by a mob a few weeks later the resistance born of popular enthusiasm and pride of country was strengthened by the excessive demands of louis the fourteenth it was plain that the provinces must conquer or be destroyed meanwhile the other states of europe were waking up to the danger and the emperor of germany the elector of brandenburg and the king of spain declared for holland while sweden though nominally in alliance with france was unwilling to see the destruction of the provinces because that would be to the advantage of england's sea power nevertheless the next year sixteen seventy three opened with promise for france and the english king was prepared to fulfil his part of the compact on the seas but the dutch under the firm leadership of william of orange and with their hold on the sea unshaken now refused to accept conditions of peace which had been offered by themselves the year before three naval battles were fought in sixteen seventy three all near the coast of the united provinces the first two june seven and june fourteen off schoenevelt from which place they have taken their name 
the third known as the battle of the texel august twenty one in all three ruyter attacked choosing his own time and retiring when it suited him to the protection of his own shores for the allies to carry out their objects and make any diversion upon the seaboard or on the other hand to cripple the sea resources of the hard-pressed provinces it was necessary first to deal successfully with ruyter's fleet the great admiral and his government both felt this and took the resolution that the fleet should be posted in the passage of schoenevelt or a little farther south toward ostend to observe the enemy and if attacked or seeing the enemy's fleet disposed to make a descent upon the shores of the united provinces should resist vigorously by opposing his designs and destroying his ships from this position with good lookouts any movement of the allies would be known the english and french put to sea about the first of june under the command of prince rupert first cousin to the king the duke of york having been obliged to resign his office on account of the passage of the test act directed against persons of the roman catholic faith holding any public employment the french were under vice-admiral d'estray the same who had commanded them at solebay a force of six thousand english troops at yarmouth was ready to embark if de ruyter was worsted on the seventh of june the dutch were made out riding within the sands at schoenevelt a detached squadron was sent to draw them out but ruyter needed no invitation the wind served and he followed the detached squadron with such impetuosity as to attack before the allied line was fairly formed on this occasion the french occupied the centre the affair was indecisive if a battle can be called so in which an inferior force attacks a superior inflicts an equal loss and frustrates the main object of the enemy a week later ruyter again attacked with results which though indecisive as before as to the particular action forced the allied fleet to return to the english coast to refit and for supplies the dutch in these encounters had fifty-five ships of the line their enemies eighty-one fifty-four of which were english the allied fleets did not go to sea again until the latter part of july and this time they carried with them a body of troops meant for a landing on the twentieth of august the dutch fleet was seen under way between the texel and the meuse rupert at once got ready to fight but as the wind was from the northward and westward giving the allies the weather gauge and with it the choice of the method of attack ruyter availed himself of his local knowledge keeping so close to the beach that the enemy dared not approach the more so as it was late in the day during the night the wind shifted to east southeast off the land and at daybreak to use the words of a french official narrative the dutch made all sail and stood down boldly into action the allied fleet was to leeward and the port tack heading about south the french in the van rupert in the centre and sir edward sprague commanding the rear de ruyter divided his fleet into three squadrons the leading one of which of ten or twelve ships only he sent against the french while with the rest of his force he attacked the english in the centre and rear if we accept the english estimate of the forces which gives the english sixty ships the french thirty and the dutch seventy ruyter's plan of attack by simply holding the french in check as at solebay allowed him to engage the english on equal terms the battle took on several distinct phases which it is instructive to follow m de martel commanding the van of the french and consequently the leading subdivision of the allied fleet was ordered to stretch ahead go about and gain to windward of the dutch van so as to place it between two fires this he did but as soon as bankert the same who had manoeuvred so judiciously at solebay the year before saw the danger he put his helm up and ran through the remaining twenty ships of d'estray squadron with his own twelve a feat as creditable to him as it was discreditable to the french and then wearing round stood down to de ruyter who was hotly engaged with rupert he was not followed by 
d'estrees who suffered him to carry this important reinforcement to the dutch main attack undisturbed this practically ended the french share in the fight rupert during his action with de ruyter kept off continually with the object of drawing the dutch farther away from their coast so that if the wind shifted they might not be able to regain its shelter de ruyter followed him and the consequent separation of the centre from the van was one of the reasons alleged by d'estrees for his delay it does not however seem to have prevented bankert from joining his chief in the rear an extraordinary action on the part of sir edward spragge increased the confusion in the allied fleet for some reason this officer considered tromp who commanded the dutch rear as his personal antagonist and in order to facilitate the latter's getting into action he hove to stopped the whole english rear to wait for him this ill-timed point of honour on spragg's part seems to have sprung from a promise he had made to the king that he would bring back tromp alive or dead or else lose his own life the stoppage which recalls the irresponsible and insubordinate action of the junior dutch flag officers in the former war of course separated the rear which also drifted rapidly to leeward spragg and tromp carrying on a hot private action on their own account these two junior admirals sought each other personally and the battle between their flags was so severe that spragg twice had to shift his own to another ship on the second occasion the boat in which he was embarked was sunk by a shot and he himself drowned rupert thus forsaken by his van and rear found himself alone with ruyter who reinforced by his van had the address further to cut off the rear subdivision of the allied centre and to surround the remaining twenty ships with probably thirty or forty of his own it is not creditable to the gunnery of the day that more substantial results did not follow but it is to be remembered that all ruyter's skill could secure except for probably a very short time was an action on equal terms with the english his total inferiority in numbers could not be quite overcome the damage to the english and dutch may therefore have been great and was probably nearly equal rupert finally disengaged himself and seeing that the english rear was not replying well to its immediate opponents ran down toward it ruyter following him the two opposing centres steering parallel courses and within cannon shot but by mutual consent induced perhaps by ammunition running short refraining from firing at four p m the centres and rears united and toward five a fresh engagement began which continued till seven when ruyter withdrew probably because of the approach of the french who by their own accounts rejoined rupert about that time this ended the battle which like all that preceded it in this war may be called a drawn fight but as to which the verdict of the english naval historian is doubtless correct the consequences which the dutch through the prudence of their admiral drew from this battle were exceedingly great for they opened their ports which were entirely blocked up and put an end to all thoughts by removing the possibility of an invasion the military features of the action have sufficiently appeared in the account that has been given the skill of de ruyter the firmness and promptness of bankert first in checking and then in passing through the french division the apparent disloyalty or at the best inefficiency of the latter the insubordination and military blundering of spragg the seeming lack of everything but hard fighting on rupert's part the allies indulged in bitter mutual recriminations rupert blamed both d'estrees and spragg d'estrees found fault with rupert for running to leeward and de Trey, d'estrees own second martel roundly called his chief a coward in a letter which earned him an imprisonment in the bastille the french king ordered an inquiry by the intendant of the navy at brest who made a report upon which the account here given has mainly rested and which leaves little doubt of the dishonour of the french arms in this battle 
m d'estre gave it to be understood says the french naval historian that the king wished his fleet spared and that the english should not be trusted was he wrong in not relying upon the sincerity of the english alliance when he was receiving from all quarters warnings that the people and the nobles were murmuring against it and charles the second was perhaps alone in his kingdom in wishing it possibly not but he was surely wrong if he wished any military man or body of men to play the equivocal part assigned to the french admiral on this day the loss of the fleet would have been a lighter disaster so evident to eye-witnesses was the bad faith or cowardice and the latter supposition is not admissible that one of the dutch seamen as they discussed among themselves why the french did not come down said you fools they have hired the english to fight for them and all their business here is to see that they earn their wages a more sober-minded and significant utterance is that with which the intendant at brest ends the official report before mentioned it would appear in all these sea fights ruite has never cared to attack the french squadron and that in this last action he had detached ten ships of the zealand squadron to keep it in play no stronger testimony is needed to ruite's opinion of the inefficiency or faithlessness of that contingent to the allied forces End of chapter three part one chapter three part two of the influence of sea power upon history sixteen sixty to seventeen eighty three by alfred thayer mahan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part two another chapter in the history of maritime coalitions was closed on the twenty first of august sixteen seventy three by the battle of the texel in it as in others were amply justified the words with which a modern french naval officer has stamped them united by momentary political interests but at bottom divided to the verge of hatred never following the same path in council or in action they have never produced good results or at least results proportioned to the efforts of the powers allied against a common enemy the navies of france spain and holland seem at several distinct times to have joined only to make more complete the triumph of the british arms when to this well ascertained tendency of coalitions is added the equally well-known jealousy of every country over the increasing power of a neighbour and the consequent unwillingness to see such increase obtained by crushing another member of the family of nations an approach is made to the measure of naval strength required by a state it is not necessary to be able to meet all others combined as some englishmen have seemed to think it is necessary only to be able to meet the strongest on favourable terms sure that the others will not join in destroying a factor in the political equilibrium even if they hold aloof england and spain were allies in toulon in seventeen ninety three when the excesses of revolutionary france seemed to threaten the social order of europe but the spanish admiral told the english flatly that the ruin of the french navy a large part of which was there in their hands could not fail to be injurious to the interests of spain and a part of the french ships was saved by his conduct which has been justly characterized as not only full of firmness but also as dictated by the highest political reason the battle of the texel closing the long series of wars in which the dutch and english contended on equal terms for the mastery of the seas saw the dutch navy in its highest efficiency and its greatest ornament de ruite at the summit of his glory long since old in years for he was now sixty-six he had lost none of his martial vigour 
his attack was as furious as eight years before and his judgment apparently had ripened rapidly through the experience of the last war for there is far more evidence of plan and military insight than before to him under the government of the great pensionary de witt with whom he was in close sympathy the increase of discipline and sound military tone now apparent in the dutch navy must have been largely due he went to this final strife of the two great sea peoples in the fullness of his own genius with an admirably tempered instrument in his hands and with the glorious disadvantage of numbers to save his country the mission was fulfilled not by courage alone but by courage forethought and skill the attack at the texel was in its general lines the same as that at trafalgar the enemy's van being neglected to fall on the centre and rear and as at trafalgar the van by failing to do its duty more than justified the conception but as the odds against de Ruite were greater than those against nelson so was his success less the part played by bankert at sole bay was essentially the same as that of nelson at st vincent when he threw himself across the path of the spanish division with his single ship but nelson took his course without orders from jervis while bankert was carrying out ruite's plan once more still himself in his bearing but under sadly altered surroundings will this simple and heroic man come before us and here in contrast with his glory seems a proper place to insert a little description by the comte de guiche of his bearing in the four days fight which brings out at once the homely and the heroic sides of his character i never saw him during those last three days other than even-tempered and when victory was assured saying always it was the good god that gives it to us amid the disorders of the fleet and the appearance of loss he seemed to be moved only by the misfortune to his country but always submissive to the will of god finally it may be said that he has something of the frankness and lack of polish of our patriarchs and to conclude what i have to say of him i will relate that the day after the victory i found him sweeping his own room and feeding his chickens nine days after the battle of the texel on the thirtieth of august sixteen seventy three a formal alliance was made between holland on the one hand and spain lorraine and the emperor of germany on the other and the french ambassador was dismissed from vienna louis almost immediately offered holland comparatively moderate terms but the united provinces with their new allies by their sides and with their backs borne firmly upon the sea which had favoured and supported them set their face steadily against him in england the clamour of the people and parliament became louder the protestant feeling and the old enmity to france were daily growing as was the national distrust of the king charles though he had himself lost none of his hatred of the republic had to give way louis seeing the gathering storm made up his mind by the council of turenne to withdraw from his dangerously advanced position by evacuating holland and to try to make peace with the provinces separately while continuing the war with the house of austria in spain and germany thus he returned to richelieu's policy and holland was saved february nineteen sixteen seventy four peace was signed between england and the provinces the latter recognized the absolute supremacy of the english flag from cape finisterre in spain to norway and paid a war indemnity the withdrawal of england which remained neutral during the remaining four years of the war necessarily made it less maritime the king of france did not think his navy either in numbers or efficiency able to contend alone with that of holland he therefore withdrew it from the ocean and confined his sea enterprises to the mediterranean with one or two half privateering expeditions to the west indies 
the united provinces for their part being freed from danger on the side of the sea and not having except for a short time any serious idea of operating against the french coast diminished their own fleets the war became more and more continental and drew in more and more the other powers of europe gradually the german states cast their lot with austria and on may twenty eighth sixteen seventy four the diet proclaimed war against france the great work of french policy in the last generations was undone austria had resumed her supremacy in germany and holland had not been destroyed on the baltic denmark seeing sweden inclining toward france hastened to make common cause with the german empire sending fifteen thousand troops there remained in germany only bavaria hanover and Württemberg, faithful still to their french alliance the land war had thus drawn in nearly all the powers of europe and from the nature of the case the principal theatre of the conflict was beyond the eastern boundary of france toward the rhine and in the spanish netherlands but while this was raging a maritime episode was introduced by the fact of denmark and sweden being engaged on opposite sides of this it will not be necessary to speak beyond mentioning that the dutch sent a squadron under tromp to join the danes and that the united fleets won a great victory over the swedes in sixteen seventy six taking from them ten ships it is therefore evident that the sea superiority of holland detracted greatly from sweden's value as an ally to louis the fourteenth another maritime strife arose in the mediterranean by the revolt of the sicilians against the spanish rule the help they asked from france was granted as a diversion against spain but the sicilian enterprise never became more than a side issue its naval interest springs from bringing Ruité once more on the scene and that as the antagonist of duquesne the equal and by some thought even the superior of tourville whose name has always stood far above all others in the french navy of that day messina revolted in july sixteen seventy four and the french king at once took it under his protection the spanish navy throughout seems to have behaved badly certainly inefficiently and early in sixteen seventy five the french were safely established in the city during the year their naval power in the mediterranean was much increased and spain unable to defend the island herself applied to the united provinces for a fleet the expenses of which she would bear the provinces fatigued by the war involved in debt suffering cruelly in their commerce exhausted by the necessity of paying the emperor and all the german princes could no longer fit out the enormous fleets which they had once opposed to france and england they however hearkened to spain and sent de ruite with a squadron of only eighteen ships and four fire-ships the admiral who had noted the growth of the french navy said the force was too small and departed oppressed in spirit but with the calm resignation which was habitual to him he reached cadiz in september and in the meantime the french had further strengthened themselves by the capture of agosta a port commanding the south-east of sicily de ruite was again delayed by the spanish government and did not reach the north coast of the island until the end of december when head winds kept him from entering the straits of messina he cruised between messina and the lapari islands in a position to intercept the french fleet convoying troops and supplies which was expected under duquesne on the seventh of january sixteen seventy six the french came in sight twenty ships of the line and six fire-ships the dutch had but nineteen ships one of which was a spaniard and four fire-ships and it must be remembered that although there is no detailed account of the dutch ships in this action they were as a rule inferior to those of england and yet more to those of france the first day was spent in manoeuvring the dutch having the weather gauge but during that night which was squally 
and drove the spanish galleys accompanying the dutch to take refuge under lipari the wind shifted and coming out at west-south-west gave the french the weather gauge and the power to attack duquesne resolved to use it and sending the convoy ahead formed his line on the starboard tack standing south the dutch did the same and waited for him an emotion of surprise must be felt at seeing the great dutch admiral surrender the choice of attack on the seventh at daybreak of that day he saw the enemy and steered for him at three p m a french account says he hauled his wind on the same tack as themselves but out of cannon shot to windward how account for the seeming reluctance of the man who three years before had made the desperate attacks of solbay and the texel his reasons have not been handed down it may be that the defensive advantages of the lee gauge had been recognized by this thoughtful seaman especially when preparing to meet with inferior forces an enemy of impetuous gallantry and imperfect seamanship if any such ideas did influence him they were justified by the result the battle of stromboli presents a partial anticipation of the tactics of the french and english a hundred years later but in this case it is the french who seek the weather gauge and attack with fury while the dutch take the defensive the results were very much such as clerk pointed out to the english in his celebrated work on naval tactics the accounts here followed being entirely french the two fleets being drawn up in line of battle on the starboard tack heading south as has been said de ruite awaited the attack which he had refused to make being between the french and their port he felt they must fight at nine a m the french line kept away altogether and ran down obliquely upon the dutch a manoeuvre difficult to be performed with accuracy and during which the assailant receives his enemy's fire at disadvantage in doing this two ships in the french van were seriously disabled m de la fayette in the prudente began the action but having rashly thrown himself into the midst of the enemy's van he was dismantled and forced to haul off confusion ensued in the french line from the difficult character of the manoeuvre vice admiral de prouilly commanding the van in keeping away took too little room so that in coming to the wind again the ships in too close order lapped and interfered with one another's fire the absence of m de la fayette from the line threw the parfait into peril attacked by two ships she lost her main top mast and had also to haul off for repairs again the french came into action in succession instead of all together a usual and almost inevitable result of the manoeuvre in question in the midst of a terrible cannonade that is after part of his ships were engaged duquesne commanding the centre took post on the beam of ruite's division the french rear came into action still later after the centre langeron and bethune commanding leading ships of the french centre are crushed by superior forces how can this be seeing the french had the more ships it was because as the narrative tells us the french had not yet repaired the disorder of the first movement however all at last got into action and duquesne gradually restored order the dutch engaged all along the line resisted everywhere and there was not one of their ships which was not closely engaged more cannot be said for the admiral and captains of the inferior fleet the remaining part of the fight is not very clearly related ruite is said to have given way continually with his two leading divisions but whether this was a confession of weakness or a tactical move does not appear the rear was separated in permitting which either ruite or the immediate commander was at fault but the attempts made by the french to surround and isolate it failed probably because of damaged spars for one french ship did pass entirely around the separated division the action ended at four thirty p m except in the rear and the spanish galleys shortly after came up and towed the disabled dutch ships away 
their escape shows how injured the french must have been the positions are intended to show the dutch rear far separated and the disorder in which a fleet action under sail necessarily ended from loss or spars those who are familiar with clerk's work on naval tactics published about seventeen eighty will recognize in this account of the battle of stromboli all the features to which he called the attention of english seamen in his thesis on the methods of action employed by them and their adversaries in and before his time clerk's thesis started from the postulate that english seamen and officers were superior in skill or spirit or both to the french and their ships on the whole as fast that they were conscious of this superiority and therefore eager to attack while the french equally conscious of inferiority or for other reasons were averse to decisive engagements with these dispositions the latter feeling they could rely on a blindly furious attack by the english had evolved a crafty plan by which while seeming to fight they really avoided doing so and at the same time did the enemy much harm this plan was to take the lee gauge the characteristic of which as has before been pointed out is that it is a defensive position and to await attack the english error according to clerk upon which the french had learned by experience that they could always count was in drawing up their line parallel to the enemy or nearly so and then keeping away altogether to attack ship for ship each its opposite in the hostile line by standing down in this manner the assailant lost the use of most of his artillery while exposed to the full fire of his opponent and invariably came up in confusion because the order of attack was one difficult to maintain at any time and much more so in the smoke under fire with torn sails and falling masts this was precisely the attack made by duquesne at stromboli and it there had precisely the consequences clerk points out confusion in the line the van arriving first and getting the brunt of the fire of the defence disabled ships in the van causing confusion in the rear etc clerk further asserts and he seems to be right that as the action grew warm the french by running off to leeward in their turn led the english to repeat the same mode of attack and so we find at stromboli ruite giving ground in the same way though his motive does not appear clerk also points out that a necessary corollary of the lee gauge assumed for tactical reasons is to aim at the assailant's spars his motive power so that his attack cannot be pushed farther than the defendant chooses and at stromboli the crippled condition of the french is evident for after ruite had fallen to leeward and could no longer help his separated rear it was practically unmolested by the french although none of these had been sunk while therefore there cannot with certainty be attributed to ruite the deliberate choice of the lee gauge for which there was as yet no precedent it is evident that he reaped all its benefits and that the character of the french officers of his day inexperienced as seamen and of impetuous valour offered just the conditions that gave most advantage to an inferior force standing on the defensive the qualities and characteristics of the enemy are among the principal factors which a man of genius considers and it was to this as much as to any other one trait that nelson owed his dazzling successes on the other hand the french admiral attacked in a wholly unscientific manner ship against ship without an attempt to concentrate on a part of the enemy or even trying to keep him in play until the french squadron of eight ships of the line in messina near by could join such tactics cannot be named beside that of solbay or the texel but as duquesne was the best french officer of the century with the possible exception of tourville this battle has a value of its own in the history of tactics and may by no means be omitted the standing of the commander-in-chief is the warrant that it marks the highest point to which french naval tactics has as yet attained before quitting this discussion it may be noted that the remedy clerk proposed was to attack the rear ships of the enemy's line and preferably to leeward 
the remainder of the fleet must then either abandon them or stand down for a general action which according to his postulate was all that the english seamen desired after the fight de ruyter sailed to palermo one of his ships sinking on the way duquesne was joined outside messina by the french division that had been lying there the remaining incidents of the sicilian war are unimportant to the general subject on the twenty second of april de ruyter and duquesne met again off augusta duquesne had twenty-nine ships the allied spaniards and dutch twenty-seven of which ten were spanish unfortunately the spaniard commanded in chief and took the centre of the line with the ships of his country contrary to the advice of ruyter who knowing how inefficient his allies were wished to scatter them through the line and so support them better ruyter himself took the van and the allies having the wind attacked but the spanish centre kept at long cannon range leaving the brunt of the battle to fall on the dutch van the rear following the commander-in-chief's motions was also but slightly engaged in this sorrowful yet still glorious fulfilment of hopeless duty de ruyter who never before in his long career had been struck by an enemy's shot received a mortal wound he died a week later at syracuse and with him passed away the last hope of resistance on the sea a month later the spanish and dutch fleets were attacked at anchor at palermo and many of them destroyed while a division sent from holland to reinforce the mediterranean fleet was met by a french squadron in the straits of gibraltar and forced to take refuge in cadiz the sicilian enterprise continued to be only a diversion and the slight importance attached to it shows clearly how entirely louis the fourteenth was bent on the continental war how differently would the value of sicily have impressed him had his eyes been fixed on egypt and extension by sea as the years passed the temper of the english people became more and more excited against france the trade rivalries with holland seemed to fall into the shade and it became likely that england which had entered the war as the ally of louis would before it closed take up arms against him in addition to other causes of jealousy she saw the french navy increase to a number superior to her own charles for a while resisted the pressure of parliament but in january sixteen seventy eight a treaty of alliance offensive and defensive was made between the two sea countries the king recalled the english troops which until now had been serving as part of the french army and when parliament opened again in february asked for money to equip ninety ships and thirty thousand soldiers louis who was expecting this result at once ordered the evacuation of sicily he did not fear england by land but on the sea he could not yet hold his own against the union of the two sea powers at the same time he redoubled his attacks on the spanish netherlands as long as there was a hope of keeping the ships of england out of the fight he had avoided touching the susceptibilities of the english people on the subject of the belgian sea coast but now that they could no longer be conciliated he thought best to terrify holland by the sharpness of his attack in the quarter where she dreaded him most the united provinces were in truth the mainspring of the coalition though among the smallest in extent of the countries arrayed against louis they were strongest in the character and purpose of their ruler the prince of orange and in the wealth which while supporting the armies of the confederates also kept the poor and greedy german princes faithful to their alliance almost alone by dint of mighty sea power by commercial and maritime mobility they bore the burden of the war and though they staggered and complained they still bore it as in later centuries england so at the time we are now speaking of holland the great sea power supported the war against the ambition of france but her sufferings were great her commerce preyed upon by french privateers lost heavily and there was added an immense indirect loss in the transfer of the carrying trade between foreign countries which had contributed so much to the prosperity of the dutch 
when the flag of england became neutral this rich business went to her ships which crossed the seas the more securely because of the eager desire of louis to conciliate the english nation this desire led him also to make very large concessions to english exigencies in the matter of commercial treaties undoing much of the work of protection upon which colbert sought to nourish the yet feeble growth of french sea power these sops however only stayed for a moment the passions which were driving england it was not self-interest but stronger motives which impelled her to a break with france still less was it to the interest of holland to prolong the war after louis showed a wish for peace a continental war could at best be but a necessary evil and source of weakness to her the money she spent on her own and the allied armies was lost to her navy and the sources of her prosperity on the sea were being exhausted how far the prince of orange was justified by the aims of louis the fourteenth in that unyielding attitude of opposition toward him which he always maintained may be uncertain and there is here no need to decide the question but there can be no doubt that the strife sacrificed the sea-power of holland through sheer exhaustion and with it destroyed her position among the nations of the world situated between france and england says a historian of holland by one or other of them were the united provinces after they had achieved their independence of spain constantly engaged in wars which exhausted their finances annihilated their navy and caused the rapid decline of their trade manufactures and commerce and thus a peace-loving nation found herself crushed by the weight of unprovoked and long-continued hostilities often too the friendship of england was scarcely less harmful to holland than her enmity as one increased and the other lessened it became the alliance of the giant and the dwarf hitherto we have seen holland the open enemy or hardy rival of england henceforward she appears as an ally in both cases a sufferer from her smaller size weaker numbers and less favoured situation the exhaustion of the united provinces and the clamour of their merchants and peace party on the one hand aided on the other by the sufferings of france the embarrassment of her finances and the threatened addition of england's navy to her already numerous enemies inclined to peace the two principal parties to this long war louis had long been willing to make peace with holland alone but the states had been withheld at first by fidelity to those who had joined them in their hour of trouble and latterly by the firm purpose of william of orange difficulties were gradually smoothed away and the peace of nimeguen between the united provinces and france was signed august eleventh sixteen seventy eight the other powers shortly afterward acceded to it the principal sufferer as was natural was the overgrown but feeble monarchy whose centre was spain which gave up to france franche comte and a number of fortified towns in the spanish netherlands thus extending the boundaries of france to the east and northeast holland for whose destruction louis began the war lost not a foot of ground in europe and beyond the seas only her colonies on the west coast of africa and in guiana she owed her safety at first and the final successful issue to her sea-power that delivered her in the hour of extreme danger and enabled her afterward to keep alive the general war it may be said to have been one of the chief factors and inferior to no other one singly in determining the event of the great war which was formally closed at nimeguen the effort none the less sapped her strength and being followed by many years of similar strain broke her down but what was the effect upon the vastly greater state the extreme ambition of whose king was the principal cause of the exhausting wars of this time among the many activities which illustrated the brilliant opening of the reign of the then youthful king of france none was so important none so intelligently directed as those of colbert 
who aimed first at restoring the finances from the confusion into which they had fallen and then at establishing them upon a firm foundation of national wealth this wealth at that time utterly beneath the possibilities of france was to be developed on the lines of production encouraged trade stimulated to healthful activity a large merchant shipping a great navy and colonial extension some of these are sources others the actual constituents of sea-power which indeed may be said in a seaboard nation to be the invariable accompaniment if it be not the chief source of its strength for nearly twelve years all went well the development of the greatness of france in all these directions went forward rapidly if not in all with equal strides and the king's revenues increased by bounds then came the hour in which he had to decide whether the exertions which his ambition naturally perhaps properly prompted should take the direction which while imposing great efforts did nothing to sustain but rather hindered the natural activities of his people and broke down commerce by making control of the sea uncertain or whether he should launch out in pursuits which while involving expense would keep peace on his borders lead to the control of the sea and by the impulse given to trade and all upon which trade depends would bring in money nearly if not quite equal to that which the state spent this is not a fanciful picture by his attitude toward holland and its consequences louis gave the first impulse to england upon the path which realized to her within her own day the results which colbert and leibnitz had hoped for france he drove the dutch carrying trade into the ships of england allowed her to settle peacefully pennsylvania and carolina and to seize new york and new jersey and he sacrificed to gain her neutrality the growing commerce of france not all at once but very rapidly england pressed into the front place as a sea-power and however great her sufferings and the sufferings of individual englishmen it remained true of her that even in war her prosperity was great doubtless france could not forget her continental position nor wholly keep free from continental wars but it may be believed that if she had chosen the path of sea-power she might both have escaped many conflicts and borne those that were unavoidable with greater ease at the peace of nibiguen the injuries were not irreparable but the agricultural classes commerce manufactures and the colonies had alike been smitten by the war and the conditions of peace so advantageous to the territorial and military power of france were much less so to manufactures the protective tariffs having been lowered in favor of england and holland the two sea powers the merchant shipping was stricken and the splendid growth of the royal navy that excited the jealousy of england was like a tree without roots it soon withered away under the blast of war before finally quitting this war with holland a short notice of the comte d'estrée to whom louis committed the charge of the french contingent of the allied fleet and who commanded it at sole bay and the texel will throw some light upon the qualifications of the french naval officers of the day before experience had made seamen of many of them d'estrees went to sea for the first time in sixteen sixty seven being then a man of mature years but in sixteen seventy two we find him in the chief command of an important squadron having under him duquesne who was a seaman and had been so for nearly forty years in sixteen seventy seven d'estrees obtained from the king a body of eight ships which he undertook to maintain at his own expense upon the condition of receiving half the prizes made with this squadron he made an attack upon then dutch island of tobago with a recklessness which showed that no lack of courage prompted his equivocal conduct at the texel the next year he went out again and contrived to run the whole squadron ashore on the aves islands the account given by the flag captain of this transaction is amusing as well as instructive in his report he says the day that the squadron was lost the sun having been taken by the pilots the vice-admiral as usual had them put down the position in his cabin 
as i was entering to learn what was going on i met the third pilot bour de Lou, who was going out crying i asked him what the matter was and he answered because i find more drift than the other pilots the admiral is threatening me and abusing me as usual yet i am only a poor lad who does the best he can when i had entered the cabin the admiral who was very angry said to me that scoundrel of a bour de Lou is always coming to me with some nonsense or other i will drive him out of the ship he makes us to be running a course the devil knows where i don't as i did not know which was right says the captain of the ship rather naively i did not dare to say anything for fear of bringing down a like storm on my own head some hours after this scene which as the french officer from whom the extract is taken says appears now almost grotesque but which is only an exact portrayal of the sea manners of the day the whole squadron was lost on a group of rocks known as the aves islands such were the officers the flag captain in another part of his report says the shipwreck resulted from the general line of conduct held by vice admiral d'estrade it was always the opinion of his servants or others than the proper officers of the ship which prevailed this manner of acting may be understood in the comte d'estrade who without the necessary knowledge of a profession he had embraced so late always had with him obscure counsellors in order to appropriate the opinions they gave him so as to blind the ship's company as to his capacity d'estrade had been made vice-admiral two years after he first went aboard ship End of chapter three part two